preface of naval occasions and some traits of the sailor man this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by david wales naval occasions and some traits of the sailor man by bartimaeus preface i reckon that's proper new navy said the coxswain of a duty cutter to the midshipman perched on the dicky seat beside him in the stern it was six a m the boat was returning from the early morning beef trip and the midshipman in charge of her had seen fit to discuss with his coxswain the subject which at most hours and particularly at this one lay nearest to his heart the subject of food proper new navy repeated the petty officer with contempt he referred to the recent introduction of marmalade into his scale of rations he spoke bitterly yet his quarrel was not with the marmalade which in its way was all that marmalade should have been his regret was for the dear dead days before marmalade was thought of on the lower deck that was ten years ago but fondness for the ancient order of things is still a feature of this navy of ours there was never a ship like our last ship no commission like the one before this one gypsies all yet we would fain linger a little by the ashes of our campfire while the caravans move on the most indifferent observer of naval affairs during the last decade will admit that it has been one of immense transition changes more momentous even than this business of the marmalade have followed in the wake of a great wave of progress up and onward is the accepted order but at the bottom of the sailor man's conservative heart a certain reluctance still remains the talk of smoking-room and forecastle concerns the doings of yesterday the ties that link us in a common brotherhood were for the most part forged in the old navy so fast yielding place to new in naval occasions the author has strung together a few sketches of naval life afloat in the past ten years they relate to ships mainly of the pre-dreadnought era and officers those of the military branch at least who owe their early training to the old britannia at the same time for all the outward changes the inner workaday life of the fleet remains unaltered with this and not in criticism of things old or new these sketches are concerned pathos and humour continue to rub elbows on either side of us much as they always have and there still remains more to laugh about than sigh over when the day's work is done devonport nineteen fourteen end of preface chapter one of naval occasions by bartimaeus this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter one d s b duty steamboat the songs of greece the pomp of rome were clean for god at seventeen o lord at seventeen g stuart bowles the midshipman of the second picket boat that is to say the boat with the bell-mouthed funnel of burnished brass and vermilion paint inside her cowls was standing under the electric light at the battery door reading the commander's night order book second picket boat to have steam by five a m and will perform duties of d s b for the second division he closed the book and stood meditatively looking out into the darkness beyond the quarter-deck rails it was blowing fitfully gusts of wind shaking the awning in a manner that threatened dirty weather on the morrow why the deuce couldn't the other picket boat but she hadn't got a brass funnel only a skimpy painted affair decidedly it was the fatal beauty of his boat that had influenced the commander's decision still he yawned drearily and opening the deck log ran his finger down the barometer readings glass low beastly low and steady wind four to five o c q r hm the cryptic quotations did not appear to add joy to the outlook 
ten o'clock had struck and forward in the waist the boatswain's mate was piping down the shrill cadence of his pipe floating aft on the wind sorrowfully the midshipman descended to the steerage flat and crouching beneath the hammocks that hung from the overhead beams reached his chest and noiselessly undressed noiselessly because the sleeping occupant of the adjacent hammock had the morning watch and was prone to be unreasonable when accidentally awakened in rather less than a minute he had undressed and donned his pyjamas then delving amid the mysterious contents of his sea chest produced a pair of sea boots an oilskin and sou'wester and a sweater he made his preparations mechanically propping the sea boots where they would be handiest when he turned out lastly he hung his cap over a police light because he knew from experience that the light caught his eyes when he was in his hammock locked his chest and choosing a spot where two messmates who were scuffling for the possession of a hammock stretcher would not fall over his feet he unconcernedly knelt down and said his prayers the corporal of the watch passed on his rounds the sentry clicked to attention an instant and resumed his beat above his head the wardroom door opened to admit a newcomer and the jangle of a piano drifted down the hatchway then the door closed again shutting out the sound and the kneeling figure in rather dilapidated pyjamas rose to his feet steadying himself by a ring bolt overhead he swung lightly into his hammock and wriggled down between the blankets from the other side of the flat came a voice freckles your dsb tomorrow the midshipman of the second picket boat grunted in reply and pulled the blanket close under his chin presently the voice sounded again freckles dear aren't you glad you sold your little farm and came to sea but he who had sold a farm only snuggled his face against the pillow sighed once and was asleep had you seen the sleeper in waking hours nursing a cutter close reefed through a squall or handling a launch load of uproarious liberty men you might passing by at this moment have found food for meditation for the vibration of the dynamo a deck below presently caused the cap to fall from the police light it had shielded and the glare shone full in a face which for all the valiant razor locked away in its owner's chest was that of a very tired child orders for the picket boat sir the officer of the morning watch who was staring through his binoculars into the darkness turned and glanced at the small figure muffled in oilskins at his side many people would have smiled in something between amusement and compassion at the earnest tone of inquiry but this is a trade in which men get out of the way of smiling at five a m besides he'd been through it all himself flagships signalled some empty coal lighters broken adrift up to windward cruising independently go an around em up before they drift down to the fleet better man your boat from the boom and shove straight off smack it about the small figure in oilskins who as a matter of fact was none other than the midshipman of the second picket boat brass funnel vermilion painted cowls and all turned and scampered forward it was pitch dark and the wind that swept in rainy gusts along the battery caught the flaps of his oilskins and buffeted the sleep out of him overside the lights of the fleet blinked in an indeterminate confusion through the rain and for an instant a feeling of utter schoolboy woe of longing for the security of his snug hammock filled his being then the short years of his training told somewhere ahead in that welter of rain and darkness there was work to be done to be accomplished moreover swiftly and well it was an order stumbling on to the forecastle he slipped a life-belt over his shoulders climbed the rail and descended the ship's side by a steel ladder until he reached the lower boom it jutted out into the darkness a round dimly discerned spar and secured to it by a boat rope at the farthest point of his vision he saw his boat the circular funnel mouth ringed a smoky glow and in the green glare of a side light one of the bowmen was reaching for the ladder that hung from the boom very cautiously he felt his way out along it 
steadied by a man-rope breast high looking downward he saw the steamboat fretting like a dog in leash the next instant she was lurching forward on the crest of a wave and as suddenly dropped away again in a shower of spray releasing his grip with one hand he slipped astride of the boom wriggled on his stomach till his feet touched rungs of a jacob's ladder and so hung in a few feet above the tumbling water arf a mo sir said a deep voice behind him the boat's bows were plunging just below the ladder tautened with a jerk now sir said the voice he relaxed his hold and dropped nimbly on to the triangular space in the bows as he landed the jacob's ladder shot upwards into the darkness as though snatched by an unseen hand steadying himself by the rail along the engine-room casing he hurried to the wheel a bearded petty officer moved aside as he came aft this was his coxswain a morose man about the age of his father who obeyed orders like an automaton and had once mellowed by strong waters been known to smile cast off forward the engine-room bell rang twice and the midshipman gave a quick turn to the wheel for an instant the boat plunged as if in uncertainty then swung round on the slope of a slate-gray wave and slid off on her quest forward in the bows the bowmen were crouched peering through the rain presently one of them hailed hoarsely port a bit sir supplemented the coxswain that's them there he pointed ahead to where indistinct shapes showed black against the troubled waters the bell rang again in the tiny engine-room and the leading stoker scenting adventures threw up the hatch and thrust a head and hairy chest into the cold air his interest in the proceedings apparently soon waned however for he shut the hatch down again and busied himself mysteriously always within reach of the throttle and reversing lever with an oil-can going very slow the boat crept alongside the foremost lighter a huge derelict that when loaded carried fifty tons of coal they had been moored alongside one another to the wharf but rocking in the swell had chafed through their moorings and broken adrift now to take in tow an unwieldy lighter in the dark with a heavy swell running and to moor it safely in the spot whence it came is a piece of work that requires no small judgment however one by one the three truants were captured and secured and then with the grey dawn of a winter morning breaking overhead the picket boat swung round on her return journey on the way she passed another boat racing shoreward for the mails the midshipman at the wheel raised his hand with a little gesture of salutation and she went by in a shower of spray half an hour later the midshipman of the second picket boat garbed in the rig of the day was ladling sugar over his porridge with the abandon of one who is seventeen and master of his fate a messenger appeared at the gunroom door duty steamboats called away sir her midshipman locked away his pet marmalade pot for there are limits even to the communism of a gunroom and reached for his cap and dirk we ain't got much money he observed grimly but we do see life End of chapter one chapter two of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two captain's defaulters at the last stroke of six bells in the forenoon watch the marine bugler drew himself up stiffly as one on whom great issues hung and raising his bugle sent the imperious summons echoing along the upper deck clattering forward along the battery he halted at the break of the forecastle and repeated the blast then shaking the moisture from the instrument he wiped his mouth on the back of his hand and strutted aft he had sounded captain's defaulters an able seaman burnishing a searchlight on the boat deck heard the strident bugle call and winced hurriedly he replaced his cleaning rags and with a moistened forefinger and thumb adjusted a dank curl that peeped beneath his cap he shared the belief not uncommon among sailormen that the captain's judgment at the defaulter table is duly swayed by the personal appearance of the delinquent 
eyeing his inverted reflection in the big concave mirror he screwed his face into an expression of piteous appeal and cap in hand repeated several times in varying notes of regretful surprise i hadn't had no more'n a drop sir and when i come over all dizzy the rehearsal concluded he flung himself pell-mell down the ladder on the way he met a messmate ascending who remonstrated in the brusque parlance of the tar in a bloomin rattle i am explained the disturbers of traffic what's up then the other made a little upward gesture with his elbow and gave a laugh of pleasant retrospection struth he supplemented wasn't half blind neither implying that when last ashore he had looked upon the cup when it was very ruddy indeed at the screen door to the quarter-deck he overtook a companion in misfortune en route to tow-pitch this was a frightened second-class stoker harried aft by one of the ship's police at the shambling gate officially recognized as the steady double together they saluted and stepped on to the quarter-deck where already standing between his escort a sullen-eyed deserter captured the previous day scowled into vacancy the newcomers took their places in the melancholy line stood easy and commenced to preen themselves furtively after the manner of sailors about to come under the direct eye of authority then the captain's clerk arrived with a bundle of papers in his hand already master at arms already sir the iron-visaged chief of police saluted and went to report to the commander the commander ran his eyes over the defaulter sheet and entering the captain's cabin disappeared from view for a minute a hush settled over the group as silently they awaited the coming of the man who to them represented all that was omnipotent upon earth the breeze led the shadow of the white ensign a fantastic dance across the spotless planking and rustled the papers on the baize covered table overhead a gull soared screaming at intervals and then swooped suddenly to the water the owner of the cherished curl who was what is technically known in the service as a bird sucked his teeth thoughtfully and speculated as to the probable extent of his punishment the second-class stoker fallen in beside him who had broken his leave twenty-four hours and apparently expected to be executed suddenly sniffled and was reproved in an undertone by the master-at-arms oh gerow said that dignitary then raising his voice he shouted falters shun the captain's clerk who had been abstractedly watching the seagull's antics and thinking about trout fishing came to earth with a start the waiting group stiffened to attention and saluted the captain walked to the table and picked up the charge sheet herbert hawkins snapped the master-at-arms off cap absent over leave twenty-four hours sir the second-class stoker stepped forward it was his first offence in the service and the adam's apple in his throat worked like a piston suddenly recollecting he snatched off his cap and stood moistening dry lips how long has this man been in the service asked the captain grave eyes on the delinquent's face four months sir replied his clerk then to the culprit why did you break your leave the lad shook his head in obstinate silence as a matter of fact he had broken it because a glib-tongued slut ashore kept him too drunk to return till he was penniless but what was the use of telling all that to a being with four gold rings on his sleeve and grey eyes like gimlets in the shadow of the cap peak he wouldn't understand how desperately bad the liquor had been and the way the woman talked why did you break your leave the voice was neither harsh nor impatient its tone merely implied that the speaker not only wanted an answer but meant to have one rather a kind voice for a captain queer little wrinkles he had round the corners of his mouth and eyes made a bloke look wise-like as though after all lord how his head ached steady eyes those were oh it's like this year sir the gates of sulky reserve opened suddenly and without warning in a flood of words came the sorry explanation sordid incoherent clothed in the half-learned patois of the lower deck 
but the figure in the gold-peaked cap seemed to accept it such as it was for presently he nodded dismissal cautioned he said curtly with the click of the heels the escort and their prisoner wheeled before the table the commander made a brief report and the captain scanned a few papers the charge was desertion anything to say no sir why did you desert i'm fed up with the navy the captain's eyes grew stern and he nodded as one who comprehends there had been moments in his own career when he too had been fed up with the navy but life holds other things than obedience to inclinations now this deserter represented a type that is to be met with in both services these days of piping peace recruited from the slums of a great city bone lazy and vicious as a weasel small wonder he found a life wherein men worked hard and cleanly little to his taste the immaculate cleanliness and clockwork regularity around him were bad enough but far worse was the discipline it astonished him at first then half awed he hated it with all the sullen savagery of his warped nature the so-called socialism of black-garbed orators idly listened to on sunday afternoons in bygone days had hinted at such possibilities but here he met it face to face at every turn for a while a very little while he defied it as he had defied impassive policemen in gutter snipe days with shrill meaningless obscenities then he strove to elude it and was clouted grievously by o'leary the brawny chief stoker in that he had skulked from his lawfully appointed task he had meant to drop a fire-bar on o'leary's head for that but hadn't the courage requisite for murder because of his dirty habits and an innate habit for acquiring other men's gear he was not beloved of his messmates and to be unpopular on the mess-deck of a man-o'-war means that the sooner you seek another walk of life the better he strove to seek it accordingly burrowing back into the teeming slum life of yore until one night in the flare of a hawker's barrow a policeman's hand closed upon his collar i think there's time i believe we'll make a man of you yet i'll deal with you by warrant the escort swung him on his heel the captain glanced again at the charge sheet and thence to the third culprit before him you were drunk on leave no sir but the officer of the patrol and the officer of the watch and the surgeon all say you were drunk the bird sighed deeply i hadn't had norna drop sir he began deprived of one day's pay interrupted the captain and get your hair cut hair cut for what one day's pay echoed the master at arms on cap bout turn quick march the day passed as most days do in harbour in the afternoon the captain played a game of golf and in the evening dined with a brother captain during the meal they discussed submarine signalling and a new putter the commander who contemplated matrimony was in a conservatory conducting himself in a manner calculated to reduce his ship's company had they been present to babbling delirium in the twilight the captain's clerk with rod and fly-book meandered beside a stream twenty miles away the master-at-arms who had a taste for melodrama witnessed from a plush-lined box the body-snatcher's revenge in the company of mrs and miss master-at-arms and a quart of stout on board in the foremost cell sat a recovered deserter under sentence of ninety days detention god he whined and in his voice was an exceeding bitterness what you want to hate me for now these things were happening at about the same time so you see the drift of his argument with his maker end of chapter two chapter three of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three a galley's day boom on board the flagship a puff of smoke rose and dissolved in the breeze the cluster of whalers and gigs that had been hovering about the starting line sped away before the wind 
the bay to windward resembled the shallows near the nesting ground of white-winged gulls as the remaining gigs whalers and cutters zigzagged tentatively to and fro and a couple of belated twenty-five-foot whalers caught napping went tearing down among them the launches and pinnaces do not start for another hour and are for the most part still at the booms of their respective ships there are three more classes before us and it only remains to keep out of the way and an eye on the stopwatch the breeze is freshening and it looks like a galley's day a thirty-two feet cutter handiest and sweetest of all service boats to sail goes skimming past on a trial run her gilded badge gleams in the spray and there is a sheen of brasswork and enamel about her that proclaims the pampered darling of a ship the midshipman at the helm to show a mere galley what he can do chooses a squall in which he put her about she spins round like a top and is off on her new tack in the twinkling of an eye casey petty officer and captain's coxswain is busy forward with the awning and an additional halyard rove through a block at the foremast's head this steadied by the boat-hook will serve us as a spinnaker during the three-mile run downwind and in a service rig race is the only additional fitting allowed beyond what is defined as the rig the boat uses on service made of service canvas by service labour only a half minute now check away the sheets spinnaker halyards in hand boom we are off hoist spinnaker as we cross the line the thirty-two foot cutter and a couple of gigs slip over abreast of us astern a host of white sails come bellying in our wake up to windward the pinnaces and launches are manoeuvring for position the cutter has goose-winged her dipping lug and is running dead before the wind in a narrow boat like a galley this is dangerous and does not pay luffing a little we get the wind on our quarter and the gigs follow suit presently the cutter jibes and loses ground the gigs too have dropped astern a little our galley's crew settle down in the bottom of the boat and producing pipes and cigarettes from inside their caps speculate on the chances of the day far ahead the smaller fry are negotiating the mark buoy imperceptibly the breeze freshens till the wind is whipping a wet smoke off the tops of the waves casey tending the main sheet removes his pipe and spits overside i reckon we'll want our weatherboards before we're done sir he prophesies we have shown the rest of our class a clean pair of heels by now and are fast overhauling the whalers at last the mark buoy down spinnaker and round we go close hauled now the work starts a white squall tearing down the bay blinds us with spray and fine desert sand the water pours over the gunwale as we luff and luff again there's nothing for it we must reef and while we do so round come the remainder some reefed and labouring others lying up in the wind with flapping sails a nasty short sea has set in and at the snub of each wave the galley for all the careful nursing she receives quivers like a sensitive being she can't bear that reef in her foresail says casey it do make her that sluggish as he spoke our rival the thirty-two foot cutter went thrashing past under full sail her crew crouched to windward it was going to be neck or nothing with them then by james got anything to bail with forward there yes sir replied seven voices as one stand by to shake out that reef we luffed for a second while two gigs and a pinnace crept up on our quarter and then off we went in the seething wake of the cutter even casey's big toe curled convulsively as he braced himself against the thwart and spat on his hands to get a fresh grip on the main sheet the spray hissed over us like rain and under cover of his oilskin i believe number five perched on the weather gunwale was sorrowfully unlacing his boots if it don't get no worse says casey we'll do all right with his bulldog chin above the gunwale he commenced a running commentary on the proceeding struth there's a foremast gone he gazed astern enraptured commander's weather shroud carried away sir and i'm a-driftin helpless them whalers is bailin like loonatics he gave a hoarse chuckle like proper loonatics sir that there launch precious near foul the mark boy he'll run down that gig if he don't watch it their owner sailing her too then the squalls died away and the breeze steadied 
i could hear the surge of a launch as she came crashing along on our quarter but once around the second mark boy and on the port tack no one could touch us at least so casey vowed suddenly the half-drowned bowman gave the first sign of animation that he had displayed since the green seas began to break over him she's missed stays he announced with gruff relish peering under the lip of the foresail ooh not that cutter casey so far forgot himself as to squirt tobacco juice into the sacred bottom of his own boat yes sir and so help me he added in confirmation she's in hirons note a boat is said to be in irons when she lies dead head to wind and cannot pay off on either tack End note. the next minute we passed to windward of our rival as with flapping sheets and reversed helm she drifted slowly astern her midshipman avoided our eyes as we passed but his expression of incredulous exasperation i have seen matched only on the face of one whose loved and trusted hunter has refused a familiar jump above the noise of the wind and waves i heard his angry wail oh isn't she a cow the wind held fair and true and as casey prophesied it proved a galley's day after all a launch and two pinnaces raced us for the flagship's ram and our rudder missed the cable by inches as we wore to bring us on to the finishing line even then the launch nearly had it but i think that the observations exchanged as we slipped round side by side sotto voce and perfectly audible to every one in both boats between casey and the launch's coxswain did much to spoil the nerve of the first lieutenant who was sailing her much of that day i have forgotten but the sheen of white sails sprinkled along the triangular nine-mile course the grey hulls of the fleet against the blue of sea and sky the tremor of the boat's frame as the water raced hissing past her clinker-built sides the bucket and shrug the lurch and reel and plunge as she fought her way to windward all these things have combined to make a blur of infinitely pleasant memories casey gave a sigh of contentment and handed back an empty glass through the pantry door well sir he said i reckon that was a proper caper then as if realizing that his summing up of the race required adequate embellishment and less formal surroundings in which to do the occasion justice he wiped his mouth on the back of a huge paw and moved forward out of sight along the mess deck End of chapter three Chapter Four of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. Noel. Orf by seven, sir. A private of Marines wrapped heavy knuckles against the chest of drawers, and seeing the occupant of the bunk stir slightly, withdrew from the cabin. For a little while longer, the figure under the blankets lay motionless. Then a tousled head appeared, followed by shoulders and arms. Grr said their owner he blinked at the electric light a moment then reached out a lean tattooed arm for his tea he drank it thoughtfully and lighting a cigarette lay back again his gaze travelled from the rack overhead that contained his gun and golf clubs down over the chest of drawers with its freight of battered silver cups photographs and japanese curios to the deck where a can of hot water steamed beside the shallow bath finally it lit on the chair on the back of which hung his frock coat why had his servant put out his frock coat was it sunday for a while he considered the problem then he remembered with a grunt he hoisted himself on to one elbow and looked out of the scuttle into the gloom it was snowing and the reflected lights of the ships blinked at him across the water oh lord he ejaculated and buried himself anew among the blankets twenty minutes later as he was sitting in his bath the curtain across the door was unceremoniously jerked aside and a ruddy face appeared in the opening noel noel chanted the apparition a sponge full of water cut the carolers short and the sounds of strife and expostulation drifted from adjacent cabins marked the trail of yuletide greetings in the wardroom the fire was smoking fitfully each outpour being regarded with philosophic resignation by the marine duty servant him the first lieutenant entering at that moment drove wrathfully on deck 
Go up and trim the cowl to the wind. Don't stand there trying to mesmerize the infernal thing. One by one, the members of the mess struggled in and seated themselves in gloomy silence. There were many gaps in the long row of chairs, for every one spared by the exigencies of the service was on leave, the heads of departments being represented by their juniors and a couple of watch-keeping lieutenants completing the compliment. The young doctor alone preserved a cheerful mien. "'Boy, you're as yellow as a guinea,' was his greeting to the junior watchkeeper, recently a sojourner on the west coast with a constitution to match. "'How's the fever?' The junior watchkeeper ascribed to the malady a quality hitherto unrecognized by the most advanced medical science, and scanned the menu indifferently. The belated arrival of the postman as the table was being cleared did much to brighten matters. A rustling silence, interspersed by an occasional chuckle, hurriedly repressed, presently gave way to general conversation. Pipes were lit, and the fire coaxed into a more urbane frame of mind. The junior watchkeeper was seen to transfer stealthily from a letter to his pocket something that crackled crisply. The young doctor and the assistant paymaster, here and after known as the A.P., sat complacently on his chest while they explored his pockets. "'Let me. It's years since I touched a fiver. And a done from Ikey. Well, I'm blessed. And a Christmas card from Aunt Selina to dear Gussie. Oh, Gussie, look at the pretty angels. He hides it in his pocket. He stands fizz all around at seven bells, announced the first lieutenant in a calm, judicial voice. The junior watchkeeper didn't stand it, but fizz all around there was. The first lieutenant read prayers on the snow-powdered quarter-deck, and then, following the immemorial custom of the service, the wardroom made a tour of the garland-hung mess-deck, halting at each mess to exchange the compliments of the season and to stample the plum-duff. Properly observed, this ritual would put the normal stomach out of action for the remainder of the day, but there are discreet methods of sampling. The Deon flopped exhaustedly onto a wardroom settee and proceeded to empty his cap of lumps of figgy duff, cigarettes, and walnuts. "'Bless their hearts,' he murmured. "'I love them, and I love their figgy duff, but there are limits. Here, Jess.' He whistled gently, and a fox terrier, asleep by the fire, rose and delicately accepted the tribute. "'Number one,' continued the speaker, "'you looked quite coy when they cheered you, going rounds just now.' Then, raising his voice, he sang, "'For he's a jolly good fellow!' The first lieutenant's grave face relaxed. "'Less of it, young fella,' he replied, smiling. He had lost a wife and child as a young lieutenant, and something of his life's tragedy still lingered in the level gray eyes. Then followed the popping of corks and the tinkle of glass. Even the fever-stricken one brightened. "'Now, then,' he shouted truculently to the young doctor, "'I don't mind if you do wish me a happy Christmas, you benighted body-snatcher.' But the surgeon was opening the piano, and as he fingered the opening bars of Good King Wenceslaus, someone turned and smote the fire into a blaze. The short day was fading into dusk, and the mess sat eyeing one another sorrowfully over the tea-table. You can't drink champagne, sing Good King Lemons's Claws, and beat the fire all day. What price being at home now? said the engineer lieutenant, gloomily buttering a piece of bread and smearing it with treacle. Yes, and charades and kids and snapdragon, added the A.P. He mused a while reminiscently. Christmas is rotten without kids to buck things up. The day on looked up from a book. You're right. I don't feel as if it were Christmas Day, except for my head, he added reflectively. The first lieutenant entered, holding a note in his hand. Look here. The skipper wants us to have him and his missus to supper. He'll motor in and— He referred again to the note. He's bringing the four youngsters and a Christmas tree. Wants to know if we can put up a turn for them. In the annals of the service had such a thing ever happened before? The mess stared wild-eyed at one another. "'Crackers!' gasped the day on, visions of childhood fleeting through his mind. "'Santa Claus!' murmured the young doctor, already mentally reviewing his store of cotton wool. "'Holly and mistletoe!' supplemented the engineer lieutenant, eyeing the bare walls of the mess. There was much to be done, but they did it somehow. The A.P. sallied forth and stole crackers from a mission schoolroom. 
the first lieutenant and young doctor between them fashioned a wondrous wig and beard for santa claus the junior watchkeeper is rumoured to have uprooted under cover of darkness an entire holly bush from the admiral superintendent's garden and their guests arrived to find the mess transformed no sooner was supper over than the first lieutenant vanished and they entered the smoking-room to find a genuine santa claus with snowy beard and gruff voice dispensing gifts from the magic tree there were miraculous presents for all zeiss binoculars for one had he not been bemoaning the want of a pair on the bridge a fortnight before a wrist-watch for another it replaced one smashed while working targets not long ago a fountain pen for another a cigarette holder for a fourth whose tobacco-stained fingers had long been a subject of reproach from his captain's wife and when the tree was denuded at last what an ambush for lurking dragons they were slain ultimately with a sword scabbard by a flushed knight astride the champing junior watchkeeper it figured further in the tiger shoot conducted from the howdah of an elephant a noble beast in whose identity no one would have recognized the grey-painted canvas cover of a three-pounder gun much less the engineer lieutenant inside it for the matter of that had you seen the tiger who died roaring terribly almost within reach of its tethered quarry jess the bored and disgusted terrier you would never have known the a p especially as he had broken his glasses in the throes of realistic dissolution when it was all over the skipper's missus sat down at the piano and together they sang the old memory-haunted christmas hymns the woman's contralto and children's trebles blending with the voices of men who at heart were ever children themselves the first lieutenant didn't sing the fire needed so much attending to end of chapter four Chapter Five of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: The Argonauts. Lest perchance them grow weary in the uttermost parts of the sea, pray for leave for the good of the service, as much and as oft as may be. The Laws of the Navy. Life on board a man of war in the tropics, especially gunroom life, is attended by discomforts peculiarly its own. To begin with, a trip at sea heats the ship like a steel walled inferno, and on reaching harbour she swings at her anchor, bows on to what breeze there may be. The chances of getting a cool draught through scuttles and gun ports are thus reduced to a minimum there is furthermore an affliction known as prickly heat besides which chastisement with scorpions is futile and ineffectual moreover you must meet the same faces day after day month after month at breakfast lunch and dinner till junior officers of his majesty's navy have been known to revile one another over each other's style of masticating food from these conditions of life spring indeed a candid and illuminating intimacy but they are also at times responsible for a weariness of the soul that passes utterly all boredom the trouble began in the bathroom an apartment twelve feet long by eight feet broad and occupied at the time by six people in various stages of their ablutions it concerned the ownership of a piece of soap which may seem a trivial enough matter as indeed it was but when you have lain sweating under the awning all through a breathless night when having watched another aching dawn creep over the sea you descend to splash sulkily in three inches of lukewarm water the tired brain lacks a fine sense of the proportion of things it finished as suddenly as it flared up and both combatants realized the childishness of it all ere the blood had time to dry on their damaged knuckles but beyond a peevish request that they should not hold their dripping noses over the basins no one present appeared interested or dismayed which was a very bad sign indeed the senior midshipman burst into the gunroom with a whoop of joy and flung the leave-book on the table what did he say chorused the inmates anxiously 
said we could take the third cutter and go to blazes in her replied the delegate breathlessly grovelling under the table for his gun case we can clear out till sunday night and if there's a scratch on the new paint when we come back the flushed face appeared for an instant we'll all be crucified whereupon ensued swift and awful pandemonium three blissful days of untrammelled freedom ashore in which to eat bathe and sleep at will the mess rose with one accord and blessed the name of the commander in ornate phraseology of the sea four navigating experts flung themselves upon a large-scale admiralty chart guns and cartridges appeared as if by magic a self-appointed committee of supply wrangling amicably invaded the pantry blankets were hurriedly dragged from the hammock nettings while willing hands lowered the cutter from her davits in crises such as these there is no need to detail workers for any particular duty each one realizes his own particular metier and is a law unto himself hoist foresail the boat sheered off lazily from the gangway and the bowman tugged and strained at the halyards set mainsail a light breeze whispered in from the open sea and rippled water clucked and gurgled along the clinker-built sides perched on a bundle of rugs in the stern sat the coxswain one hand on the tiller the other shading his eyes from the afternoon sun the remainder of the crew disposed themselves in more or less inelegant attitudes of ease in the bottom of the boat she had been rigged and provisioned in silence not lightly does one imperil one's emancipation by making a noise alongside but once clear of the ship the youth tending the main sheet lifted up his voice in song a babble of spontaneous nonsense set to a half-remembered tune isn't this a bit of all right oh isn't this a bit of all right he chanted joyously eyes half closed under the brim of his tilted helmet forgotten the weary monotony of ship routine with its watch-keeping and school squabbling and recrimination and the ceaseless adjustment of the scales of discipline forward in the bows one of the bowmen hove the lead chanting imaginary soundings with ultra-professional intonation ah and a ha five clinging to the weather shroud another a slim white-clad figure against the blue of sea and sky declaimed the ancient mariner or as much of it as he could remember the islands that half an hour earlier had been but vague outlines quivering in the heat haze took form and substance rock-guarded inlets crept up to beaches of white sand where the kelp and driftwood of ages formed a barrier at high water mark and overhanging palms threw shadows deep and delectably mysterious as the water shoaled seaward stretched purple tentacles upward out of the gloom swaying and undulating towards the swirl beneath the rudder a half-clad figure in the bows trailing naked toes over the side shattered the sleepy silence with shouts that sent the echoes rioting among the rocks overhead a startled gull wheeled inquisitively hard a port now steady as you go with lowered sails and oars rising and dipping lazily the boat headed towards an inlet whose shelving beach promised good camping ground presently came the order way enough the oars clattered down onto the thwarts the anchor splashed overside and a moment later a dozen figures were swimming lustily for thrice blessed terra firma a tent was pitched and the precious guns ferried ashore an intrepid party of explorers headed off into the jungle in search of pigeon others played desultory rugby football in the shallows chased lizards rent the air with song the long day passed all too quickly swiftly the tropic night swept in over painted sky and treetop ghost-like figures came splashing from pools sliding down from trees floating shoreward on improvised rafts to gather round the fire and fizzling frying-pans tinned sausages bangers and bacon jam sardines and bananas cocoa beer and slow gin the argonauts guzzled shamelessly 
when it was all over and pipes and cigarettes were lit some one rose and flung an armful of dry kelp into the white heart of the fire it spluttered angrily and then flared throwing an arc of crimson light on the beach deepening the obscurity that ringed the seated group the argonaut nearest the fire picked up a pebble and pitched it lazily at a neighbor what about a song you slacker something with a chorus the other removed his pipe from his mouth wriggled into a sitting posture and hugging the corners of his blanket over his shoulders started a song it was from a comic opera two years old but it was the last thing they heard before leaving england and the refrain went ringing across the starlit bay the firelight waned and a yellow moon crept up out of the sea setting a shimmering pathway to the edge of the world hi ya yawned one so sleepy he hollowed out the sand beneath his hip bone drew his blanket closer round him and was asleep one by one the singers were silent and as the moon full sail upon the face of heaven flooded the islands with solemn light the last argonaut rolled over and began to snore the waves lapped drowsily along the beach tiny crabs crept out in scurrying sidelong rushes to investigate the disturbers of their peace the dying embers of the fire clinked and whispered in the silence the commander smoking on the after sponson smiled as the sound of oars came faintly across the water out of the darkness drifted the hum of voices and presently he heard a clear laugh mirthful and carefree knocking the ashes out of his pipe he nodded sagely as though in answer to an unspoken question End of chapter five Chapter six of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six A Gunroom Smoking Circle. Be it understood that gunroom officers do not usually talk at breakfast. The right minded entrench themselves behind newspapers and deal in all seriousness and silence with such fare as it has pleased the messman to provide in harbour those favoured of the gods make a great business of opening and reading letters pausing between mouthfuls to smirk in an irritating and unseemly manner but it is not until one reaches the marmalade stage and the goal of repletion is nigh that speech is pardonable and is then usually confined to observations on the incompetency of the cook in the matter of scrambling eggs and the like abreast the screen door which opened from the battery to the quarter-deck the ship's side curved suddenly into a semicircular bastion it was thus designed to give the main-deck gun a larger arc of fire but had other advantages affording a glimpse ahead of splayed-out seas racing aft from the bow and in fine weather a sunny space sheltered from the wind by casemate and superstructure here one morning after breakfast came the gunroom smokers pipe and tobacco pouches in hand cigarettes were all very well in their way two draws and a spit snatched during stand easy in the forenoon a cigar was a satisfying enough smoke after dinner when one's finances permitted it but while the day of infinite possibility still lay ahead and the raw new sunlight flushed the world with promise then was the time for briar or clay black well seasoned and of a pungent sweetness each smoker settled into his favourite nook and cap tilted over his nose with feet drawn up and hand clasped knees prepared to sit in kindly judgment on the universe the sub-lieutenant blew a mighty cloud of smoke and gave a sigh of contentment he had kept the middle watch from midnight till four that morning he had been on the bridge moving between the faint glow of the binnacle and the chart house busying himself with a ruler and dividers and faint lines on the surface of the chart he was clear-eyed and serene of brow as befitted a man who had seen the dawning for a like reason he had neglected to shave 
what's the news inquired the assistant paymaster between puffs the ship had been three days at sea and was even then a hundred and fifty miles from her destination but very early in the morning a tired-eyed operator in the wireless house had sat measuring in dots and dashes the beating of the world's pulse a disastrous earthquake began a midshipman reading from the closely written sheet oh hang you and your earthquake said the sub i'm sick of earthquakes who won the test match which when you consider the matter is no bad attitude towards life in which to start the day a new aeroplane resumed the reader talking of aeroplanes interrupted someone i once knew a girl why don't they have snotties in the flying corps chimed in a third why if i were in the government i'd but the reader continued in tranquil indifference quite a number of years had passed since he first learned that in gum-room communities to stop speaking on account of interruptions meant spending your days in the silence of a trappist at the point of the bayonet the enemy retreating in disorder silence on the group at last this was of more account than cricket or aeroplanes for this was war their trade in theory and perchance and the fates were wondrous kind the ultimate destiny of each the censor of governments gave a delighted blast from his pipe the bayonet he breathed that's the game in all his short life he had never seen a blow delivered in hate the hate that strikes to kill yet a queer light smouldered in his eyes as half dreamily he watched the waves scurrying to join the smother of the wake the clerk by the muzzle of the six-inch gun took his pipe out of his mouth and turned towards the speaker i've got a brother in the frontier lucky blighter i bet he's in it he removed his glasses as he always did in moments of excitement and blinked short-sightedly in the morning sunlight he came of a fighting strain but had been doomed by bad sight to exchange the sword that was his heritage for pen and ledger does it say anything else let me see billy no no details only a few casualties they killed a subalt he stopped abruptly the wind caught the sheet and whisked it from his fingers his face had grown white beneath its tan oh you ass chorused the group the piece of paper whirled high in the air and settled in the water astern a shadow fell athwart the seated group and the sub looked up hello good morning padre good morning replied the sturdy figure in the mortarboard a genial priest this who combined parochial duties with those of naval instructor and spent the dog watches in flannels on the forecastle shepherding a section of his flock with the aid of boxing gloves discussing the affairs of your betters and the universe as usual i suppose i came over to observe that there's a very fine horizon and if any of ye feel an uncontrollable desire to take a sight not yet sir protested a clear tenor chorus morning watch sir added a voice then mimicking the grumbling whine of a discontented ordinary seaman ain't ad no stand easy besides sir the index error of my sextant somewhere forward in the battery the notes of a bugle sang out the members of the gun-room smoking circle mechanically knocked out their pipes against the rim of the whitewashed spit kid and rose one by one to their feet straightening their caps in a minute the sponson was deserted save for the clerk who lingered blinking at the sunlit sea a moment later he turned encountering the kindly level eyes of the chaplain the name he said with a little inclination of his head to where far astern a gull was circling curiously was it the same sir as as mine yes replied the chaplain gravely the boy nodded and turned again to the sea his young face had hardened and the colour had gone out of his lips the other thrice blessed in the knowledge of how much sympathy unmans and how much strengthens to endure laid a steadying hand on the square shoulder presented to him he died fighting remember said this man of peace the clerk nodded again and gripped the handrail harder he always was the lucky one sir he adjusted his glasses thoughtfully and went below to where in the electric-lit office 
the ship's ledger was awaiting him end of chapter six chapter seven of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the ship visitors there's the boat exclaimed the younger girl excitedly her sister nodded with dancing eyes and half turned to squeeze her mother's arm half a mile away a picket boat detached itself from one of the anchored battleships and came speeding across the harbour breathless they watched it approach saw bow and stern sheet men stoop for their boat hooks heard the warning clang of the engine-room bell and the next moment the midshipman in charge swung her deftly alongside the landing stage with a smother of foam under the stern a figure in uniform frock coat jumped out hello mother sorry i'm late have you been waiting long mind the step the descent into a picket-boat's stern sheets especially if you are encumbered by a skirt is no easy matter perhaps the midshipman of the boat realized it too for he abandoned the wheel and assisted in the embarkation with the ready hand and averted eye that told of no small experience in such matters then they heard a clear-cut order the bell rang again and the return journey commenced but they did not hear the hoarse whisper conveyed down the voice-pipe to the leading stoker to whack her up and so they failed to realize that they were throbbing through the water at a speed which though causing the midshipmen of passing boats to gnash their teeth with envy was exceedingly bad for the engines and wholly illegal but then one does not bring a messmate's sisters off to the ship every day of the week presently the bell rang again and a grey steel wall dotted with scuttles and surmounted by a rail towered above them the boat stopped palpitating beside a snowy ladder that reached the water's edge the occupant of the stockhold threw up the hatch of his miniature inferno and thrust a perspiring head into view but it is to be feared that no one noticed him though he had contributed in no small degree to the passengers entertainment the mother looked at the mahogany railed ladder and sighed thankfully i always thought you climbed up by rope ladders dear she whispered the ascent accomplished followed introductions to smiling and somewhat bashful youths who relieved the visitors of parasols and handbags and led the way to a deck below where racks of rifles were ranged along white enamelled bulkheads and a marine sentry clicked to attention as they passed down a narrow passage lit by electric lights past a cage-like kitchen and rows of black-topped chests and as the guide paused before a curtained door a glimpse forward of crowded mess-decks then a little bewildered they found themselves in a narrow apartment lit by four brass-bound scuttles a long table ran the length of the room with tea-things laid at one end overhead were racks of golf clubs and hockey sticks cricket bats and rackets a row of dirks hung above the tiled stove and a baize covered notice-board letter-racks and a miscellaneous collection of pictures adorned the rivet-studded walls a somewhat battered piano topped by a dejected palm occupied one end of the mess and beneath the sideboard a strip of baize made an ineffectual attempt to cover the end of a beer-barrel this said the host with a tinge of pride in his voice is the gun-room where we live he added it's very nice murmured the visitors it's not a bad one as gun-rooms go admitted another of the escort he did not add that under his personal supervision a harassed throng of junior midshipmen had spent a lurid half-hour squaring off before their arrival after tea came a tour of the ship and to those who inspect one for the first time the interior of a man-of-war is not without interest they emerged from a hatchway on to the quarter-deck beneath the wicked muzzles of the after twelve-inch guns they crossed the immaculate planking and looked down to the level waters of the harbour thirty feet below they admired the neatly coiled boats falls 
the trim and slightly self-conscious figure of the officer of the watch and as they turned to mount the ladder that led over the turret a signalman came on to the quarter-deck raising his hand to the salute as he passed through the screen door who did that sailor salute inquired the mother oh replied her escort vaguely only salutin the quarter-deck we all do you know so much for his summary of a custom that has survived from days when a crucifix overshadowing the poop required the doffing of a sailor's cap then they were taken forward past the orderly confusion of the booms to a round pill-box described as the conning tower with twelve-inch walls of krupp steel and introduced to an assortment of levers and voice-pipes mysterious dials and a brass-studded steering-wheel then up a ladder to the signal bridge where barefooted men with skins tanned brick-red and telescopes under their arms swung ceaselessly to and fro they examined the flag lockers each flag rolled neatly in a bundle and stowed in a docketed compartment the black and white semaphores and the key of the masthead flashing lamp that at night winked messages across five miles of darkness from then onwards that afternoon became a series of blurred impression of things mysterious and delightfully bewildering they carried away with them memories of the swarming forecastle and batteries where they saw the sailor man enjoying his leisure in his own peculiar fashion of the six-inch breech lock that opened with a clang to show the spiral grooved bore rifled to prevent the projectile from turning somersaults the younger girl wiped a foot of wet paint off the calming of a hatch and said sweetly it didn't matter in the least they invaded the sanctity of the wireless room with its crackling spark and network of wires and listened all uncomprehending to the petty officer in charge as delighted with a lay audience he plunged into a whirl of technical explanations and lastly the mother was handed the receivers and heard a faint intermittent buzzing that was a ship calling querulously three hundred miles away after that they descended to electric-lit depths and were invited into cabins they visited the slop room impossible name where they fingered serge and duck with feminine appreciation they saw the nettings where the hammocks were stowed and the overhead slinging space eighteen inches to a man and so back to the upper deck to find the picket boat again at the bottom of the ladder hasn't it been lovely gasped the elder girl as they walked back to their hotel scrumptious assented her sister and did you notice the boy who steered the boat that brought us back he had a face like a cherub looked at through a magnifying glass meanwhile he of the magnified cherubic countenance was rattling dice with a friend preparatory to indulging in a well-earned glass of marsala outside the gunroom pantry the grimy gentleman whose sphere of duty lay in the picket boat's stockhold sought recognition of his services in the upturned quart jug which is also illegal and contrary to the king's regulations and admiralty instructions End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight: The Legion on the Wall. Not now, not now, not yet. Sea Law and Sea Power. The last of the battle squadrons filed majestically to its appointed anchorage a snake-like flotilla of destroyers slid in under the lee of the land and joined the parent ship wisps of smoke east and west heralded the arrival of far-flung scouts the great annual war games was at an end and the fleet had met with rime encrusted funnels and rust-streaked sides to talk it over and snatch a breathing space ere returning to their wide sea-beats and patrols evening drew on and the semaphores were busy waving invitations to dinner from ship to ship opportunities of meeting friends were none too frequent and when they occur are often of the briefest 
so no time was lost and a sort of general post ensued among wardrooms and gunrooms in the flagship's wardroom dinner was over and a haze of tobacco smoke spread among the shaded lights and glinting plate conversation that began with technical discussion had become personal and reminiscent do you remember that time commenced one his immediate listeners nodded delightedly and sat with narrowed eyes and retrospective smiles as the narrator continued twirling the stem of his wine-glass well did they recall the story but it had to be told again for the joy of the telling while they supplemented with a forgotten name or incident harking back to the golden yesterday when the world went very well indeed the talk swung north to the bering sea and south to table bay forging swift links with the past as it went it would have seemed to a stranger as if the members of a club had met to discuss a common experience and yet these men were here haphazard from a dozen ships their club the seven seas and their common experience life as it is to be met in the seaports of the world as chairs were pushed from the table and the evening wore on fresh greetings sounded on all sides hello old tubby as i live good lord how long is it since seven nine my dear soul it's ten weary years and so on they were all young men too almost boys some of them with eager excited faces lean with hard work worthy sons of the same grey hard mother through the skylight came the opening bars of the lancers and there was a general move on deck the gun-room was there already and two sets being formed the dance began much it left in point of elegance it is to be feared but it was fine strenuous exercise the last figure was reached and on completion of the grand chain the two sets linked arms dashed whooping across the deck and met in an inextricable heap of arms legs crumpled shirt fronts and mess jackets oh my aunt gasped an ex-international crawling from beneath a mound of assailants and vainly striving to adjust collar and tie my last boiled shirt and it's got to last another week presently every one repaired to the wardroom where corks were popping from soda-water bottles and an amateur humorist of renown sat down to the piano as the laughing crowd gathered round a couple of bridge tables were made up and the players settled down with that complacent indifference to outside distraction peculiar to men who live habitually in crowded surroundings seated astride the chairs at one end of the mess two teams of would-be polo players were soon locked in conflict tablespoons and an orange being accessories to the game the singer of comic songs had finished his repertoire and the mess turned in search of fresh distraction come on old mouldy what about putting up your little turn called out one addressing a grave-faced officer who sat smoking on the settee yes chorused half a dozen voices go on do the officer addressed as mouldy sat down at the piano fingered the keys contemplatively for a moment and then in a deep baritone voice began god of our fathers known of old lord of our far-flung battle line and so on to the end of the first verse the polo players ceased their horseplay and leaned panting over the backs of their wooden steeds to listen the second verse drew to a close an humble and a contrite heart and then the group round the singer joined in the refrain lord god of hosts be with us yet lest we forget lest we forget at the fourth verse the mess clustered round the piano the bridge players had laid their hands down and at the skylight overhead appeared faces and the glint of uniforms the gun-room started the last verse and the rest joined men's voices bass and tenor lifting the stately words in a great volume of harmony up through the skylight into the night all valiant dust that builds on dust and guarding calls not thee to guard for frantic boast and foolish word thy mercy on thy people lord amen 
the last solemn chord died away and a sudden silence fell upon the mess it was some moments before the conversation once more became general by twos and threes the guests departed groups clustered at the gangways the night was full of farewells and the hooting of picket-boat sirens gradually the mess emptied and in the flat where the midshipmen slept silence reigned among the chests and hammocks the admiral's guest had also departed but on the silent quarter-deck two tall figures walked up and down pipes in mouth i wonder why they sang that thing said one musingly his companion paused and stared across the water at the lights of the town from there his gaze travelled round to the silent fleet line after line of twinkling anchor lights and huge hulls looming through the darkness somehow it seemed extraordinarily appropriate with things as they are ashore just now you mean all these strikes and rioting class hatred this futile discussion about armaments brawling in parliament lesser breeds without the law gradually assuming control the other nodded and turned again to the sea as he moved a row of miniature decorations on his jacket made a tiny clink yes and meanwhile we go on just the same talking as little as they will let us just working on our appointed task holding to our tradition of ready ay ready our traditions yes his companion gave a little grim laugh do you know the story of the last legion left on the wall he jerked his head towards where the pole star hung in the starry heavens how rome sliding into chaos withdrew her legions till only one was left to garrison the wall and it was forgotten rumours must have reached the fellows in that legion of what was going on at home of blind folly in high places corruption defeat the draggle-tailed roman eagle must have been a jest in the market-places of the world he paused puffing thoughtfully you can imagine them he continued falling back tower by tower on the centre attacked in front and behind and on both flanks by an enemy they despised as barbarians but who by sheer force of numbers must annihilate them in the end unless rome rallied suppose they could have retreated or compromised haggled for their skins no one would have thought less of them for it in those days but they had been brought up in all the brave traditions of their empire when you think of it there wasn't much left to fight for except their proud traditions and yet they fought to the last while the roman empire went fiddling into ruin far away down the line a masthead lamp flickered a message out of the darkness the fleet was resting like a tired giant but the pinpoint of light and another that answered it on the instant a mile away showed that its sleep was light but the end is not yet concluded the speaker no replied his companion he made a little gesture with his pipe stem embracing the silent battle array stretching away into the night not yet end of chapter eight chapter nine of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine a tithe of admiralty it was the hour preceding dinner and a small boy in the uniform of a naval cadet stood on the balcony of an hotel at dartmouth earlier in the day a tremendous self-importance had possessed his soul it was begotten primarily of brass buttons and a peaked cap and its outward manifestation at paddington station had influenced a short-sighted old lady in her decision that he was a railway official of vast if premature responsibilities he leaned over the balustrade and looked up harbour beyond the scattered yachts and coal hulks black against the path of the sunset lay the old britannia she was moored this cradle of a generation's naval destiny where the dart commenced to wind among green hills crowned by woods and red-brown ploughlands and as he stared the smaller vanities of the morning passed from him 
he was barely fifteen and his ideas were jumbled and immature but in a confused sort of way he thought of the thousands of other boys those wooden walls had sheltered and who at the bidding of unknown powers had gone down to the sea in ships he pictured them working their pinnaces and cutters as he would some day soaked and chilled by winter gales others departed for the mediterranean where if the testimony of an aunt who had once spent a winter at malta was to be accepted life was all picnics and dances he saw them yet farther afield chasing slavers patrolling pirate infested creeks fighting through jungle and swamp lying stark beneath desert stars and ever fresh ones came to fill the vacant places bred for the work even as he was to be on the placid waters of the dart amid devon combs it was all a little vainglorious perhaps and if his imagination was coloured by the periodicals and literature of boyhood who is to blame him why it was necessary for these things to be he understood vaguely if at all but in some dim way he realised it was part of his new heritage a sort of brotherhood of self-immolation and hardship into which he was going to be initiated his thoughts went back along the path of the last few years that had followed his father's death with a tightening of the heart-strings he saw how an empire demands other sacrifices how in order that men might die to martial music must sometimes come first an even greater heroism of self-denial years of thrift and contrivance new clothes forsworn a thousand renunciations this had been his mother's part that her son might in time bear his share of the empire's burden she came out on to the balcony as the sun dipped behind the hills and the woods were turning sombre and slipped a thin arm inside his it is rarely given to men to live worthy of the mothers that bore them a few a very few are permitted to die worthy of them perhaps it was some dim foreknowledge of the end that thrilled him as he drew her closer they had dinner and with it because it was a great occasion a bottle of sparkling cider drunk out of wine glasses to the inscrutable future another boy was dining with his parents at a distant table and at intervals throughout the meal the embryo admirals glanced at one another with furtive interest after dinner the mother and son sat on the balcony watching the lights of the yachts twinkling across the water and talked in low voices scarcely raised above the sound of the waves lapping along the quay at times their heads were very close together and since in the star-powdered darkness there were none to see their hands met and clung she accompanied him on board the following day to be led by a grey-faced petty officer along spotless decks that smelt of tar and rosin she saw the chest deck where servants were slinging hammocks above the black and white painted chests the chest deck with its wide casement ports and rows of enamelled basins and everywhere that smell of hemp and scrubbed woodwork number thirty two you are sir said the petty officer and as he spoke she knew the time had come when her boy was no longer hers alone they bade farewell by the gangway under the indifferent eyes of a sentry and number thirty two watched the frail figure in the waterman's boat till it was out of sight then he turned with a desperate longing for privacy anywhere where he could go and blubber like a kid but from that time onwards with the rare exceptions of leave at home he was never to know privacy again two the old britannia training consisted of four terms each of three months duration during which a boy fresh from the hands of a tutor or crammer had many things to learn he was taught to drop everything and nip when called how when and whom to salute to pull an oar and sail a boat to not splice and run aloft how to use a sextant he learned that trigonometry and algebra were not really meaningless mental gymnastics but a purposeful science that guided men upon trackless seas 
in short at an age when other schoolboys see their education nearing its end he had to begin all over again to be moulded afresh for a higher purpose the path of the new in those days was by no means strewn with roses jerry had to submit to strange indignities and stranger torments at the hands of olympian niners fourth term cadets he had to accustom himself to bathe dress and undress to sleep and to pray surrounded by a hundred others there was also the business of the hammock in and out of which he was learning to turn without dishonour but the conclusion of the first breathless three months found him amazingly fit and happy his mind was stored with newly acquired and vastly interesting knowledge the beagles and football sweated the callow suet off him and gave him the endurance of a lean hound he was fitting into the new life as a hand into a well-worn glove the end of his second term brought the coveted triangular badge on the right cuff that marks the cadet captain among his fellows the duties which are much the same as those of monitor or prefect offered him his first introduction to the peculiar essence we call tact necessary in dealing with contemporaries about this time began his friendship with jubbs this young gentleman's real name was as unlike his sobriquet as anything could be among a community of naval cadets this was perhaps a sufficient raison d'etre anyhow none other was ever forthcoming they earned their rugger colours together as a scrum and stand-off halves and as time went on a slow friendship matured and knit between them their first sight of each other had been in the hotel the evening before joining thenceforward it pleased the power that is called destiny to run the brief threads of their lives together to the end at the close of their third term they became chief cadet captains and jubbs papa a long lean baronet with a beak-like nose came down to attend the prize-giving at the conclusion of the ceremony he was piloted to the canteen where the cadet captains were pleased to stodge at his expense while he as one who sits at meat among the gods trumpeted his satisfaction into a flaring bandana handkerchief at the end of the fourth and last term jerry's mother came down to see the last prize-giving and thus was present when her son received the king's medal for one never to be forgotten moment she watched him turn from the dais and come towards her erect and rather pale with compressed lips but the cheering broke from the throats of three hundred inveterate hero worshippers like a tempest and then a mist hid him from her sight three a p and o liner a few months later carried jerry and jubbs to china during the voyage they came in contact with a hitherto unrecognized factor in life and found themselves faced with unforeseen perplexities one evening as they leaned over the rail experimenting gingerly with two cigars jubbs unburdened himself besides they jaw such an awful rot was his final summary of feminine allurements jerry nodded tranquil-eyed i know i told mrs what's-her-name that woman with the earrings that i got one mother already and as i'm going to china and she's going to india i didn't see the use of being tremendous friends sides she's as old as the hills jerry jerry the lady in question was barely thirty even if she had an unaccountable partiality for taking him into the bows to watch the moon rise over the indian ocean they joined their ship at hong kong and found themselves members of a crowded cockroach haunted gunroom where every one was on the best of terms with every one else and there reigned a communism undreamed of in their philosophy it is said that in those days of stress and novelty among unknown faces and unfamiliar surroundings their friendship bound them in ever closer ties the sub-lieutenant when occasion arose for the chastisement of one thrashed the other out of sheer pity they kept watch took in signal exercise went ashore shot snipe picnicked and went through their multifarious duties generally within hail of one another till at length jerry's call of jubbs and jubbs unfailing coming 
brought half wistful smiles to older eyes the boxer rising broke out like a sudden flame and their letters home those voluminous and ill-spelt missives that meant so much to the recipients announced the momentous tidings jerry was landing in charge of a maxim gun jubbs was to be aide-de-camp to the commander their whites were being dyed a warlike tint of khaki and they were being sent up to take part in the defence of tientien for a while silence then at last a letter scrawled in pencil on some provision wrappers jerry boasted a three weeks growth of stubble and had killed several peculiarly ferocious boxer bravos they were looking forward to being moved up to peking for the relief of the legations and there was practically no danger as long as a fellow took reasonable precautions he had not seen jubbs for some time but expected to meet him before long as a matter of fact they came together the next afternoon and their meeting-place was a joss house that had been converted into a temporary field hospital jerry was the first to arrive in the bite of a canvas trough jerry very white and quiet a purple-brown stain spreading over his dusty tunic and a bullet lodged somewhere near the base of the spine toward sunset he became conscious and the red cross nursing sister supported his head while he drank tepid water from a tin mug sparkling cider he whispered weakly for luck thank you mummy darling the firing outside was becoming intermittent and gradually growing more distant when the patch of dusty sunlight in the doorway was darkened by a fresh arrival the stretcher party laid him on the bed next to jerry and departed the surgeon made a brief examination and as he straightened up met the pitying eyes of the red cross sister he shook his head the poor children she whispered outside there came a sudden renewal of firing and the spiteful stammer of a maxim it died away and there was silence broken by the buzzing of flies in the doorway and the sound of someone fighting for his breath in the heavy air the sickly smell of iodoform mingled with the odors of departed joss sticks and sun-baked earth suddenly from a bed in the shadows a weak voice spoke jubbs said jerry a moment's pause while the motionless figure in the next bed gathered energy for a last effort of speech then coming said jubbs end of chapter nine chapter ten of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the chosen four the admiral it was rumoured had said let there be signal midshipmen wherefore the flag lieutenant communed with the commander who sent for the senior midshipman the senior midshipman responded to the summons with an alacrity that hinted at a conscience not wholly void of offence let there be signal midshipmen said the commander or words to that effect in four watches aye aye sir said the senior midshipman he emerged from the commander's cabin and breathed deeply as one who had passed unscathed through a grave crisis apparently that small matter of the picket boat's damaged stem piece had been overlooked ere he was out of earshot however the commander spoke again by the way added the arbiter of his little destinies i don't want to see your name in the leave-book again until the picket boat is repaired ay ay sir repeated the senior midshipman he descended to the gun-room where it being make and mend afternoon his brethren were wrapped in guileless slumber an inman's nautical tables lying handy on the table described a parabola through the air and striking a prominent portion of the nearest sleeper's anatomy ricocheted into his neighbour's face the two sat up glowered suspiciously at each other for an instant and joined battle the shock of their conflict overturned a form and two more recumbent figures awoke wrathfully to life and power and thought 
you four announced the senior midshipman calmly when the uproar had subsided will take on signal duty from to-morrow morning then having satisfactorily discharged the duty imposed upon him he settled himself to slumber on the settee three of the four to whom this announcement was made gasped and were silent signals under the very eye of the admiral each one saw himself an embryo flag lieutenant one even made a little prophetic motion with his left arm as though irked by the aiguillette that in fancy already encircled it the fourth alone spoke crikey he muttered and my only decent pair of breeches are in the scram bag note the scram bag is the receptacle for articles of clothing and so forth left lying about at first lieutenant's rounds in the morning gear thus impounded can be redeemed once a week by payment of a bar of soap End note. men say that with the passing of masts and yards the romance of the naval service died this is for those to judge who have seen a fleet of modern battleships flung plunging from one complex formation to another at the dip of a wisp of coloured bunting and have watched the stutter of a speck of light as unseen ships talk across leagues of darkness the fascination of a game only partly understood yet ever hinting vast possibilities seized upon the minds of the chosen four morse and semaphore of course they knew and the crude translations of the flags were also familiar enough but the inner mysteries of the science and in these days it is a very science had not as yet unfolded themselves at intervals the flag lieutenant would summon them to his cabin where with the aid of the signal books and little oblong pieces of brass he demonstrated the working of a fleet from the signal point of view and how a mistake in the position of a flag in the hoist might result in chaos and worse the chosen four sat wide-eyed at his feet amid cigarette ash and the shattered fragments of the third commandment harbour watch-keeping perfected their semaphore and morse till by ceaseless practice they could read general signals flashed at a speed that to the untrained eye is merely a bewildering flicker as time wore on they began to acquire the almost uncanny powers of observation common to the lynx-eyed men around them on the bridge each ship in a fleet is addressed by hoisting that flag's numeral pendants the ship thus addressed hoists an answering pendant in reply at intervals all through the day the signal yeoman of the watch would suddenly snap his glass to his eye pause an instant as the wind unfurled a distant flutter of bunting at some ship's yardum and then jump for the halyard that hoisted the answering pendant the smartness of a ship's signal bridge is the smartness of that ship and in consequence this is a game into which the stimulus of competition enters signal boatswain midshipman and yeoman vying with each other to be the first to give the shout up answer one night at the junior officers club one of the chosen four encountered another of his ilk from a different ship and since at eighteen if you are ever to become anything shop is a right and necessary topic of conversation they fell to discussing their respective bridges presently said he of the other ship waxing pot valiant by reason of marsala i'll bet you a dinner ashore we'll show your pendants before the week's up now should a ship fail to see a signal made to her other ships present can be very offensive by hoisting the pennants of the ship addressed at masthead and yardarms this is to hold the delinquent up as an object of scorn and derision to the fleet and is a fate more dreaded by right-minded signalmen than the plagues of egypt and i'll give you fifteen seconds grace added the speaker the challenge was accepted and for five sweltering days it was summer at malta the two ships watched each other from sunrise till dark the pendants bent to the halyards in readiness on the evening of the sixth day a thunderstorm that had been brewing all the afternoon burst in a torrential downpour over the harbour 
at that instant a signal crept to the flagship's yardum on board the ship addressed the midshipman had dashed for the shelter of the bridge house the yeoman was struggling into an oilskin and the second hand had stepped into the lee of a searchlight stand by thirteen fourteen counted the small figure standing in the driving rain on the flagship's bridge watch in hand fifteen hoist then for the first time in his short career he deserted his post clattering pell-mell down the ladders to the gunroom where the remainder of the chosen four were playing cutthroat whist he flung back the drab-coloured curtain got him he shouted triumphantly by the aching stomach i had him cold i have said that of the chosen four three saw visions while the other bewailed the inaccessibility till the end of the week of his best trousers now of the four he alone came to wear the aiguillettes of a flag lieutenant and to-day the mysteries of tactics fleet organization and formation are to him as an open book a baker street photographer once had the temerity to display his photograph in the window in uniform tinted passing by i heard a woman gush foolishly to her companion oh isn't he a darling the relevancy of this anon another forsook the bunting draped path of signals to climb to fame through the smoke of many battle practices he now adds after his rank the cryptic initial g the third married an heiress and her relations and retired he has several children and is reported to have lost interest in the service the remaining one when i saw him last had also lost interest in the service he was lying in a curiously crumpled heap across the stakes of a jungle stockade his empty revolver dangling by the lanyard around his neck a handful of his men fought like demons to recover possession of the mutilated body sure said a bearded petty officer half apologetically wiping his cutlass with a tussock of grass we couldn't live him there and himself someone's darlin likely sailors are inveterate sentimentalists end of chapter ten chapter eleven of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven a committee of supply the junior watchkeeper entered the wardroom and rang the bell with an air of gloomy mystery. "'The Russians are coming,' he announced. "'Cocktail, please, waiter.' The young doctor looked up from the year-old Bradshaw with which he was wont to enliven moments of depression by arranging mythical weekends at friends' houses in various parts of England. It was a dreary amusement, and, conducted off the coast of Russian Tartary, stamped him as the possessor of no small imaginative powers. Who said so? Skipper. Three Russian destroyers, and we're to invite them to dinner, and there's nothing to eat. The junior watchkeeper managed the affairs of a mess for that quarter. Those chaps feed like fighting cocks, observed the assistant paymaster. Let's send for the messman. The junior watchkeeper applied himself to his cocktail in silence, and the celestial bandit, who, in consideration of a monthly levy of thirty dollars per head, starved or poisoned them, according to his whim, appeared in the doorway. The mess broached the subject with quailing hearts. It was proposed to dine the representatives of a foreign power. Could he for once rise to the occasion and produce a suitable repast? the oriental summed up the situation with impassive brevity no can do oh rot said the junior watchkeeper who up to this juncture had been gracefully pursuing the olive at the bottom of his glass with the tip of his tongue pull your socks up ah chee and think o' something the messman brooded darkly suppose you go ashore side catchy salmon catchy snipe flaps can do by jove yes said the a p rising and walking to the scuttle we never thought of that but it's a god-forsaken place look at it the ship was anchored in a little bay off the mouth of a shallow river on one side the ground rose abruptly to a bleak promontory and on the other stretched a waste of sand dunes 
inland not a tree or vestige of human habitation broke the dreary expanse of plain which was covered with stunted bushes and rolled away to a range of low hills in the distance all very fine to talk about salmon said the young doctor but there isn't a rod in the ship and no one could use it if there was make one suggested the junior watchkeeper with cheerful resource begotten of cocktails but flies a rod's no good without flies and things i'll make a spinner they won't take a fly in these parts a fellow told me at shanghai thighs we can't chuck a fly the carpenter was summoned to the conclave and the result of his labours was a formidable spar resembling more closely a hop pole than a salmon rod some fourteen feet in length why not take the lower boom and have done with it inquired the young doctor who had abandoned bradshaw in favour of his gun case and was dabbling with awful joy in oil and cotton waste the junior watchkeeper vouched no reply his was the spirit of the complete angler and armed with a nippers and clasp knife he wrestled grimly with the lid of a tobacco tin half an hour's toil conducted in profane silence resulted in a triangular object which embellished with red bunting and bristling with hooks he passed round for the startled consideration of the mess well admitted the young doctor with the air of one generously conceding a debatable point you might catch the bottom with a certain amount of luck but a well-flung cushion cut short further criticism and the committee of supplies adjourned the rising sun next morning beheld three depressed-looking figures disembarking on the sandy beach the junior watchkeeper had fashioned a wondrous reel out of pieces of a cigar box and the boatswain had provided about thirty fathoms of mackerel line and some thin wire the a p essayed a joke about using the rod as a flagstaff to commemorate their landing but it lacked savour as indeed jests do in the pale light of dawn wreaths of mist hung over the river swirling between sandy banks leaden-grey and noiseless a few gulls wheeled overhead protesting at the invasion with dismal cries and the waves broke whispering along the beach in an arc of foam the three adventurers gazed despondently at the sand dunes the receding stern of the boat and finally each other's sleepy unshaven faces the young doctor broke suddenly into a feeble cackle of laughter an unfamiliar chord of memory vibrated and with it came a vision of a certain coffee stall outside charing cross station and the junior watchkeeper's wan face surmounted by a battered opera hat jove he muttered reminds me covent garden ball the a p had toiled to the top of an adjacent mound from which like moses of old he surveyed the landscape o'er come on he shouted valiantly well said the junior watchkeeper vive le sport if there were no fools there'd be no fun he shouldered his strange impedimenta and joined the a p away to their left a glint of water showed intermittently as the river wound between clumps of low bushes and hillocks patches of level ground covered with reeds and coarse grass fought with the sand dunes and stretched away in dreary perspective to the hills briefly they arranged their plan of campaign the junior watchkeeper was to fish upstream the other two meeting with him about five miles inland in a couple of hours time they separated and the junior watchkeeper dipped behind a rise and was lost to view it is not recorded what exactly the snipe were doing that day the young doctor had it that they were taking a day off the a p s that they had struck the wrong part of the country but the melancholy fact remained that two hours later they sat down to share their sandwiches with empty bags and clean barrels a faint shout from out of the distance started them again into activity he's fallen in suggested the young doctor with cheerful promptitude sat on the hook more likely there was grim relish in the a p s tone neither was prepared for the spectacle that met their astonished eyes when they reached the river standing on a partly submerged sandbank in the middle of the stream dripping wet and full of strange oaths was the junior watchkeeper 
the point of his rod was agitated like the staff of a morse signaller's flag while a smother of foam and occasional glimpses of a silver belly twenty yards upstream testified that the age of miracles had not yet passed play him you fool yelled the a p can't wailed the junior watchkeeper battling with the rod the reel's jammed look out then shouted the young doctor and the safety catch of his gun snapped let me have a shot but the junior watchkeeper had abandoned his rod seizing the stout line in his fingers his feet braced in the yielding sand shamelessly he hauled the lordly fish fighting to his feet come on he spluttered bear a hand you blokes the blokes rushed into the shallows and together they floundered amid a tangle of line and showers of spray grabbing for its gills eventually it was flung ashore and the coup de gras administered with the butt end of the a p s gun thirty pounds if it's an ounce gasped the junior watchkeeper wringing the water out of his trousers they stood and surveyed it in amazed silence struck dumb with the wonder of the thing contrasted with the salmon as they knew it decorated with sprigs of fennel on a fishmonger's slab it looked an uncouth creature with an underhung jaw and a curiously arched back the a p prodded it suspiciously with the toe of his boot s'pose it's all right eh clean run and all the rest of it course it is replied the junior watchkeeper indignantly he knew no more about its condition than the other two but his was the pride of capture he relieved the tedium of the return journey with tales of wondrous salmon that lurked in pools beneath the bank unmoved they listened to outrageous yarns of still larger salmon that swam in open-mouthed pursuit of the homemade spinner jostling each other by reason of their numbers the junior watchkeeper had set out that morning an honourable man who had never angled for anything larger than a stickleback in his life he returned at noon hugging a thirty-pound salmon his mouth speaking vanity and lies and i nearly shot the damn thing sighed the young doctor at the close of the recital what did you shoot by the way asked the junior watchkeeper loftily nothing was the curt reply and his cup of happiness ran over the principal guest of the evening eyed a generous helping of salmon that was placed in front of him and turned to his neighbour pardon me he said courteously but does this fish happen to have been caught in any of the local rivers all eyes turned to the junior watchkeeper who prevented by a mouthful from replying sat breathing heavily through his nose because if it was went on the russian i think i ought to warn you at the risk of giving you offence that local salmon are poisonous that is unfit for human consumption followed an awful silence the young doctor broke it how uh, interesting he observed feebly but but why the russian shook his head i don't really know and i hope you will forgive me for assuring you that they are dangerous to the health oh said the captor faintly i've eaten my whack the remainder of the dinner was not gastronomically speaking a success the mess and their guests eyed one another at intervals with furtive apprehension much as cleopatra's poisoned slaves must have awaited the appearance of each other's symptoms but it was not until some hours later that the young doctor was awakened by some one calling his name aloud he sat up in his bunk and listened and presently it was borne upon him that somewhere in the stillness of the night watches the junior watchkeeper was dreeing his weird end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: That Which Remained. Oddly enough, no record exists of the origin of his nickname. Periwinkle he had been all through Crammer and Britannia days. As senior signal midshipman of the Mediterranean flagship, he was still the Periwinkle small for his years skinny as a weasel with straight black hair and grey eyes set wide apart in a brown face 
the eyelashes black and short grew very close together which gave him the perpetual appearance of having recently cold ship and neglected to clean the dust from his eyes the signal midshipmen of a fleet especially the mediterranean fleet in those days were essentially keen on their job the nature of the work and intership rivalry provided for that but with the periwinkle signals were more than a mere job they formed his creed and recreation the flag lockers were tarpaulin covered shrines the semaphores spoke oracles by day as did the flashing lamps by night and the high priest of these mysteries was the flag lieutenant a rugby international and right good fellow withal but to the periwinkle a very god who walked among men to understand something of his hero worship you would need to have been on the bridge when the fleet put out to sea for tactics it was sufficient for the periwinkle to watch this immaculate imperturbable being snap out a string of signals apparently from memory as he so often did while hoist after hoist of flags leaped from the lockers and sped skywards and the bridge was a whirl of bunting even the admiral who spoke so little and saw so much was in danger of becoming a mere puppet in the boy's sight but there was more than this to encourage his ardour the flag lieutenant recognising the material of a signalman of unusual promise would invite the periwinkle to his cabin after dinner and unfold with the aid of printed diagrams and little brass oblongs representing ships the tactical and strategical mysteries of his craft there was one unforgettable evening too when the periwinkle was bidden to dinner ashore at the malta club the dinner was followed by a dance whereat in further token of esteem the flag lieutenant introduced him to a lady of surpassing loveliness the fairest the periwinkle was given to understand of all the pippins the spring gave place to summer and the island became a glaring wilderness of sun-baked rock for obscure reasons of policy the fleet remained at malta instead of departing on its usual cruise and week after week the sun blazed pitilessly down on the awnings of the anchored ships week by week the periwinkle grew more brown and angular and lost a little more of his wiry activity the frequent stampedes up and down ladders with signals for the admiral sent him into a lather like a nervous horse at the end of a watch his hair was wet with perspiration and his whites hung clammily on his meagre limbs after a while too he began to find the glare tell and to ease the aching of his eyes had sometimes to shift the telescope from one eye to the other in the middle of a signal as a matter of fact there was no necessity for him to read signals at all that was part of the signalman's duty and if he had chosen to be more leisurely in his ascent and descent of ladders no one would have called him to account but his zeal was aflame within him and terror lest he earned a rebuke from the flag lieutenant for lack of smartness lent wings to his tired heels it was august when the flag lieutenant sought out the fleet surgeon in the wardroom after dinner and broached the subject of the periwinkle pmo i wish you'd have a look at that shrimp he's knocking himself up in this heat he swears he's all right but he looks fit for nothing but hospital so the periwinkle was summoned to the fleet surgeon's cabin vehemently he asserted that he had never felt better in his life and the most the fatherly old irishman could extort from him was the admission that he had not been sleeping particularly well as a matter of fact he had not slept for three nights past but fear lest he should be put on the list forbade his admitting either this or the shooting pain behind his eyes which by now was almost continual the outcome of the interview however was an order to turn in forthwith next morning the periwinkle was ignominiously hoisted over the side in a cot loudly protesting at the indignity of not even being allowed to walk en route for biggie hospital as a fever patient two the news of the world is transmitted to naval stations abroad by cable and promulgated by means of wireless telegraphy to ships cruising or out of reach of visual signalling 
at malta the news is distributed to ships present in harbour by semaphore from the castile an eminence above the town of valletta commanding the grand harbour and nearly opposite the naval hospital one morning a group of convalescents were sunning themselves on the balcony of the hospital and one watching the life of the harbour through a telescope suddenly exclaimed stand by they're going to make the reuter telegram i wonder how the navy got on at lords it's hopeless trying to read it said another they make it at such a beastly rate the periwinkle fuming in bed in an adjacent ward overheard the speaker in a second he was on his feet and at the open window a tousle-haired object in striped pyjamas crinkling his eyes in the glare i can read it sir lend me the glass you ought to be in bed my son haven't you got malta fever it's very slight replied the periwinkle as indeed it was and i'm quite as warm out here as in bed may i borrow your glass he took the telescope and steadied it against a pillar the distant semaphore began waving and the group of convalescents settled down to listen but no sound came from the boy he was standing with the eyepiece held to his right eye motionless as a statue a light wind fluttered the gaudy pyjamas and their owner lowered the glass with a little frown half puzzled half irritated i it's there's something wrong he began and abruptly put the glass to his left eye ah that's better he commenced reading but in a minute or two his voice faltered and trailed off into silence he changed the glass to his right and back to his left eye then lowering it turned a white scared face to the seated group i'm afraid i can't read any more he said in a curiously dry voice i it, it hurts my eyes he returned the glass to its owner and hopped back into bed where he sat with the clothes drawn up under his chin sweating lightly after a while he closed his left eye and looked cautiously round the room the tops of objects appeared indistinctly out of a grey mist it was like looking at a partly fogged negative he closed his right eye and repeated the process with the other his field of vision was clear then except for a speck of grey fog that hung threateningly in the upper left-hand corner by dinner-time he could see nothing with the right eye and the fog had closed on half the left eye's vision at tea-time he called the sister on duty my eyes hurt frightfully thus the periwinkle striving to hedge with destiny do they sympathized the sister i'll tell the surgeon when he comes round to-night and he'll give you something for them i shouldn't read for the present if i were you the periwinkle smiled grimly as if she had made a joke and lay back every nerve in his body strung to breaking point can't see eh huh? the visiting surgeon who leaned over his bed a few hours later looked at him from under puzzled brows can't see uh, do you mean he picked up an illustrated paper holding it about a yard away and pointed to a word in block type what's this word the periwinkle stared past him with a face like flint i can't see the paper i can't see you or the room or or anything i i'm blind his voice trembled to the terror by night that followed was added the physical pain past anything he had experienced or imagined in his short life it almost amazed him that anything could hurt so much and not rob him of consciousness the next room held a sufferer who raved in delirium cursing praying and shrieking alternately the tortured voice rose in the stillness of the night to a howl and the periwinkle set his teeth grimly he was not alone in torment but his was still the power to meet it like a man by the end of a week the pain had left him at intervals during this period he was guided to a dark room for the matter of that all rooms were dark to him and unseen beings bandied strange technicalities about his ears optic neuritis retrobulbar atrophy the words meant nothing to the boy and their meaning mattered less for nothing they told him could give him back his sight after that they left him alone to wait with what patience he might until the next p and o steamer passed through his first visitor was the chaplain the most well-meaning of men whose voice quavered with pity 
as he spoke at some length of resignation and the beauty of cheerfulness in affliction on his departure the periwinkle caught the rustle of the sister's dress sister said the boy will you please go away for a few minutes i'm afraid i have to swear out loud but you mustn't she expostulated slightly taken aback it's it's very wicked can't help that replied the periwinkle austerely please go at once i'm going to begin scandalized and offended as well she might be she left the periwinkle to his godless self and he swore loudly satisfying unintelligible senseless lower deck ease but when she brought him his tea an hour later she found he had the grace to look ashamed of himself and forgave him they subsequently became great friends and at the periwinkle's dictation she wrote long cheerful letters that began my dear mother and generally ended in suspicious-looking smudges every one visited the periwinkle his brethren from the fleet arrived bearing as gifts strange and awful delicacies that usually had to be confiscated sympathizing with the queer clumsy tenderness of boyhood the flag lieutenant came often always cheerful and optimistic forbearing to voice a word of pity for this the periwinkle was inexpressibly grateful he even brought the fairest of all the pippins but the boy shrank a little from the tell-tale tremor she could never quite keep out of her voice her parting gift was an armful of roses and on leaving she bent over till he could smell the faint scent of her hair good-bye she whispered go on being brave and to his wrathful astonishment kissed him lightly on the mouth there was the admiral's wife too childless herself who from long dealings with men had acquired a brusque almost masculine manner as soon as he had satisfied himself that she evinced no outward desire to slobber the periwinkle admitted her to his friendship he subsequently confessed to the sister that for a woman she read aloud extremely well well i must be going she said one day at parting i'll bring john up to see you to-morrow when she had gone the periwinkle smote his pillow john he gasped john was the admiral even the crew of his cutter just the ordinary rapscallion duty crew of the boat he had commanded trudged up one sweltering sunday afternoon and were ushered with creaking boots and moist shiny faces into his ward bein as we had an afternoon orf sir began the spokesman who was also the coxswain of the boat but at the sight of the wavering sightless eyes although prompted by nudges and husky whispers he forgot his carefully prepared sentences we reckoned we'd come and give you a chuck-up like sir concluded another and instead of the elaborate speech they had deemed the occasion demanded they told him of their victory in a three-mile race over a rival cutter how afterwards they had generously fraternized with the vanquished crew so generously that the port stroke him as we called nobby clark sir if you remembers was at that moment languishing in a cell as a result of the lavish hospitality that had prevailed finally the periwinkle extended a thin hand to the darkness to be gripped in turn by fourteen leathery fists ere their owners tiptoed out of the room and out of his life three the periwinkle found blindness an easier matter to bear in the ward of a hospital than on board the p and o liner by which he was invalided home a naval sick berth steward attended to his wants helped him to dress and looked after him generally but every familiar smell and sound of ship life awoke poignant memories of the ship life of former days and filled him with bitter woe he was morbidly sensitive of his blindness too and for days moped in his cabin alone fiercely repelling any attempt at sympathy or companionship then by degrees the ship's doctor coaxed him up into a deck-chair and sat beside him warding off intruders and telling stories with the inimitable drollery that is the heritage of the surgeons of p and o liners and at night when the decks were clear and every throb of the propellers was a reminder of the home they were drawing near to he would link his arm loosely within the boys and together they would walk to and fro during these promenades he invariably treated the periwinkle as a man of advanced years and experience 
whereby was no little balm in gilead many people tried to make a fuss of the boy with the sullen mouth whose cheekbones looked as if they were coming through the skin and who had such a sad story wealthy globe-trotters anglo-indians missionaries and ladies of singular charm and beauty all strove according to their lights to comfort him but by degrees they realized he never wanted to play cat's cradle or even discuss his mother and so left him in peace but the boy had a friend beside the doctor a grizzled major from an indian frontier regiment returning home on furlough with a v c tacked on to his unpretentious name at first the periwinkle rather shrank from a fresh acquaintance it is a terrible thing to have to shake hands with an unknown voice but he was an incorrigible little hero worshipper and this man with the deep steady voice had done and seen wonderful things further he didn't mind talking about them to the periwinkle so that the boy as he sat clasping his ankles and staring out to sea with sightless eyes was told stories which a week later the newspaper reporters of the kingdom desired to hear in vain he was a philosopher too this bronzed grey-haired warrior with the sun-puckered eyes teaching how if you only take the trouble to look for it a golden thread of humour runs through all the sombre warp and woof of life and of hope which outwears the accidents of life and reaches with tremulous hand beyond the grave and death this is the nicest sort of philosophy but for all that it was a weary voyage and the periwinkle was a brown-faced ghost all knees and elbows and angularities by the time tilbury was reached the first to board the ship was a lady pale and sweetly dignified whom the doctor met at the gangway and piloted to the periwinkle's cabin he opened the door before he turned and fled and so heard in her greeting of the periwinkle the infinite love and compassion that can thrill a woman's voice in a corner of the railway carriage that carried them home the periwinkle that maimed and battered knight still clung to the haft of his broken sword i meant to do so jolly well oh mother i meant you to be so jolly proud of me the flag lieutenant said i might have been if only it had been an arm or a leg deaf or dumb but there's nothing left in all the world it is empty nothing remains she waited till the storm of self-pity and rebellion passed leaving him biting his fingers and breathing hard then little by little with mysterious tenderness she drew out the iron that had entered the boy's soul and at the last he turned to her with a little fluttering sigh as a very tired child abandons a puzzle she bent her head low this remains she whispered End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen the tizzy snatcher in the beginning he was an assistant clerk which is a very small potato indeed his attainments in this lowly rank were limited to an extensive and intimate knowledge of the various flavours of gum employed in the composition of envelopes passing straight from a private school he began life in the gun-room of a sea-going ship and was afraid with a great amazement the new conditions amid which in future he was to have his being unfolded themselves in a succession of crude disillusionments he found himself surrounded by midshipmen contemporaries but as they took care to remind him men in authority beings with vast dimly conceived responsibilities barbarous in their manners incomprehensive of speech to the pain of countless indignities was added the fear of personal chastisement had he not read of such things and having been delicately nurtured it was to be feared that the days of his earlier service were not without unhappiness with the experience of a commission abroad however things began to assume their proper perspective he became a clerk r n and blossomed into the dignity of a frock coat and sword on sunday morning divisions whereby was no small balm in gilead 
your midshipman differs but little in point of thoughtless cruelty from his brethren of quad and school bench but the messmates who obedient to the boyish dictates of inhumanity and for the good of his immortal soul had chaffed and snubbed him into maturity now appreciated him for the even temper and dry sense of humour he acquired in the process having mastered the queer sea oaths and jargon of a gunroom he learned to handle an oar and sail a boat without discredit the sub took him on deck in the dog watches and punched into him the rudiments of the art of self-defence and lastly under the tutorship of a kindly paymaster he came to understand dimly the inner workings of that vast and complex organization that has its seat in whitehall by whose mouths speak the lords of admiralty his twenty-first birthday confronted him with the ordeal of an examination which successfully passed entitled him to a commission in his majesty's fleet with the rank of assistant paymaster for the next four years he continued to live in the gunroom where by reason of an alleged unholy intimacy with the king's regulations and admiralty instructions his advice was commonly sought on questions pertaining to the service his mode of speech had become precise as befitted a wielder of the pen in life's battle and one versed in the mysteries of naval correspondence the ship's office was his kingdom where he was lord of the ledgers with a lack of tan on face and hands that told of a sedentary life in confined spaces not infrequently he wore glasses some day he will become a paymaster warden of the money chest and answerable for the pay victualling and clothing of every man on board the years will bring three gold rings to his cuff a fleet paymaster's grey hairs and a nice perception between the digestible and otherwise in matters of diet the a p leaned back in his chair and threw down his pen in the glare of the electric light his face looked white and tired beside him the chief writer sat totalling a column of figures on deck a bell struck midnight what do you make it asked the a p wearily the writer named a sum penny out replied the a p laconically picking up his pen again outside the office door where the hammocks of the guard were slung a marine muttered in his sleep the two great ledgers that lay open on the desk contained the names of every man on board they were duplicates worked independently and by a comparison of the two mistakes could be detected and rectified opposite the names were noted the credits of pay and allowances adjusted for different charges the period born and all particulars affecting the victualling of each man ah the missing penny had been found it's in the account of that confounded ordinary seaman who broke his leave and got seven days cells said the a p number two fifteen he gave a sigh of relief and closed the ledger perhaps he experienced something of the satisfaction an author might feel on writing the magic word finis it was his creation every word and figure of it working as irrevocably as destiny towards its appointed end and on the morrow eight hundred men would file past the pay tables and in less than twenty minutes have received in coin or postal orders the balance of pay due to them i'm going to turn in now said the a p we'll coin to-morrow now the coins on a paymaster's charge are of certain denominations usually sovereigns half sovereigns florins shillings and sixpenny bits each man is paid as a rule to the nearest shilling and the odd pence if any are carried forward to the succeeding quarter thus the pay due to a man is say three pounds nineteen shillings four pence he receives three sovereigns a half sovereign four florins and a shilling the four pence are brought on to the next ledger a paymaster is thus enabled to foretell with some degree of accuracy the number of coins that he must demand from time to time having coined the total amount to be paid out in wages and ascertained the number of coins of each denomination required the pay trays were laid on the desk in the office each tray was made up of compartments large enough to hold a man's pay the paymaster divested himself of his coat 
lit a pipe and arranged side by side the two bags containing sovereigns and half sovereigns the a p similarly disposed of the florins and shillings so that he could reach them easily they contained the exact total amount required for the payment in the requisite coins ready sir he asked right said the paymaster the chief writer read out the amount due to the first man quick as a flash the amount had clinked into the first division of the tray both officers making mental calculations as to the coins required for the next half hour the only sounds in the office were the voice of the chief writer and the tinkle of the coins as each one was slipped into its compartment in an incredibly short time the piles of gold and silver had melted away as a tray was filled it was placed in a box and locked up in readiness for the payment the three faces grew anxious as the piles dwindled and the number of empty compartments lessened the last total was reached the paymaster threw down two sovereigns the a p added a florin and a shilling the bags were empty would it pan out two pounds three read out the chief writer craning his neck to see the result thank the lord murmured the a p on the quarter-deck facing aft the ship's company were mustered seamen stokers artisans cooks and police one after another as their names were called by the a p stepped briskly up to the pay-table where the captain and the commander stood scooped their wages into their caps and hurried away the marines followed receiving their pay in their hands with a click of the heels and a swinging salute at the break of the forecastle an ordinary seaman stood regarding a few silver coins in his grimy palm having broken his leave during the month and been awarded cells in consequence he had received considerably less pay than usual a penalty he had not foreseen and did not understand bloomin tizzy snatcher he muttered slipping the coins into his trousers pocket he referred to the a p End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen c slash o g p o the bell above the door of the village post office tinkled and the postmistress looked up over her spectacles is it yourself biddy a barefooted country girl with a shawl over her head entered and shyly tendered an envelope across the counter can you tell me how much it will be mrs malone she queried there was anxiety in the dark blue eyes the postmistress glanced at the address sure it'll go for a penny she said reassuringly that's a terrible long way for a penny said the girl sure it's a terrible long way from under her shawl she produced a coin and stamped the envelope it took some time to do this because a good deal depended on the exact angle at which the stamp was affixed in itself it carried a message to the recipient it's grand writin ye got said the postmistress her celtic sympathy aroused and himself will be holdin it in his hands a month from now the girl blushed father dennis is after learnin me and please for a bit of stamp paper mrs malone she pleaded softly the way no one will be after openin it and readin it in them outlandish parts it was the seal of the poor a small square of stamp paper gummed over the flap of the envelope as she was concluding this final rite the bell tinkled again a fair-haired girl in tweeds carrying a walking-stick entered with a spaniel at her heels she smiled a greeting to both women a penny stamp please mrs malone she stamped a letter she carried in her hand and turned the face of the envelope towards the postmistress how long is this going to take getting to its destination the postmistress beamed sure himself she began and recollected herself a month my lady no more outside the girl with the shawl over her head was standing before the slit of the post-box the other girl came out the next moment and the two letters started on their long journey side by side as the two women turned to go their eyes met for an instant the country girl blushed they went their way each with a little smile on her lips 
the destroyer that for three hours had been slamming through a head sea rounded the headland and came in sight of the anchored fleet the yeoman of signals on the flagship's bridge closed his glass with a snap she's got mails for the fleet he called to the leading signalman i'll report to the flag lieutenant as he descended to the quarter-deck he met the officer of the watch destroyer coming in with mail sir the lieutenant's face brightened he called an order to the boatswain's mate who ran forward piping shrilly away picket boat he bawled the flag lieutenant was reading in his cabin when the yeoman made his report snatching up his cap he hastened into the admiral's apartments destroyer arriving with mails for the fleet sir the admiral glanced at the calendar ah eight days since we had the last thank you the flag lieutenant poked his head inside the secretary's office now you fellows will have something to do the mail's coming in thank you replied the secretary's clerk but flags try not to look quite so inanely pleased about it she's probably forgotten all about you by now the destroyer with rime crusted funnels drew near and men working on the upper decks of the fleet ceased their labours to watch her approach one of the side party working over the side in a bowline jerked his paintbrush in her direction if i don't get no letter this mail so help me i stops me arf pay he confided grimly to a raggy and spat sententiously in the wardroom the married officers awoke from their afternoon siesta and began to harass the officer of the watch with inquiries the news spread even to the midshipmen's school place and the naval instructor found straight away that to all intents and purposes he was lecturing on spherical trigonometry to deaf adders with the eyes of the fleet upon her the destroyer anchored at last and the flagship's picket boat slid alongside to embark the piles of bloated mail bags as she swung round on her return journey the yeoman on the flagship's bridge glanced down at a signal boy standing beside the flag lockers and nodded two flags leaped from the lockers and sped to the masthead instantly an answering flutter of bunting appeared on each ship send boats for mail the flagship had spoken in wardroom and gunroom a rustling silence prevailed each newcomer as he entered rushed to the letter rack and hurriedly grabbed his pile of letters there is a poignant joy in seeing one's name on an envelope twelve thousand watery miles away from home no matter whose hand penned the address in some cases though it mattered a good deal the flag lieutenant retired to his cabin like a dog with a bone and became engrossed with closely written sheets that enclosed several amateur snapshots one or two portrayed a slim fair-haired girl in tweeds others a black spaniel the flag lieutenant studied them through a magnifying glass smiling the admiral busy over his private correspondence was also smiling he had been offered another group of letters to tack after his name he had five already the agent of his estate at home had a lot to say about the pheasants his wife sprawled an account of life at aix across eight pages he had been invited to the executor of one man's will and the godfather to another's child but a series of impressionist sketches by his youngest daughter age five inspired by a visit to the zoo was what he was actually smiling over up on the after bridge the yeoman of the watch leaned over the rail and whistled to the signal boy nip down to my mess and see if there's a letter for me the boy fled down the ladder and presently returned with a letter the yeoman took it from him and turned it over in his hands scanning it almost hungrily the stamp was cryptically askew and the flap of the envelope ornamented by a fragment of stamp paper and what the hell are you grinning at he began the boy turned and scampered down the ladder into safety the yeoman of signals stood looking after him the letter held in his hand when a bell rang outside the signal house he put his ear to the voice pipe the flag lieutenant was speaking yes sir make the following signal to the destroyer that brought our mails to commanding officer admiral requests the pleasure of your company to dinner to-night at eight o'clock aye aye sir he turned away from the voice pipe and he could have my tot on the top of that for the askin end of chapter fourteen
Chapter 15 of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 The Look See. South End, August 1909. A bunting draped paddle steamer, listed over with a dense crowd of trippers, thrashed her leisurely way down the lines. On the quarter-deck of one of the battleships, the midshipman of the afternoon watch rubbed the lens of his telescope with his jacket cuff, adjusted the focus against a stanchion, and prepared to make the most of this heaven-sent diversion. Over the water came a hoarse roar of cheering, and as she drew near, handkerchiefs and flags fluttered along the steamer's rail. The lieutenant of the watch, in frock-coat and sword-belt, paused beside the midshipman and raised his glass a dry smile creasing the corners of his eyes what's up with them all sir murmured the boy delightedly my aunt what a bonsai ever seen kids cheer a passing train same sort of thing but look at the girl in white she's half off her chump look at her waving her arms friend of yours sir no only hysterical the man with her is trying to make her stop the sailor laughed he's given it up now he's waving too what at he closed his glass curious isn't it the steamer passed on and a confused burr of cheering announced that she had reached the next silent warship it's all same mafic he continued presently entente banzai anything you like to call it and when we've gone they'll come to their senses and feel hot all over like a fellow who wakes up and finds his hat on the gas bracket and his boots in the water jug the midshipman nodded i saw some kids dancing round a policeman once made the bobby look rather an ass though as a matter of fact i believe he rather liked it bad for discipline though he added with the austere judgment of eighteen summers a launch bumped alongside and a stout man in the stern sheets shouted for permission to come on board do said the lieutenant gravely the stout man took a valedictory pull at a black bottle in the stern locker pocketed a handful of shrimps for future consumption and accompanied by three feminine acquaintances laboriously ascended the ladder they gazed stolidly and all uncomprehending at the sleek barbette guns the snowy planking underfoot over which flickered the shadow of the white ensign and finally wandered forward through the screen doors where they were lost to view among the throngs of sightseers the afternoon wore on every few minutes a launch or steamer swirled past gay with bunting and parasols many carried bands and in the lulls of cheering the light breeze bore the notes of martial if not strictly appropriate music across the line an able seaman paused in his occupation of burnishing the top of the after capstan and passed the back of his hand across his forehead proper dizzy ain't they he remarked in an undertone to a companion what's to tune sons of the motherland replied the other he sucked his teeth appreciatively after the manner of sailormen and added god look at them women a launch with a crimson banner bearing the name of a widely circulated halfpenny paper fussed under the stern a man in a dingy white waistcoat hailed the quarter-deck in the vernacular through a megaphone no thank you came the clear-cut reply we have to-day's papers the lieutenant hitched his glass under his arm and resumed his measured walk i'm no snob lord knows he confided to the other but it bores me stiff to be patted on the head by the halfpenny press sigh boy pick up those shrimps heads that gentleman dropped by degrees the more adventurous spirits found their way down between decks where in a short time the doorway of each officer's cabin framed a cluster of inquisitive heads in one or two cases daring sightseers had invaded the interiors and were examining with naive interest the photographs rugby caps dented cups and all the lares atque penates of a naval officer here flory cried a flushed maiden of hebraic mien obtruding her head into the flat come and look she extended a silver photograph frame phyllis dare signed and all the other sighed rapturously and examined it with round-eyed interest 
then she gazed round the tiny apartment ain't he a one look at his barb hanging on the roof the harassed sentry evicted them with difficulty better'n earl's court this is opined a stout lady who accompanied by a meek-looking husband and three children had subsided on to a midshipman's sea-chest she opened the mouth of a string-bag come on Horace, you just set down this minute and you shall have half a banana a very small midshipman approached the chest i hate disturbing you and horace he ventured but i want to go ashore and all my things are in that box you're sitting on would you mind ma shrilled a small boy indicating the modest brass plate on the lid of the chest they had vacated look he extended a small grubby forefinger he's a viscount garn snapped his father that swank that is viscounts don't go sailorin they stops ashore and grinds the faces of the poor and don't forget what i'm tellin of you the marine sentry overheard pity they don't wash em as well he observed witheringly his duties included that of servant to the midshipman in question and he resented the scepticism of a stranger who sat on the lid of his master's chest eating cold currant pudding out of a string bag on the pierhead a dense perspiring crowd surged through gates and barriers swarmed outward into all the available space and slowly congested into a packed throng of overheated overtired humanity those nearest the rails levelled cheap opera-glasses at the distant line of men-of-war stretching away into the haze each ship with her attendant steamer circling round her an excursion steamer alongside hooted deafeningly and a man in a peaked cap on her bridge raised his voice above the babble bellowing hoarse incoherencies a gaitered lieutenant clanked through the crowd four patrolmen at his heels moving as men do who are accustomed to cramped surroundings at the landing stages where the crowd surged thickest the picket boats from the fleet swung hooting alongside rocking in the swell as each went astern and checked her away the front of the excited throng of sightseers bellied outward broke and poured across the boats in a wild stampede for seats they swayed on the edge of the gunwales floundered hobnailed over enamelled casings were clutched and steadied on the heaving decks by barefooted half contemptuous men the midshipmen raised their voices in indignant protest drunk and riotous liberty men they understood one swung off at them in unfettered language of the sea or employed the butt-end of a tiller to back an ignored command on which their safety depended but here was a people that had never known discipline had scorned the necessity for it in their own unordered lives the midshipmen of the inside pinnace jerked the lanyard of the sirene savagely look at my priceless paintwork look at that's enough no more in this boat it's not safe please stand back it's oh damn a man in utter disregard of the request had picked up a child in his arms and jumped on board steadying himself by the funnel guise all right my son don't bust yourself he replied pleasantly an old woman forced her way through the crush towards the lieutenant of the patrol who with knotted brows was trying to grasp the gist of a signal handed to him by a coast guard i want to see my husband's nephew she explained breathlessly he's in thirty nine mess the lieutenant smiled gravely what ship she named the ship and stood expectant a look of confidence on her heated features as if awaiting some slate of hand trick there was something dimly prophetic in the simple faith with which she voiced her need i see well, will you excuse me a minute while i answer this signal and i'll send someone to help you find the right boat a petty officer guided her eventually to the landing-place and saw her safely embarked he returned to find his lieutenant comforting with clumsy tenderness a small and lachrymose boy who had lost his parents turning from him to receive the reproaches of a lady whose purse had been stolen the two men exchanged a little smile and the petty officer edged a little nearer arf an hour on the parade ground at whale island sir i'd like to have with some of them 
he confided behind a horny palm the jostling throng surged round him calling high heaven to witness the might of its possessions i'd make em up he murmured dreamily note whale island is the hotbed of naval discipline end note end of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen. Watch there. Watch. Dinner in the long antler-hung mess room in the naval barracks had come to an end. Here and there along the table, where the shaded lights glinted on silver loving cups and trophies, a few officers lingered in pairs over their coffee presently the band moved down from the gallery that overlooked one end of the mess and began playing in the hall this was the signal for a general move to the smoking-room where a score of figures in mess undress uniform were grouped around the fire lighting pipes and cigars and exchanging mild after-dinner chaff a few couples of dancing enthusiasts were solemnly revolving in the hall others made their way up the broad staircase to the billiard-room or settled down at the bridge-tables come on shouted a tall commander seated on the club fender in the smoking-room what about a game of skill or chance come up to the billiard-room and bring your pennies he stirred a form recumbent in an armchair with the toe of his boot what about you young feller are you going to play pool the young lieutenant shook his head not to-night sir thanks i'm going to bed early i've got the night guard trip gradually the room emptied the figure in the armchair finished the paper he was reading glanced at the clock and rose knocking the ashes out of his pipe call me at one fifteen he said to the hall porter as he passed him on his way to his room an officer immaculate in evening dress who was putting his overcoat in the hall overheard the speaker and laughed that's the spirit early to bed early to rise makes a man healthy wealthy and wise more'n you'll ever be my sprig of fashion grumbled the lieutenant and passed on the lieutenant of the night guard went cautiously down the wooden steps of the barracks pier that led to the landing-place cautiously because the tide was low and experience had taught him that the steps would be slippery with weed also the night was very dark and the lights of the steamboat alongside showed but indistinctly through the surrounding fog at the bottom of the steps one of the boat's crew was waiting with a lantern its rays lit for a moment the faces of the two men and gleamed on the steel guard of the cutlass at the bearer's hip infernal night said the lieutenant from the depth of his overcoat collar he had just turned out and there was an exceeding bitterness in his voice the lantern-bearer also had views on the night possibly stronger views but refrained from any reply perhaps he realized that none was expected the other swung himself down into the stern-sheets of the boat and as he did so the coxswain came aft blowing on his hands carry on sir please usual rounds go alongside a destroyer and any ship that doesn't hail fog's very thick got a compass there's a compass in the boat sir the coxswain moved forward again to the wheel wearing a slightly ruffled expression which owing to the darkness and the fact that there was no one to see it was rather wasted for thirty years he'd known that harbour man and boy fair or foul and his father's a waterman before him he jerked the telegraph bell twice gave a half contemptuous turn to the wheel and spat overside compass he observed to the night the boat slid away on its mission and the shore lights glimmered wan and vanished in the fog astern a clock ashore struck the hour and from all sides came the answering ship's bells some near some far all muffled by the moisture in the heavy atmosphere ding 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 half past one he who had borne the lantern deposited it in the tiny cabin aft and with a thoughtful expression removed a frayed halfpenny paper from the inside of the breast of his jumper to carry simultaneously a cutlass and a comic paper did not apparently accord with his views on the fitness of things for he carefully refolded the latter and placed it under the cushions of the locker 
then he unhooked a small megaphone from the bulkhead and came out closing the sliding door behind him finally he passed forward into the bows of the boat where he remained visible in the glare of the steaming light his arms crossed on his chest hands tucked for warmth one under each armpit peering stolidly into the blackness ahead once in midstream the fog lessened sickly patches of light waxed out of indistinctness and gleamed yellow anon as they brightened a human voice thin and lonely as a wraith's came abruptly out of the night boat ahoy the voice from nowhere sounded like an alarm it was as if the darkness were suddenly suspicious of this swiftly moving palpitating thing from across the water the figure in the bows removed his hands from his armpits picked up the megaphone and sent a reassuring bellow in the direction of the hail guard boat he answered and as he did so a vast towering shape had loomed up over them answers guard boat sir said the faint voice somewhere above their heads addressing an unseen third person a dark wall appeared surmounted by a shadowy superstructure and a giant tripod mast that was swallowed long before the eye could reach its apex in vapour and darkness the sleek flanks of guns at rest showed for an instant a sleeping super dreadnought it faded into the darkness astern then nothing but the mist again and the throb of the boat's engines another and another and yet another watchful presence loomed up out of the night hailed suspiciously and at the megaphone's answering bellow merged again into the silent darkness a figure stepped aft in the guard boat and adjusted the tarpaulin that covered the rifles lying on top of the cabin moisture had collected along the folds in little pools then the engine-room gong rang and a voice quite near hailed them a long black shadow appeared abreast and the guard boat slid alongside a destroyer at anchor the dark water between the two hulls churned into foam as the boat reversed her engines a tall figure holding a lantern leaned over the destroyer's rail night guard said the lieutenant curtly as he came forward three men climbed silently up from below and stood awaiting orders at his side the lantern shone unsteadily on their impassive faces are you the quartermaster yes sir the tall man in oilskins leaning over the destroyer's rail lowered his lantern all right i won't come inboard all correct all correct sir right put it in the log that i visited you good night good night sir the gong clanged and the guard boat slid away into the mist again the figure in the bows was relieved by a comrade and together with the remaining two vanished down the foremost hatch the faint reek of navy tobacco drifted aft to the stern sheets where the lieutenant of the night guard had resumed his position leaning against an angle of the cabin with his hands deep in the pockets of his overcoat he was reflecting on the strangeness of a profession that dragged a man from his bed at one o'clock in the morning to steam round a foggy harbour in the company of armed men these times of piping peace once a night throughout the year in every dockyard port in the kingdom a launch slid away from the depot jetty slipped in and out among the anchored ships and returned to her moorings when the patrol was completed why some grim significance surely lay in the duty in the abrupt hails that stabbed the stillness greeting the throb of her engines in the figure of the armed man in the bows with the megaphone ready to fling back the reassuring answer he shifted his position and glanced forward the bowman was chewing tobacco and every now and again turned his head to spit overside each time he did so the port bow light lit his features with a ruddy glare it was a stolid countenance slightly bored the lieutenant smiled gravely did the figure wonder why he wore a cutlass in peacetime did he realize the warning it embodied the message they conveyed night by night to the anchored ships his thoughts took a more sombre turn would the night ever come just such a night as this and under the fog a menace glide in among the blindfold fleet to the first hail of alarm answer with a lever released a silvery shadow that left a trail of bubbles on the surface and then the fog and silence riven to the dark vault of heaven he raised his head all right coxswain enough for to-night carry on back 
over went the helm the boat swung round on a new course heading whence she had come an hour before carry on back it was so easy to say his thoughts reverted to the grim picture his imagination had created how would that shadowy terror her mission fulfilled carry on back wheel wrenched over funnel spouting flame desperate men clinging to the rail as she reeled under the concussion racing blindly through the outraged night for safety thus had a warring nation written a lesson across the map of manchuria for all the world to read and if they might remember where did he come in then this figure leaning thoughtfully against the angle of the steamboat's cabin what was his mission and that of the steamboat with its armed crew night after night in fog and by starlight winter and summer a chord of memory vibrated faintly in his mind there was a phrase that summed it up learned long ago he was a cadet again in the seamanship deck of the old britannia at instruction in a now obsolete method of sounding with the deep sea lead and line they were shown how in order to obtain a sounding a number of men were stationed along the ship's side each holding a coil of the long line as the heavy lead sank and the line tautened from hand to hand each man flung his coil overboard as he did so he called to warn the next watch there watch the steamboat slowed as she passed close under the stern of a battleship the fog had lifted and the officer of the middle watch was leaning over the quarter-deck rail the lieutenant of the night guard raised his head and in the gleam of the ship's stern light the two officers recognized each other they had been in the britannia together the former laughed a greeting go back to bed you noisy blighter the cloaked figure in the boat chuckled that's where i am going he called back End of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen. Farewell and adieu. The junior watchkeeper paused at the corner of the street and smote the pavement with the ferrule of his stick. Lord, he ejaculated, to think this is the last night. Look at it all. Dusk had fallen, and with it a wet mist closed down on the town the lights from the shop windows threw out a warm orange glow that was reflected off the wet pavements and puddles in the street the shrill voice of a paper-boy hawking the evening paper dominated all other sounds for a moment evenin' Harold he called then seeing the two figures standing irresolute on the curb ran towards them evenin' Harold, sir naval appointment sir to nice naval point the lieutenant shook his head half impatiently then added as if speaking to himself no not yet it was such a familiar evening feature of life ashore in a dockyard port that hoarse yodeling cry one bought the paper and glanced through the columns over a gin and bitters at the club but this was the last night every familiar sensation and experience should be savoured in their turn ere they too went hence and were no more seen the young doctor at his elbow gave a curt laugh we shan't be very interested in the appointments to-morrow night jerry an itinerant seller of violets drifted down the pavement and thrust his fragrant merchandise upon them what shall we do first asked the junior watchkeeper let's go and have our hair cut and a shampoo i hate having my hair cut pleaded the surgeon never mind it's all part of the show you won't get another chance of talking football to a barber for years and that awful green stuff that he rubs in with a bit of sponge oh come on together they drifted up the familiar street pausing to stare into shop windows with a sudden renewal of interest that was half pathetic a jeweller's shop throwing a glittering white arc of light across the pavement arrested their progress i never realized before mused the surgeon how these fellows cater for the lovelorn naval officer look at those brooches naval crowns hat-pins made of uniform buttons bracelets with flags done in enamel d e a r e s he spelt out and broke off abruptly poof what tosh 
the other was fumbling with the door latch half a minute peter there's something i've just remembered and vanished inside muttering the young doctor caught the words some little thing and waited outside the traffic of the street a fashionable shopping street in a dockyard town at six p m streamed past him as he stood there waiting girls in furs with trim ankles carrying parcels or badminton rackets hurried along pausing every now and again to glance into an attractive shop window several tweed-clad figures shouldering golf clubs passed in the direction of the railway station one or two nodded a salutation as they recognized him little pigtailed girls with tight skirts enclosing immature figures of a class known technically as the flapper drifted by with lingering precocious stares the horns of the motors that whizzed along the muddy street sounded far and near they together with the clang and rumble of tramcars a few streets away and the voices of the paper boys dominated in turn all other sounds in the murky night air the man with the basket of violets shuffled past again and left a faint trail of fragrance lingering long after that night in the uttermost parts of the earth he remembered it and the half-caught scent of violets drifting from a perfume shop in saigon was destined to conjure up for the surgeon a vision of that glittering street with its greasy pavement and hurrying passers-by and of a pair of grey eyes that glanced back for an instant over their owner's furs the junior watchkeeper reappeared buttoning up his coat sorry to have kept you waiting peter and fell into step beside his companion half an hour later they emerged from the hairdresser's establishment clipped and anointed as to the head now breathed lieutenant where to sawdust club said the surgeon they crossed the road and turned up a narrow passageway as they quitted the street a diminutive boy with an old wizened face and an unnaturally husky voice wormed his way in under the young doctor's elbow errol sir latest sir naval the surgeon slipped a sixpenny bit into his hand and took the proffered paper still damp from the press they entered a long vault-like apartment its floor strewn with sawdust and long counters and a row of wooden stools extending down each side behind the counters rose tiers of barrels and in one corner was a sandwich buffet with innumerable neat piles of sandwiches in a glass case the place was crowded with customers a bulldog sauntered about the floor nosing among the sawdust for pieces of biscuit as the newcomers entered several of the inmates perched on their wooden stools looked round and smiled a greeting aha last night in england eh yes replied the junior watchkeeper the last night he sniffed the mingled aroma of sawdust tobacco smoke and the faint pungent smell of alcohol good old pothouse good old sawdust club dear dear curried egg sandwiches and a drop of sherry white wine what the orficers drink yes a dock glass and may the lord have mercy on us and now said the young doctor a chop and chips i think a mixed grill substituted the other kidney and sausage and tomato and all the rest of it oh yes a mixed grill they entered swing doors past a massive commissionaire who saluted with a broad smile they're askin for you inside sir he whispered jocularly to the junior watch officer wonderin when you was a comin along sailin to-morrow ain't you sir together the last nighters descended a flight of carpeted stairs and entered a subterranean electric lit lounge bar a dozen or more of naval men were standing about the fireplace and sitting in more or less graceful attitudes in big saddlebag armchairs the majority were conducting a lively badinage with a pretty fair-haired girl who leaned over the bar at one end of the room she smiled a greeting as the newcomers entered and emerged from her retreat the junior watchkeeper doffed his hat with a low bow and hung it on the stand then he bent down swung her into his arms and handed her like a doll to the young doctor who in turn deposited her on the lap of a seated officer reading the evening paper look what i found with a squeal she twisted herself to her feet and retreated behind the bar again her hands busy with the mysteries of hairpins 
hello hello greetings sounded on all sides a tall broad-shouldered figure with a brown beard elbowed his way through the crush and smote the junior watchkeeper on the breastbone dear sakes where have you sprung from i just come from the persian gulf and it's a treat to see a familiar face we're off to china again to-morrow said the other a half-suppressed note of exultation in his voice china side again do you remember the bearded one nodded wistfully do i not you lucky devils oh you lucky devils here molly the waiter sought them presently with the time-honoured formula your grill spoilin', gentlemen please and they took their places in the mirror-walled grill-room where the violins were whimpering some pizzicato melody a girl with dark eyes set a shade obliquely in a pale face seated at the grand piano looked across as they entered and smiled a faint greeting to the young doctor i think we're entitled to a voluntary from the pianist to-night said the other presently his mouth full of mixed grill what shall we ask for the other thought for a moment there's a thing i don't know what it's called it's like uh, wind in the leaves she knows he beckoned a waiter and whispered the girl with the pale face looked across the room for an instant met the eyes of the young doctor then she ran her fingers lightly over the keys and drifted in descending schwerlingsrauschen the surgeon nodded delightedly that's the thing good girl i don't know what it's called but it reminds me of things he munched cheerfully pausing anon to bury his face in a tankard of beer and they fell to discussing prospects of sport up the yangtze once or twice as she played the girl behind the piano allowed her dark eyes to travel across the crowded grill-room over the heads of the diners and her glance lingered a moment at the table where the two last nighters were seated the first violin who was also a musician sat with a rapt expression holding his fiddle across his knees when the piece was over he started abruptly so abruptly it was evident that for him a spell had been broken he looked up at the pianist with a queer puzzled expression as if half resentful of something the young doctor was arranging forks and a cruet stand in a diagram on the tablecloth there was a joss house here if you remember and the guns were there the pigeon came over that clump of bamboo the other leaning across the table nodded with absorbed interest the lieutenant glanced at his watch come along we must be moving if we're going to the palace they paid their bill tipped the waiter in a manner that appeared to threaten him with instant dislocation of the spine and walked up the tiled passage that led past the open door of the lounge from her vantage behind the bar inside the girl someone had addressed as molly caught a glimpse of their retreating figures she slipped out through the throng of customers most of whom had dined and were talking to each other over their port and liqueurs into the quiet of the corridor jerry she called mr lord ejaculated the junior watchkeeper i'd forgotten he turned quickly on his heel hello molly we're coming back presently but that reminds me he fumbled in his waistcoat pocket and the surgeon strolled slowly on up the steps round a bend and was lost to view the girl gave a little breathless laugh that's what you all say you boys and you never do come back you weren't going without saying good-bye to me were you no no molly of course i wasn't and look here old lady here's a gadget i got for you he fumbled with the tissue paper enclosing a little leather case the girl stood with one hand on the lapel of his coat twisted a button backwards and forwards jerry i i wanted to thank you 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 were a real brick to me that time it saved my life going to the sanatorium and, and i couldn't never have afforded it her careful grammar became a shade confused the man gave a little deep laugh of embarrassment rot molly that's all over and forgotten no more nasty coughs now eh huh? he patted her shoulder clumsily and mind you drop me a line when that fathom of trouble of yours comes up to the scratch and send me a bit of wedding cake here hang on to this thing no it's nothing only a little brooch good-bye old lady good-bye good luck to you and don't forget to the girl raised her pretty flushed face and gave a quick glance up and down the deserted corridor 
ain't you aren't you going to say good-bye properly jerry the junior watchkeeper bent down course and another for luck good-bye dear good-bye the young doctor was waiting with his nose flattened against the darkened window of a gunsmith's opposite when the lieutenant joined him his silence held a vague hint of disapproval as they fell into step that girl he ventured presently isn't she a bit fond of you old thing the junior watchkeeper paused to light a pipe i i don't think so peter not more than she is of a dozen others he glanced at his companion you don't think i've been up to any rotten games do you the other shook his head with quick protest but i like her awfully and she's a jolly good little sport they all are taking them all around in a naval port it's a rotten life when you think of it cooped up there in that beastly atmosphere year in year out listening to everlasting service shop or being made love to by half-tight fools their only refuge from it is in marriage if they care to take advantage of some young ass who else do they meet the marvel of it is not that a few come to grief but that so many are so jolly straight that girl to-night molly i suppose she has refused half a dozen n o s prefers to wait till some scallywag in her own class can afford to take her away out of it and i've heard her talking like a mother to a rorty midshipman a silly young ass who was drinking like a fish and wasting his money and health pub crawling she shook him to the core lord knows i don't want to idealize barmaids perhaps i'd be better man if i'd seen less of em myself but the surgeon gripped his elbow soothingly i know i know old son don't get in a stew and as for seeing less of them it's hard to say unless a man knows people ashore and is prepared to put on his superfine suitings and pay asinine calls when he might be playing golf or cricket where else is he to speak to a woman all the days of his life dances i can't dance they had turned into the main thoroughfare and the traffic that thronged the pavements and roadway made conversation difficult the liberty men from scores of ships in the port streamed to and fro some arm in arm with quietly dressed servant girls and shop girls others uproarious in the company of befeathered women at short intervals along the street a flaring gin palace or cinema theatre flung smudges of apricot-coloured light on to the greasy pavements and the faces of passers-by trams clanged past and every now and again a blue jacket or military foot patrol belted and gaitered moved with watchful eyes and measured gait along the curb as they neared the music hall the throng grew denser on all sides the west country burr filled the night softening even the half-caught oath with its broad kindly inflection men from the garrison regiments mingled with the stream of blue-clad sailors a woman hawking oranges from the curb raised her shrill voice thrusting the cheap fruit under the noses of passers-by a group of young stokers lounging round a vendor of hot chestnuts were skylarking with two brazen-voiced girls in the doorway of the music hall a few yards away a huge man in livery began to bawl into the night hoarsely incoherent the two officers mounted the steps together and as one obtained tickets from the booking office the other turned with a little smile to look down the mile-long vista of lights and roaring humanity the scintillant tram-cars came swaying up the street from the direction of the dockyard on either side the gleaming windows of the shops that still remained open the tattooists the barbers tobacconists the fried fish and faggot shops and the host of humbler tradesmen who plied most of their trade at this hour grew fainter and duller until they dwindled away to a point under the dark converging housetops a girl shouting some shameless jest broke away from the horseplay round the chestnut oven and thrust herself reeling with laughter through the passing crowd a burly marine caught her by the waist as she wriggled past and kissed her dexterously without stopping in his stride his companion smirked appreciation of the feat and glanced back over his shoulder the watcher on the steps turned and followed the other up the broad stairway 
a man with a red nose and baggy trousers was singing a song about his mother-in-law and a lodger his accents were harshly north country and out of the paint-streaked countenance his eyes pathetic brown monkey eyes roamed anxiously over the audience as if even he had little enough confidence in the humour of his song the lieutenant leaned back in his seat and refilled his pipe ain't it wonderful to think that when we come home again in three years time that chap with the baggy trousers and the red nose or his twin brother anyhow will still be singing about the same old mother-in-law presently a stout underclad woman skipped before the footlights and commenced some broadly suggestive patter the audience composed for the most part of blue jackets and tommies roared delight at each doubtful sally she ended with a song that had a catchy popular refrain and the house took it up with a great burst of song hark at em whispered the surgeon don't they love it all yet her voice is nothing short of awful her song means nothing on earth and her anatomy every line of it ought to be in the museum of the royal college of surgeons let's go and have a drink they ascended the stairway to the promenade and passed under a curtain-hung archway into a long bar the atmosphere was clouded with tobacco smoke and reeked of spirits and cheap clinging scent from a recess in one corner a gramophone blared forth a modern ragtime and a few women clasped by very callow-looking youths were swaying to a one step in the middle of the carpeted space behind the bar two tired-looking girls scurried to and fro jerking beer handles as if for a wager and mechanically repeating orders settees ran the length of the walls under rows of sporting prints and here more women with painted lips and over-bright watchful eyes were seated at little tables most of them were accompanied by young men in lounge or tweed suits phew grunted the junior watchkeeper what an atmosphere look at those young asses cumo at this time of night and we did it once peter lord it makes me feel a hundred a panting woman disengaged herself from her youthful partner and linked her arm within that of the young doctor boof she gasped i'm that aunt dearie stand us a drop o what killed auntie with a gallant bow the young doctor led her to the bar my dear madam he murmured a privilege and if you will allow me to prescribe for you as a medical man i suggest port and lemon prompted the lady she fanned herself with a sickly scented and not over clean scrap of lace ain't it aught doctor glad i left me furs at ome ain't you going to have nothing the junior watchkeeper drew a deep breath as they reached the open street thank god for fresh air again he filled and refilled his lungs and so to bed quoted the other the taverns and places of amusement were emptying their patrons into the murky street raucous laughter and farewells filled the night yes the junior watchkeeper yawned and they walked on in silence each busy with his own long thoughts by degrees the traffic lessened until nearing the dockyard the two were alone in deserted thoroughfares with no sound but the echo of their steps they were threading the maze of dimly lit cobbled streets that still lay before them when a draggle-skirted girl standing in the shelter of a doorway plucked at their sleeves they walked on almost unheeding when suddenly the young doctor hesitated and stopped the woman paused irresolute for a moment and then came towards them with the light from a gas lamp playing round her tawdry garments she murmured something in a mechanical tone and smiled terribly the young doctor emptied his pockets of the loose silver and coppers they contained and thrust the coins into her palm and with his disengaged hand he tilted her face up to the light it was a pathetically young pathetically painted face wish me good luck he said and turned abruptly to overtake his companion the woman stood staring after them her hand clenched upon her suddenly acquired riches an itinerant fried fish and potato merchant homeward bound trembled his barrow suddenly round a distant corner the girl wheeled in the direction of the sound here she called imperiously here the echo of her voice died away and the young doctor linked his arm within the others 
there is a poem by some one note john masefield end note i read the other day do you know it i must go down to the sea again to the lonely sea in the sky and all i ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by he mused for a moment in silence as they strode along i forget how it goes on something about a vagrant gypsy life and the wind like a whetted knife and all i ask is a merry yarn from a laughing fellow rover and a quiet sleep and sweet dream when the long trick's over that's how it ends i know the junior watchkeeper nodded soberly yes but it's the star we need the most peter you and i it was early in the morning and thin columns of smoke were rising from the funnels of a cruiser lying alongside one of the dockyard jetties on her decks there was a bustle of preparation steaming covers were being laced to yards and topmasts the boatswain full of strange oaths and of apoplectic countenance moved forward in the wake of a depressed part of the watch on the booms the carpenter was superintending the stowage of some bulks of timber packing cases were coming in at the gangway barefooted messengers darted to and fro there was a frequent shrilling of pipes and the hoarse voice of the boatswain's mate bellowing orders presently there came a lull and the ship's company were mustered aft as a bell began to toll then over the bared heads the familiar words of the navy prayer drifted outward into space that we may return to enjoy the fruits of our labours in the course of the next three years the words by reason of their frequent repetition would come to mean to them no more than the droning of the chaplain's voice yet that morning their significance was plain enough to the ranks of silent men a minute later with the notes of a bugle the ship boiled into activity again out on the straw-littered jetty a gradually increasing crowd had gathered it was composed for the most part of women poorly clad with pinched anxious faces some had babies in their arms others carried little newspaper parcels tucked under their shawls parting gifts for someone a thin drizzle swept in from the sea as a recovered deserter slightly intoxicated was brought down between an escort and vanished over the gangway amid sympathetic murmurs from the onlookers a telegram boy pushed his way through the crowd delivered his message of god's speed in its orange-coloured envelope and departed again whistling jauntily the men drifted out into the jetty to bid farewell with forced nonchalance and frequent expectoration each man was the centre of a little group of relatives discussing trivialities with laughter that did not ring quite true here and there a woman had broken down crying quietly but for the most part they stood dry-eyed and smiling as befitted the women of a nation that must be ever bidding vale to its sons all aboard the voices of the ship's police rose above the murmur of the crowd farewells were over a hoist of flags crept to the masthead and an answering speck of colour appeared at the signal halyards over admiralty house asking permission to proceed said some one the gangplanks rattled on to the jetty and a knot of workmen began casting off wires from the bollards stand clear shouted a warning voice the ropes slid across the tarred planking and fell with a sullen splash beneath the stern the water began to churn and boil the ship was under way at last gliding farther every minute from the watching crowd the jetty was a sea of faces and waving handkerchiefs the band on board struck up a popular tune in a few minutes she was too far off to distinguish faces on the forebridge the captain raised his cap by the peak and waved it somewhere near the turf scarped fort ashore an answering gleam of white appeared and fluttered for a moment the lines of men along the upper deck the guard paraded aft the cluster of officers on the bridge slowly faded into an indistinct blur as the mist closed around them for a while longer the band was still audible very far off and faint after a while the watchers turned and straggled slowly towards the dockyard gates End of chapter 17
Chapter 18 of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 The Seventh Day. The sub lieutenant clanked into the gunroom and surveyed the apartment critically. The junior midshipmen stationed at each scuttle fell to burnishing the brass butterfly nuts with sudden and anxious renewal of energy. Stinks of beer a bit, observed the sub, but otherwise it's all right hide that pink un under the tablecloth one of you as he spoke the notes of a bugle drifted down the hatchway there you are officers call clear out of it sharp hastily they tucked away the possible cause of offence to their captain bundled their cleaning rags into a cupboard snatched their dirks off the rack and hurried on deck on the quarter-deck the remainder of the officers were assembling in answer to the summons of the bugle frock-coated figures clanked to and fro struggling with refractory white gloves under the supervision of a bearded petty officer the quarter-deckmen were hurriedly putting the finishing touches to neatly coiled boats falls and already gleaming metalwork it was nine a m on a sunday forenoon and the ship was without stain or blemish from her gilded truck to her freshly painted waterline all the working hours of the previous day what time the citizen ashore donned pearlies or broadcloth and shut up shop the blue jacket had been burnishing and scrubbing a lick of paint here there a scrap of gold leaf or a pound of elbow grease and pervading the ship was the comfortless atmosphere of an organization normally in a high state of adjustment strained yet a point higher the commander came suddenly out of the captain's cabin and nodded to the officer of the watch sound off with the bell the buglers drawn up in line at the entrance to the battery moistened their lips in anticipation and raised their bugles the corporal of the watch stepped to the bell and jerked the clapper ding ding simultaneously the four bugles blared out and the hundreds of men forward in the waist of the ship and on the forecastle formed up into their different divisions and stood easy the divisions were ranged along both sides of the ship forecastle foretop maintop quarter-deck men on one side stokers daymen and marines on the other the rig of the day was number ones which was attended by certain obligations in the matter of polished boots carefully brushed hair and shaven faces to any one unversed in the mysteries of the sailor's garb the men appeared to be dressed merely in loose comfortably fitting blue clothes but a hundred subtleties in that apparently simple dress received the wearer's attention before he submitted himself to the lynx-eyed inspection of his divisional lieutenant that morning the sit of the blue jean collar the spotless flannel the easy play of the jumper round the hips the immaculate lines of the bell-bottomed trousers harder to fit properly than any tail-coat or riding-breeches all came in for a more critical overhaul than did ever a young girl before her first ball and the result in all its pleasing simplicity was the sailor's unconscious tribute to that one day of the seven wherein his luckier brethren ashore do no manner of work the captain stepped out of his cabin and the waiting group of officers saluted the heads of departments made their reports and then with an attendant retinue of midshipmen aides de camp messengers and buglers followed the captain down the hatchway for the rounds along the mess decks deserted save for an occasional sweeper or ship's corporal standing at attention swept the procession halting at a galley or casement as the captain paused to ask a question or pass a white-gloved hand along a beam in search of dust then aft again past gunroom and wardroom with a stoppage outside the former the captain elevated his nose i think the beer barrel must be leaking sir said the sub-lieutenant standing the rounds in the doorway see to it was the reply and the cortege swept on with swords clanking and lanterns throwing arcs of light into dark corners suspected of harbouring a hastily concealed deck-cloth or of being the pet cash for somebody's coaling suit up in the sunlight of the outer world the band was softly playing selections from the pirates of penzance the ship's goat having discovered a white kid glove dropped by the midshipman of the maintop retired with it to the shelter of the boat hoist engine for a hurried cannibalistic feast the officers of divisions had concluded the preliminary inspection and were pacing thoughtfully to and fro in front of their men 
Suddenly the captain's head appeared above the after hatchway. The lieutenant of the quarter-deck division, in the midst of receiving a whispered account of an overnight dance from his midshipman, wheeled abruptly and called his division to attention. Then, off hats! As if actuated by a single lever, each man raised his left hand, whipped off his hat, and brought it to his side. The captain acknowledged the lieutenant's salute and passed quickly down the ranks, his keen eyes travelling rapidly from each man's face to his boots. Once or twice he paused to ask a question, and then passed on to the next waiting division. Presently the bugler sounded the disperse. The divisions turned forward, stepped outward, and broke up. Here and there the midshipman of a division remained standing, scribbling hurriedly in his notebook such criticisms as it had pleased his captain to make. One man's hair had wanted cutting. It was time another had passed for leading seamen. A third had elected to attend divisions. On this the Sabbath of the Lord his God, without the knife attached to his lanyard. Half an hour later the normal aspect of the quarter-deck had changed. Rows of plank benches, resting on capstan bars supported by buckets, filled the available space on each side of the barbette. Chairs for the officers had been placed further aft, facing the men who were to occupy the benches. In front of the burnished muzzles of the two great twelve-inch guns, a lectern had been draped with a white flag, and between the guns a cello flute and violin prepared to augment the strains of a rather wheezy harmonium then the bell began to toll and a flag crept to the peak to inform the rest of the fleet that the ship was about to commence divine service the men hurried aft seamen and marines pouring in a continuous stream through the open doors from the batteries no sooner had the last man squeezed hurriedly into his place with the slightly hangdog air seamen assume in the full glare of the public eye than the master-at-arms appeared at the battery door and reported every one aft to the commander the captain took his chair facing the ship's company and a little advance of the remainder of the officers the chaplain walked up the hatchway stepped briskly to the lectern and gave out a hymn the orchestra played the opening bars five hundred men swung themselves to their feet and the service began presently the captain crossed to the lectern and read the lesson for the day it dealt with warfare and bloodshed and there was a suddenly awakened interest in the rows of intent faces opposite for this was the consummation each man present believed would ultimately come to some day's work although it might not be amid the welter and crash of shattered chariot and struggling horses nor the twang of released bowstrings and the stern level voice went on to tell of the establishment of laws wise and austere as those which regulated the reader's paths and those of his listeners while under the stern walk a flock of gulls screeched and quarrelled and the water lapped with a drowsy soothing sound against the side of the ship after a while the chaplain gave out the number of another hymn the blue jacket's most enthusiastic admirer would hesitate to describe him as a devout man but when the words and tune are familiar it may be reminiscent of happier surroundings the sailor man will sing a hymn with the fervour of inspiration and if only for the sake of the half-effaced memories it recalled the volume of bass harmony that rolled across the sunlit harbour doubtless travelled as far as the thunder of organ and chant from many a cathedral choir then standing very upright his fingers linked behind his back the chaplain commenced his sermon he spoke very simply adorning his periods with no flowery phrase or ornate quotation suiting the manner of his delivery to the least intelligent of his hearers there was no fierce denunciation no sudden gestures nor change in the grave even voice he touched on matters not commonly spoken of in pulpits and his speech was wondrous plain as indeed was meet for a congregation such as his and they were no clay under the potter's thumb composed for the most part of men indifferent to religion almost fiercely resentful of interference with their affairs living on crowded mess decks afloat fair game for every crimp and land shark ashore but there was that in the same temperate discourse that passed beyond creed or dogma and a tattooed fist suddenly clinched on its owner's hat-brim or the restless shifting of a foot told where a shaft passed home 
here and there screened by his fellows a tired man's head nodded drowsily but the padre had learned twenty years before that it took more than a sermon to keep awake a seated man who had perhaps kept the middle watch and turned out for the day at six fifteen a m in the five hundred odd pairs of eyes that remained fixed on his face he doubtless read a measure of compensation the short-cropped heads bowed as in clear tones the benediction was pronounced and remain with you always an instant's pause and then officers and men standing upright and rigid they sang the national anthem the captain turned and nodded to the commander who was putting on his cap pipe down end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen the parricide ark said the hedger his can of cold tea arrested halfway to his lips but sal the lurcher bitch curled up under the hedge had heard some seconds before with twitching nose and ears alert she jumped out of the ditch and trotted up the road a far-off sound was coming over the downs a faint drone as of a clustering swarm of bees one of them motor-bikes murmured the man and paused away in the west approaching the coast-line and flying high was a dark object like the framework of a box suspended in mid-air it drew near rising and falling on the unseen swell of the ocean of ether and the droning sound grew louder aerial plane continued the hedger again speaking aloud after the manner of those who live much alone in the open as a matter of fact it was a hydro airplane and after it had passed overhead the watchers saw it wheel and swoop towards the harbour hidden from them by the shoulder of the downs the man stood looking after it his shadow sprawling across the dusty road before him locks he ejaculated is going on a ripple from the naval manoeuvre area had passed across the placid surface of his life he resumed his interrupted tea a stone breakwater stretched a half-encircling arm round the little harbour within its shelter a huddle of coasting craft and trawlers lay at anchor with the red roofs of the town banked up as a background for their tangled spars behind them again the tall chimney of an electric power station lifted a slender head in the open water of the harbour a flotilla of submarines were moored alongside one another figures moved about the tiny railed platforms and in the stillness of the summer afternoon the harbour held only the sound of their voices the muffled clink of a hammer and from an unseen siding ashore the noise of shunting railway trucks made musical by distance the seaplane drew near and circled gracefully overhead then it volplaned down and settled lightly on the water at the harbour mouth a submarine moved from her moorings to meet it the pilot of the seaplane pulled off his gauntlets pushed his goggles up onto his forehead and lit a cigarette the submarine ranged alongside and her captain leaned over the rail with a smile of greeting any news the flying corps officer raised his hands to his mouth enemy's battleship and eight destroyers eighteen miles to the southeast he shouted steering about nor nor west at twelve knots battleships got troops or marines on board in marching order no nothing thanks i'm going north to warn them so long five minutes later he was a black speck in the sky above the headland where the tall masts of a wireless station and a cluster of whitewashed cottages showed up white against the turf the submarine slid back into the harbour and approached the senior officer's boat the senior officer in flannels was swinging indian clubs on the miniature deck of his craft the lieutenant who had communicated with the seaplane made his report his senior officer nodded and put down his clubs guessed as much they're coming to raid this place come inboard for a minute and tell forbes and lawrence and peters to come too we'll have a council of war wow wow the sun set in a great glory of light then a faint haze blue-gray like a pigeon's wing veiled the indeterminate meeting of sea and sky it crept nearer stealing along the horizon stretching leaden fingers across the smooth sea 
of fishing smack becalmed a league from the harbour mouth faded suddenly like a wraith into nothingness six destroyers came out of the mist heading towards the breakwater they were about a mile away when the leading boat altered course abruptly towards the north and the others followed close in her wake leaving a smear of smoke in the still air before their wake had ceased to trouble the surface before almost the rearmost boat had vanished into the fog the periscope of a submarine slid round the corner of the breakwater paused a moment as if in uncertainty and then headed like a swimming snake in swift pursuit another followed another and another a battleship came slowly out of the haze she moved with a certain deliberate sureness a grey majestic citadel afloat a jet of steam from an escape and the ensign at her peak showed up with startling whiteness against the sombre sea an attendant destroyer hovered on each quarter but as they neared the land these darted ahead obedient to the tangle of flags at the masthead of the battleship off the mouth of the harbour they swung round the semaphore of one signalled that the harbour was clear and they separated to commence a slow patrol north and south on the fringe of the mist a moment later the battleship anchored with a thunder and rattle of cable pipes twittered shrilly and boats began to sink from her davits into the water ladders were lowered and armed men streamed down the ship's sides they were disembarking troops for a raid there was a sudden swirl in the water at the harbour entrance unseen a slender upright stick surmounted by a little oblong disc crept along in the shadow of the breakwater indistinguishable in the floating debris awash there on the flood tide it turned seaward and sank a minute passed a cutter full of men was pulling under the stern to join the other boats waiting alongside the steel derrick raised like a huge warning finger swung slowly round lifting a steamboat out into the water from the boats afloat came the plash of oars an occasional curt order and the rattle of side-arms as the men took their places then a signalman high up on the forebridge rushed to the rail bawling hoarsely a couple of hundred yards away the dark stick had reappeared almost simultaneously two trails of bubbles sped side by side towards the flank of the battleship there was a sudden tense silence the destroyer to the northward sighted the menace and opened fire with blank on the periscope from her twelve pounders bang 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 the men in the boats alongside craned their necks to watch the path of the approaching torpedoes the commander standing at the gangway shrugged his shoulders and turned with a grim smile to the captain they've bagged us sir a dull concussion shook the after part of the ship and the pungent smell of calcium drifted up off the water on to the quarter-deck yes said the captain he stepped to the rail and stood looking down at the spluttering torpedoes with the noses of their copper collision heads telescoped flat as they rolled drunkenly under the stern the submarine thrust her conning tower above the surface and from the hatchway appeared a figure in the uniform of a lieutenant he climbed on to the platform with a pair of hand flags and commenced to signal the post captain on the quarter-deck of the battleship raised his glass made an inaudible observation and lowered it again claim to have put you out of action spelt the hand flags the captain smiled dryly and lifted his cap by the peak with a little gesture of greeting there was answering gleam of teeth in the sunburnt face of the lieutenant across the water the captain turned to his commander but he needn't have torpedoed his own father he said as if in a continuation of his last remark the penalty for marrying young i suppose the submarine recovered her torpedoes and returned to harbour her commanding officer summoned his sub-lieutenant and together they delved in a cupboard followed the explosion of a champagne cork glasses clinked and there was a gurgling silence not bad work said the sub-lieutenant bagging your old man's ship not so dusty replied the lieutenant in command of the submarine modestly she was a brand-new battleship and had cost a million and three-quarters it was his twenty-fourth birthday end of chapter nineteen
Chapter Twenty of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty: The Night Watches. Out pipes, clear up the upper deck. The boatswain's mate moved forward along the lee side of the battery, repeating the hoarse call. Slowly, the knots of tired men broke up, knocking the ashes out of their pipes or pinching their cigarette ends with horny fingers before economically tucking the remnants into their caps a part of the watch came aft sweeping down the deck coiling down ropes for the night then as the bell struck the shrill wail of the pipe rose again above the sound of the wind and waves it grew louder and shriller and died away then rising again changed to another key and ended abruptly it was the sailor's curfew pipe down on the crowded mess decks where scrubbed canvas hammocks swung with the roll of the ship above the mess tables the ship's company was turning in a struggle with a tight-fitting jumper which rolled up in company with a pair of trousers was tucked under the tiny horsehair pillow a pat to the mysterious pockets lining the cholera belt to reassure a man that his last month's pay was still intact and then with a steadying hand on the steel beam overhead one after another they swung themselves into their hammocks and fell a-snoring aft in the gun-room an extra half-hour's lights had been granted in honour of somebody's birthday and the inmates of the mess were still gathered around the piano it was a war-scarred instrument but it served its purpose albeit the hero of the evening in celebration of his advance into the sere and yellow leaf had emptied a whisky and soda into its long-suffering interior the musician his features ornamented by a burnt cork moustache thumped valiantly at the keys and then there came the boatsman's wife roared the young voices it was an old old song familiar to men who were no longer even memories with the singers and their generation but its unnumbered verses and quaint old-world jingle had survived unchanged the passing of masts and yards and were even then being handed on into the era of the hydroplanes and submarine ten o'clock gentlemen said the voice of the ship's corporal at the door the sub eyed him sternly you may get yourself a glass of beer corporal and thereby won a five-minute respite then out lights please gentlemen again broke in upon the revels corporal will you the man shook his head with a grim smile come along please gentlemen or you'll get me ung reluctantly the singers withdrew drifting by twos and threes to the steerage flat where their hammocks swung the ship's corporal switched off the lights and locked the gun-room door i likes to see i spirits myself he admitted to a yawning steward who accompanied him out of the mess the gun-room steward's reply was to the effect that you could have too much even of a good thing and he retired gloomily to the pantry where in company with a vast ham and the gun-room crockery he spent most of his waking hours in the nearly deserted wardroom a rubber of bridge was still in lingering progress a sea raced frothing past the thick glass of a scuttle and one of the players raised his eyes from his hand blowing up for a dirty night he observed a lieutenant deep in an armchair by the fire lifted his head it's sure to my middle watch he closed the book he was reading and stood up stretching himself then with a glance at the clock he moved towards the door as he opened it the senior engineer came into the mess his face was drawn with tiredness and there were traces of dust round his eyes he pulled off a pair of engine-room gloves and ordering a drink thoughtfully rolled a cigarette at the sound of his voice the engineer commander looked up from the game and raised his eyebrows in an unspoken question to his subordinate the senior engineer nodded yes sir she's all right now i don't think she'll give any more trouble to-night he finished his drink and sought his cabin he had had three hours sleep in the last forty-eight hours and hoped as he undressed that the infernal scrap heap would hold together till he'd had a bit more the night wore on and one by one the inmates of the wardroom drifted to their respective cabins outside the captain's cabin the sentry beguiled the tedium of the vigil by polishing the buckle of his belt every now and again he glanced at the clock at last the hands pointed to a quarter to twelve in fifteen minutes his watch would be over 
he buckled on his belt and resumed his noiseless beat occasionally from some cabin or hammock the snore of a tired sleeper reached his ears the rifles stowed upright round the aft deck moved in their racks to the measured roll of the ship with a long-drawn monotonous rattle like a boy's stick drawn lightly across area railings a tread sounded overhead and a figure carrying a lantern came lightly down the hatchway it was the midshipman of the first watch calling the reliefs he descended to the steerage flat and bending down under the hammocks of his sleeping brethren knocked at the door of one of the cabins there was a lull in the stertorous breathing in the warm dim interior ten minutes to twelve sir the inmate grunted and switched on his light all right he growled the boy moved off till he came to a hammock slung by the armored door he ranged up beside it and blew lightly into the face of the sleeper jimmy ten to twelve the occupant of the hammock opened one eye all right he whispered sleepily and closed it again the midshipman of the first watch eyed him suspiciously no you don't he shook the hammock wake up you fat-headed blighter or i'll slip you then changing his tone to a wheedling one come on jimmy it's a lovely night much more healthy on the bridge than fugging on your beastly hammock his relief said something under his breath and emerged shivering from the blankets blinking in the light of the lantern once his feet were fairly on the deck the other turned and scampered up the ladder again the bell struck eight times as the lieutenant and midshipman of the middle watch climbed the ladder to the forebridge the fleet was steaming in two divisions with a flotilla of destroyers stationed on the beam beyond them the silhouette of an island was just visible in the pale moonlight at the last stroke of the bell the pipe of the boatswain's mate shrilled out calling the middle watch all the starboard watch sea boats crews and reliefs fall in fore and aft the ship the mantle of responsibility changed wearers sentries seamen stokers signalmen their tale of bricks completed for a few hours turned over to their reliefs and hurried to their hammocks on the bridge the two lieutenants walked up and down for a few minutes while the newcomer received details of the course and speed of the fleet and the captain's orders for the night then the officer of the watch that was ended unslung his binoculars and turned towards the ladder i think that's all she's keeping station very well now but they had a bit of trouble in the engine room earlier in the watch captain wants to be called at daybreak good night good night the midshipman of the watch was already in position on the lower bridge settling down to his four hours vigil with the sextant on the lights of the next ship ahead from the battery below came the voice of the corporal of the watch mustering the hands overhead the wind thrummed in the shrouds and halyards the steady throb of the engines beat out an accompaniment a deep pizzicato accompaniment as if from some mighty bass viol floating up through the open casings and somehow dominating all other sounds the ceaseless swish and murmur of the waves breaking along the ship's side the officer of the watch crossed over to the midshipman's side are we in station all right the boy lowered the sextant yes sir quite steady right give me the sextant and go and brew some cocoa in the chart house there's a spirit lamp there the midshipman vanished and reappeared a few minutes later with two cups of steaming beverage they drank together gulping it hastily to warm themselves ah sighed the lieutenant gratefully that's better now put the cups back and come and show me arcturus if you have shaken off your fat head a couple of hours passed the midshipman of the watch accompanied by the corporal with a lantern had gone his rounds of the mess decks and cell flat the sea boat's crew had gone through an undress rehearsal of man overboard and were huddled yarning at the lee of the forecastle screen twice the ship had crept a shade out of her appointed station in the line and when the telegraph had rung the trouble to the engine room below stolen back to her appointed bearing once the fleet altered course majestically to avoid a fishing fleet as it lay spread over the waters a confusion of flares and bobbing lights the bridge was in darkness save for the faint glow of the binnacle that threw into relief the rugged features of the quartermaster at the wheel 
The face might have been that of a bronze statue, but for a slight movement of the jaws, as he thoughtfully chewed his quid. Suddenly a light at the masthead of the flagship began to blink hurriedly. A signalman stepped out of the lee of the chart-house and rattled the key of the masthead flashing lamp. On all sides the other ships began blinking in answer to the Admiral's call. Presently the yeoman spoke. A rocket soared up into the night ahead of them. The lieutenant put his mouth to the voice-pipe and gave a clear-spoken order, which the telegraph man repeated. Somewhere overhead a bell rang in answer from the engine-room. The fleet had increased speed. The breeze freshened, and the men on the bridge ducked their heads as from time to time a shower of spray drifted over the weather-screens. The midshipman of the watch lowered his sextant and sniffed longingly, his nose in the air. The offshore wind had brought with it a hint of heather and moist earth. Then, with a little sigh, he steadied his sextant again on the lights of the next ahead. The sky was turning pale in the east, and the chilly dawn crept over a grey sea. The faces of the men on the bridge slowly became distinguishable. They were the faces of the morning watch, wan in the growing light. The lieutenant rubbed the stubble on his chin and turned his glasses on a school of porpoises chasing each other through the waves. The sky astern changed gradually from grey to lilac. Low down on the horizon a little belt of cloud became slowly tinged with pink. Out of a hen-coop on the booms, the shrill crow of a newly awakened cockerel greeted another day. Then from the mess-deck, drifted up hatchway and ventilating cowl, came the hoarse bellow, "'Leave out! Leave out! Leave out! Show a leg there! Show a leg! The sun's a-scorching your eyes out!' The lookout in the foretop watched the antics of a small land-bird balancing itself on the forestay. "'Poor little bloke,' he muttered, blowing on his benumbed fingers. Specs you wants your brekkies, same's me. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. A One-Gun Salute Every person subject to this act who shall strike or lift up any weapon against his superior officer in the execution of his office shall be punished with death or such other punishment as is hereinafter mentioned. Section 16. Naval Discipline Act. In official eyes, even in eyes anxious to condone, illicit rum and the unreasoning passion of a Celtic temperament were the sole causes of the trouble yet a man may fight destiny in the shape of these evils and still make a very fair show of it it was the addition of the third factor that in this case overtipped the scales her red untidy hair was usually screwed into wisps of last night's football herald she had green provocative eyes that slanted upwards ever so slightly at the corners and coarse chapped hands useful hands as many an overbold ordinary seaman had discovered to his fuddled amazement but in no wise ornamental her speech was partly lower deck partly barrack room softened withal by the broad west country burr her home was an alehouse in an obscure back street near devonport dockyard she was in no sense of the word a nice girl but she was tall, deep-bosomed, and broad of hip, and appealed inordinately to Ivor Jenkins, stoker first class of His Majesty's Navy, who was dark and undersized, and had lately developed a troublesome cough. The recreations of a man, who on a daily rate of pay, of two shillings one pence, contrives to support a bedridden mother and a consumptive sister, cannot perforce partake of the elaborate ivor denied a wider choice was therefore content to spend as much of his watch ashore as a jealously eked out pint would allow at the crossed killicks for many weeks past alternate nights had found the little man perched on a three-legged stool in a corner of the bar raging inwardly at an unnumbered host of rivals dumbly grateful for such crumbs of recognition as arabella from behind the beer handles was pleased to fling him the sailor man a wooing usually conducts his financial affairs with an open-handed generosity calculated to make a ministering angel pensive 
in consequence ivor who could not afford to back his protestations by invitations to the hippodrome whelk suppers and the like dropped by degrees more and more out of the running at first the girl gave him encouragement not the vague nebulous coquetry mayfair recognizes as such but an intimate familiarity extended to slaps on the nose boko and once a dash of swipe down the back of his neck as ivor stooped to recover a broken pipe but nothing came of it not even a penny's worth of fish and chips accustomed to tribute tendered with a lavish hand arabella decided that this must be a proper stinge one moreover niggardly in his consumption of beer and since there was the good of the house to be considered to be dealt a lesson in due season bella give us a kiss save for ivor and the girl the squalid bar was deserted she paused in the act of replacing a bottle on the shelf behind her and looked over her shoulder half surprised half contemptuous a beam of afternoon sunlight slanted through the dusty panes and caught the greenish feline eyes and ruddy hair innocent for once of curl papers what me kiss you she spoke slowly and flung each word like a whiplash at the soul of ivor jenkins ah yes bella just one there ain't my dear life you ain't arf got no neck she turned with her hands on her hips and regarded him with a smile on her thin lips measuring his undersized stature with her eyes i only kisses men you don't even drink like no man you don't besides what have he done for us to kiss he us likes men what does things you know ivor winced but never took his smouldering eyes from the girl i'll do anything for you he said tensely so i would and coughed abruptly she laughed and fell to wiping the sloppy counter them as wants my kisses earns em same's pete worley broke out of un ship un did to take i to theatre and when the escort command to fetch him back pete un laid out un like ninepins proper man un was she surveyed ivor perched smoking on his stool and a sudden gleam came into her eyes yer us knows of a kiss goin beggin to-morrow afternoon she leaned across the counter with a dangerous tenderness in her rather hoarse voice if so be as a man she laid a slight intonation on the word as to leave us to go to dockyard bank for an hour and slipped out like it was his watch on board as she knew but she had also noted the red good conduct badge on his arm and chose it instead of the accustomed tribute he had denied her then her eyes hardened like agates simly ain't got no money to bank though ay said ivor slowly ay indeed i have three pound it was his sheet anchor saved how heaven and he alone knew that his mother might eventually be buried with that circumstance which is dearer to the hearts of the welsh than life itself the girl nodded and laid her hand caressingly on his sleeve that's right my dear you got to leave to go to bank and slip along here to-morrow afternoon bout five will he now she looked at him from beneath tawny eyes ivor finished his beer and wiped his mouth musingly on the back of his hand the girl thought he was considering the good conduct badge as a matter of fact ivor was wondering how the police at the dockyard gate might be circumvented course she said indifferently turning away if him feared the man flushed darkly and stood up you'll see he replied and went out through the swing doors in a gust of coughing it had been worrying him a good deal lately that cough two the short november afternoon was drawing to a close as ivor left the dockyard bank with the shining sovereign gripped tightly in his trousers pocket dusk was settling down on the lines of storehouses and from the hamas below came the hoot of sirens that told of a fog sweeping in from the channel ivor strolled across the cobbles to where the figurehead of a bygone frigate lifted an impassive countenance and from the shelter of its plinth he surveyed the gateway the main entrance was closed and the narrow door that only admitted the passage of one person at a time was guarded by a watchful policeman it seemed as if nothing short of a miracle would get a man in uniform through without a pass presently a bell in some neighbouring tower struck the hour and the waiting man turned in the direction of the sound 
the ships in the lower yard were invisible only their topmasts appeared out of the fog that came slowly swirling in from the sea higher and higher it crept then suddenly the policeman at the gate was blotted out and the wall became a towering blackness that loomed up through the vapour still ivor waited holding his sovereign tightly and wrestling with a cough that threatened every minute to betray him some parties of liberty men going on leave tramped past he heard the gates open and saw for a moment the glare of the streets beyond a couple of officers in plain clothes appeared suddenly into the blurred circle of his vision and were swallowed again by the blackness what a fog he heard one say the other laughed and grumbled something about being glad he was not channel groping their voices died away and ivor emerged to reconnoitre only to scurry back into shelter as a telegraph boy on a bicycle steered a devious course past him across the cobbles the little disc of light from his lamp zigzagged to and fro for a minute and was gone then ivor heard the rumble of wheels and the clatter of a horse's hoofs the lights of a four-wheeler passed him and stopped the policeman was unbolting the gates it was ivor's chance and realizing it he slipped up beside the cab inside was a figure muffled in a greatcoat above which he caught a glimpse of a clean-shaven impatient face presently the inmate lowered the further window and leant out effectually interposing his body as a screen between ivor and the guardian of the gate hurry up he called i've got a train to catch the gates swung slowly back the cab rumbled through and with it passed ivor jenkins then for the first time he relinquished his grip on his sovereign and permitted himself the luxury of a fit of unchecked coughing built em, he gasped when he got his breath again half awed at the ease with which he found himself in the strangely unfamiliar streets at the corner of the side street he turned and looked back at the grim wall in the signal tower that loomed above it into the murky sky the yeoman on watch had just tapped the key of the flashing lamp to test the circuit to ivor it seemed as if fate had winked at him solemnly and portentously ivor pushed through the swing doors of the crossed killicks and looked hastily round the bar hello he ejaculated blankly where's bella the girl behind the counter a short stout woman in a purple plush bodice tossed her head there's er after north she explained tartly ay but where's she gorn walk it out with a blue marine Ippodrome, i think they was a-goin ivor sat down and fumbled blindly in the lining of his cap for his pipe save for a spot of colour on either cheekbone his face was an ugly grey fine upstandin feller he was too added the barmaid weighing ivor in the balance of comparison and finding him somewhat wanting ivor nodded dully and for a while examined with apparently absorbed interest an advertisement on the wall opposite passion surged through him in waves that made the skin of his forehead tingle so she'd built him after all given him the go-by for a blue marine ivor knew him too had once even stood him a drink the adam's apple in his throat worked like a piston presently the girl behind the bar looked up from her occupation of drying glasses and eyed him curiously but all she saw was a small dark man who sucked hard at an empty pipe one fist clenched tightly in his trousers pocket staring hard at an advertisement for somebody's whisky at length out of the chaos of his thoughts two courses of action took shape and presented themselves for consideration one was to bash the blue marine into irrecognition the other was to get mercifully drunk as soon as possible the blue marine ivor remembered scaled a matter of fourteen stone so he chose the latter alternative and for thirty-six hours oblivion as understood by men of his majesty's forces received him into her arms three did remain absent over leave thirty-six tours under aggravated circumstances declaimed the master-at-arms it was the first time ivor had broken his leave for three years his head ached intolerably he felt sick too and heard as from an infinite distance the cool crisp tones of the commander who spoke sternly of the penalties attached to not playing the game ivor listened sullenly 
It was another and an older game he had tried to play, a game in which fate seemed to hold most of the trumps. There was a good deal more in the same strain about the abuse of privileges, and it all ended in his being placed in the captain's report to stand over till next day. At dinner his resentment against the universe in general swelled into an excited flood of lower-deck jargon. In particular he poured out invective on the perfidy of woman, and forty-three mess, with the peculiar understanding vouched in the matter to men who go down to the sea in ships, sucked its teeth in sympathetic encouragement. "'I observe her to rights,' said a youthful second-class stoker darkly. He removed the point of his clasp-knife from his mouth, whither it had conveyed a potato, and illustrated with a gesture an argument certain of his feminine acquaintances in the Mile End Road were supposed to have found conclusive. "'Don't you take on, Taff,' said another, pushing over his pannikin of rum. "'Have a rub of this lot.' Ivor finished his sympathizer's tot and several others that were furtively offered him, for he was a popular little man among his messmates. But spirit, even the three-water rum, was not the soundest remedy for an alcoholic head. It set him coughing and deepened the sense of injury that rankled within him. "'What you want,' said a leading stoker, "'is to run about and bite things like. "'You go on deck and have a smoke.' He knew the danger signals of a mess deck with the intimacy of seventeen years' experience, and Ivor went sullenly. It was a dangerous man that stopped at the break of the forecastle to light his pipe. "'Well,' he said presently, "'what do you reckon I'll get, Weber?' His raggy answered the situation. "'Couldn't rightly say. There's the jaunty over by the archway. Go along and ask him.' Ivor smoked in silence for a moment, then nodded, and stepped through the wreaths of tobacco smoke, touched the master-at-arms on the shoulder. The latter, who was listening to a story related by the ship's steward, was a small man with a grim, vinegary face. He turned sharply. "'Well,' he said curtly. Now Ivor had stepped across the deck, honestly intending to ask the probable extent of the punishment the captain would award him for breaking his leave. The suddenness with which the master-at-arms turned jarred his jangled nerves. The sour face opposite him was the face of the man who on the lower deck represented law, order, and justice things Ivor knew to be perverse and monstrous mockeries. His brain swam with the fumes of the thirty-six hours' debauch, reawakened by his messmate's rum. A sudden insane rage closed down on him like a mist, leaving him conscious only of the master-at-arms' face, as in the centre of a partly fogged negative, very distinct and for an instant imperturbable and maddening. Yet, as Ivor struck, fair and true between the eyes, he somehow realized that not even now had he got level with fate. 4. A man seated in the foremost cell raised an unshaven face from his hands as the sullen report of a gun reached him through the open scuttle. For a while he speculated dully what it was for, then with curious disinterestedness remembered that it was the court-martial gun, and that he, Ivor Jenkins, was that day to be tried for an offence the extreme penalty for which is death. They said he'd slogged the jaunty. For a while he had been, dazed and incredulous, but as the testimony of innumerable witnesses seemed to leave no doubt about the matter, Ivor accepted the intelligence with stoical unconcern. Personally, he had no recollection of anything save a great uproar and a sea of excited faces appearing suddenly on all sides out of a red mist. However, there were the witnesses, and, moreover, there was still an unexplained tenderness about his knuckles. "'I plead guilty,' was all the prisoner's friend, a puzzled and genuinely sympathetic engineer lieutenant, could get out of him. "'Well, I should have thought you were the last man to have done such a thing in the whole of the ship's company. Same's here, sir, said Ivor, and fell a coughing. Subsequent proceedings bewildered and finally bored him. They thrust documents upon him wherein he found his name coupled to the incomprehensible prefix, for that he and his misdemeanor described in a style worthy of the police budget. The chaplain visited him, and spoke words of reproof in a kindly and mechanical tone. For the rest he was left to himself throughout the long days, 
to cough and cough again to watch the light grow and fade to count the stars in the barred circle of the scuttle and to the recollection of green slanting eyes vexed by dusty sunlight in their depths have you any objection to any members of the court ivor started at the question and looked round the cabin till then he had not noticed his surroundings much a captain and several commanders in frock coats and epaulets were seated round a baize covered table they were enclosed by a rope covered with green cloth secured breast high to wooden pillars also covered with green cloth it was the captain's fore cabin and the bulkheads were covered with paintings of ships one of these in particular a corvette close hauled arrested ivor's attention the deputy judge advocate a paymaster with a preternaturally grave face and slightly nervous manner repeated his question do you object to being tried by any of the officers present on the court ivor moistened his lips why on earth should they expect him to object to them an unknown master-at-arms standing beside him with a drawn sword nudged him in the ribs no sir the captains and commanders then rose with a clank of swords and swore to administer justice without partiality favour or affection in tones that for a moment brought ivor visions of a stuffy chapel ebenezer they called it in far-away glamorganshire then the judge advocate turned to him again you need not plead either guilty or not guilty but if you wish to plead guilty you may do so now at last guilty said ivor jenkins for an instant there was utter silence the junior commander stirred slightly and glanced at the clock he would have time for that round of golf after all the prisoner's friend then gave evidence and ivor experienced his first sensation of interest at hearing himself described as an excellent working hand who had never given anything but satisfaction to his superiors a perspiring and obviously embarrassed chief stoker followed the last man in the ship i'd have thought to do such a thing he maintained ivor glanced at him indulgently as one who hears an oft-repeated platitude and resumed his study of the corvette close hauled clear the court said the president briskly ivor found himself once more in the lobby sitting between his escort one a kindly man pressed a small hard object into his hand ivor nodded imperceptibly thanks and under cover of a cough conveyed it to his mouth it was a plug of navy tobacco a bell rang overhead and the prisoner was marched back into the court to be imprisoned with hard labor for the term of twelve calendar months it was over now say ah again raise your arms hmm the surgeon disentangled himself from his stethoscope and looked ivor in the eyes my lad he said bluntly it's hospital for you and too late at that in the wardroom later on he met the engineer lieutenant i'd make a better prisoner's friend than ever you will he remarked pressed for an explanation he tapped the stethoscope case in his pocket consumption galloping he said perhaps ivor had held the ace of trumps after all end of chapter twenty one Chapter twenty two of Naval Occasions by Bartimaeus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty two Concerning the Sailor Man. Able seaman, seaman gunner, one good conduct badge. Thus, with a click of unaccustomed boot heels, he might describe himself at the monthly muster by open list. In less formal surroundings, however, he is wont to refer to himself as a matlaw a designation not infrequently accompanied by fervid embellishments occasionally he serves to adorn the moral of a temperance tract a reporter hard pressed for police court news may record one of his momentary lapses from the paths of convention ashore otherwise literature knows him not generally speaking his appearance is familiar enough though it is to be feared that the world the unfamiliar world of streets and a shod people of garish pubs and pitfalls innumerable does not invariably see him at his best 
the influence of the naval discipline act relaxes ashore and not unnatural reaction inspires him with a desire to tilt his cap on the back of his head and a fine indiscrimination in the matter of liquid refreshment but to be appreciated he must be seen in his proper sphere on board ship he is not required to play up to any romantic role no one regards him with curiosity or even interest and he is in consequence normal ashore aware of observation he becomes as unnatural as a self-conscious child a very genuine pride in his appearance is partly the outcome of tradition and partly fostered by a jealous supervision of his divisional lieutenant a score of subtleties go to make up his rig and never was tide bound by more unswerving laws than those that set a span to the width of his bell-bottomed trousers or the depth of his collar this collar was instituted by his forebears to protect their jackets from the grease on their queues the queue has passed away but the collar remains and its width is sixteen inches no more no less the triple row of tape that adorns its edge commemorates so runs the legend the three victories that won for him his heritage in perpetual mourning for the hero of trafalgar the tar of to-day knots a black silk handkerchief beneath it it is doubtful whether he is aware of the portent of these emblems for he is not commonly of an inquiring turn of mind but they are as they were in the beginning they must be just so and that for him suffices a number of factors go to make his speech the obscure jargon it has been represented recruited from the north south east and west he brings with him the dialect he spoke in childhood and it were easier to change the colour of a man's eyes than to take out of his mouth the brogue he lisped in his cradle a succession of commissions abroad enriches his vocabulary with a smattering of half the tongues of earth arabic chinese malay hindustani and japanese smatterings truly and rightly untranslatable but pentecostal in their variety lastly and proclaiming his vocation most surely of all are the undying sea phrases and terms without which no sailor can express himself even the objects of everyday life need translation the floor becomes a deck stairs a hatchway the window a scuttle or gun port there are others smacking of masts and yards and the tar and spunyard of a bygone navy they are obsolete to-day yet current speech among men who at heart remain unchanged in spite of higher education and the introduction of marmalade and pickles into their scale of rations the tendency to emphasize that all vigorous forms of life demand find outlet in the meaningless oaths that mar the sailor's speech lack of culture denies him a wider choice of adjectives the absence of privacy or refinements in his mode of life and a great familiarity from earliest youth would seem an explanation of if not an excuse for a habit which remains eradicable in spite of well-meaning efforts to counteract it the conditions of naval service sever his home ties very soon in life the isolation from feminine and gentler influences that it demands is responsible for the curiously intimate friendships and loyalty that exist on the mess deck of a man of war with a friend the blue jacket is willing to share all his worldly possessions even to the contents of the mysterious little bag that holds his cleaning rags brick and emery paper since the work of polishing a piece of brass make no great demand on his mental activity the sailor chooses this time to spin a yarn and from the fact that the recipient of these low-voiced quaintly worded confidences usually shares his cleaning rags the tar describes his friend as his raggy to the uninitiated the word signifies little but to the sailor it represents all in his hard life that suffereth long and is kind his love for animals which is proverbial affords but another outlet for the springs of affection that exist in all hearts and in his case being barred wider scope are intensified outside events have for him but little interest 
so long as he is not called upon to bear a hand by his divinely appointed superior while his ration of rum and stand-easy time are not interfered with the rise and fall of dynasties battle murder and sudden death leave him imperturbable and unmoved only when these are accompanied by sufficiently gruesome pictorial representations in the section of the press he patronizes can they be said to be of much import to him but he dearly loves a funeral his attitude towards his officers is commonly that demanded by an austere discipline and accompanied more often than not by real affection and loyalty he accepts punishment at the hands of his superior in the spirit that he accepts rain or toothache its justice may be beyond his reasoning but administered by the power that rules his paths it is the law as irrevocable as fate morally he has been portrayed in two lights idealists claim for him a guilelessness of soul that would insult an arcadian shepherd to his detractors he is merely a godless scoffer rudely antagonistic to religion a brand not even worth snatching from the burning somewhere midway between these two extremes is to be found the man as he really is to whom religion presents itself when he considers the matter at all a form of celestial naval discipline tempered by sentimentality but these are generalities and may not apply to even a fraction of the men in the fleet to-day conditions of life and modes of thought on the lower deck are even now changing as the desert sand and those who live among sailor-men would hesitate the most to unite their traits in one comprehensive summary it is only by glimpses here and there of individuals who represent types that one may gleam knowledge of the whole in the ship's office of a man-of-war are rows of neat brass-bound boxes and here are stowed the certificates of the ship's company those of each class seamen engine-room ratings marine and so forth being kept separately at the first sight there is little enough about these prosaic documents to suggest romance or even human interest to the ordinary individual yet if you read between the lines a little picking out an entry here and there among the hundreds of different handwritings you can weave with the aid of a little imagination all manner of whimsical fancies and if at the end the study of them leaves you little wiser it will be with a quickened interest in the inner life of the barefooted incomprehensible being on whose shoulders will some day perchance fall the burden of your destiny and mine the king's regulations and admiralty instructions with a flourish of unwanted metaphor refer to the document as a man's passport through life the sailor himself ever prone to generalities describes his certificate as his discharge in accountant circles in which the thing circulates it is known as a parchment a service certificate to give its official title is a double sheet of parchment with printed headings foolscap size which is prepared for every man on first entry into the service at the outset it is inscribed with his name previous occupation and description his religion the name and address of his next of kin and the period of service for which he engages in due course when he completes his training and is drafted to sea his certificate accompanies him as he goes from ship to ship on pages two and three are entered the records of his service his rating the names of his ships and the period he served in each on thirty first december in each year his captain assesses in his own handwriting on page four the character and ability of each man in the ship these fluctuate between various stages from a very good to indifferent in the former case exceptional to inferior in the latter here too appear the history of award and deprivation of good conduct badges the more severe penalties of wrong-doing such as cells and imprisonment here too they must remain for parchment cannot be tampered with and an alteration must be sanctioned by the admiralty in perpetual appraisement or reproach until the man completes his engagement and his certificate becomes his own property the heading previous occupation shows plainly enough the trades and classes from which the navy is recruited and is interesting if only for the incongruity of the entries 
they are most varied among the stoker's certificates as these men entered the service later in life than the seamen laborer suggests little save perhaps a vision of the thames embankment at night and the evidence that someone at least found a solution of the unemployment problem but we may be wronging him doubtless he had employment enough yet i still connect him with the embankment at the bidding of the l c c it was here he wielded pick and crowbar until the sudden distant hoot of a siren stirred something dormant within him the barges sliding downstream of a smoky sunset into the unknown suggested a wider world so he laid down his tools and his pay is now two shillings one pence per diem from his next of kin notation he apparently supports a wife on it farmhand can you say what led him from kind scented surroundings and the swishing milk pails to the stokehold of a man of war did the clatter of the threshing machine wake an echo of the bucket and clang of the brasses working together by perfect degree perhaps it was the ruddy glow of the hop ovens by night that he exchanged for the hell glare of a battleship's furnaces or as a final solution was it the later product of these same ovens in liquid form that helped the recruiting officer newspaper vendor a pretty conceit that vendor he has changed vastly since he dodged about the strand hawking the world's news and exchanging shrill obscenities with the rebuke of policemen and cab drivers but the gutter patois clings to him yet and of nights you may see him forward seated on an upturned bucket ringing discords of unutterable melancholy from a mouth organ merchant seaman golf caddy he spat in the sandbox before making your tea and looked the other way when you miss your drive if he was as loyal as caddy as he is a sailor errand boy circus artiste of a surety he was the clown this last his inability to forget his early training has on more than one occasion introduced him to a cell and the bitter waters of affliction but he is much in demand at sing-songs and during stand-easy time now here is one with a heavy black line ruled across his record on page two and in the margin appears the single letter k he is a recovered deserter he ran after eight years service and stainless record was it some red-lipped tousle-haired siren who lured him from the paths of rectitude did the galling monotony and austere discipline suddenly prove too much for him was it a meeting with a yankee tar in some foreign grog shop that tempted him with tales of a higher pay and greater independence hardly the latter i think because they caught him and on page four of the tell-tale parchment appears the penalty ninety days detention lastly porter where on earth did he shoulder trunks and ball by your leave was it amid the echoing vastness of a london terminus with its smoke and gloom or and this i think the more probable was it on some sleepy branch line that he rang a bell or waved a flag collected tickets and clattered to and fro with fine effect in enormous hobnail boots then one fine day but imagination falters here leaving us no nearer the reason why he exchanged his green corduroys for the jumper and collar and if we asked him which we cannot very well i doubt if he could tell himself they make a motley collection these tinkers and tailors and candlestick makers but in time they filter through the same mould and emerge as a rule vastly improved you may sometimes encounter them in railway stations or tram cars returning on leave to visit a home that has become no more than an amiable memory and some day maybe you will advertise for a caretaker or one to do odd jobs about the house and garden whose wife can do plain cooking look out then for the man with tattooed wrists and eyes that meet yours unflinching from a weather-beaten face he will come to apply in person for the job being no great scribe or believer in the power of the pen he will arrange his visit so as to arrive towards evening this being he concludes your stand easy time he wastes few words but from the breast pocket of an obviously ready-made jacket he will produce a creased and soiled sheet of parchment it is the record of his life 
and after two and twenty years through which the frayed passport has brought him at forty years of age he turns to you for employment and a life wherein it is his one stipulation there shall be no more sea end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three the greater love the sun was setting behind a lurid bank of cloud above the hills of spain and as is usual at gibraltar about that hour a light breeze sprang up it eddied round the rock and scurried across the harbour leaving dark cat's paws in its trail finally it reached the inner mole alongside which a cruiser was lying a long pendant of white bunting that all day had hung listlessly from the main topmast stirred wavered and finally bellied out astern the gilded bladder at the tail bobbing uneasily over the surface of the water the officer of the watch leaned over the rail and watched the antics of the bladder round which a flock of querulous gulls circled and screeched the paying off pendant looks as if it were impatient he said laughingly to an engineer lieutenant standing at his side footnote a pendant one and a quarter times the length of the ship flown by ships homeward bound under orders to pay off End footnote. the other smiled in his slow way and turned seaward nodding across the bay towards algeciras not much longer to wait there's the steamer with the mail coming across now he took a couple of steps across the deck and turned only another twelve hundred miles isn't it ripping to think of after three years he rubbed his hands with boyish satisfaction all the coal in and stowed boats turned in funnel smoking that's what i like to see only the mail to wait for now and the gauges down below he waggled his forefinger in the air laughing like that the lieutenant nodded and hitched his glass under his arm your middle watch shorty mine too we start working up for our passage trial then don't we whack her up lad for england home and beauty the engineer lieutenant walked towards the hatchway what do you think and went below humming from ushant to silly the lieutenant on watch turned and looked up at the rock towering over the harbour above the green shuttered pink and yellow houses and dusty sun-dried vegetation the grim pile was flushing rose-colour against the pure sky how familiar it was he thought this great milestone on the road to the east and mused a while wondering how many dawns he had lain under its shadow how many more sunsets he would watch and marvel at across the purple bay british as brixton he had read the phrase in a book describing gibraltar so it was when you were homeward bound he resumed his measured pacing to and fro the ferry steamer had finished her short voyage and had gone alongside the wharf out of sight behind an arm of the mole not much longer to wait now he glanced at his wrist watch posty wouldn't waste much time getting back not all the beer in Waterport Street, nor all the glamour of the ramps, would lure him astray to-night. The lieutenant paused in his measured stride, and beckoned a side-boy, "'Tell the signalman to let me know directly the postman is sighted coming along the mole.' He resumed his leisurely promenade, wondering how many letters there would be for him and who would write. His mother, of course, and Ted at Charter House. His speculations roamed afield. Anyone else? then he suddenly remembered the engineer lieutenant imitating the twitching gauge needle with his forefinger lucky beggar he was there was some one waiting for him who mattered more than all the teds in the world more even than a mother at least he supposed his thoughts became abruptly sentimental and tender a signalman coming helter-skelter down the ladder interrupted them as the commander stepped out of his cabin on to the quarter-deck postman coming with the mail sir a few minutes later a hoist of flags whirled hurriedly to the masthead asking permission to proceed in execution of previous orders what those orders were even the paying off pendant knew trailing aft over the stern walk in the light wind the rock lay far astern like a tinted shadow an opal set in a blue-gray sea 
once beyond the straits the wind freshened and the cruiser began to lift her lean bows to the swell flinging the spray aft along the forecastle in silver rain the marine bugler steered an unsteady course to the quarter-deck hatchway and sounded the officer's dinner call officers wives eat puddings and pies but sailors wives eat skilly chanted the lieutenant of the impending first watch swaying to the roll of the ship as he adjusted his tie before the mirror he thumped the bulkhead between his cabin and the adjoining one buck up shorty he shouted it's saturday night at sea your night for a glass of port sweethearts and wives called another voice across the flat you get drunk tonight, snatcher if you try to drink at all the voice died away and rose again in expostulation with the marine servant well does it look like a clean shirt give it a shake pay and put it on like a man someone else had joined in from across the flat the engineer lieutenant pushed his head inside his neighbor's cabin come along come along you'll be late for dinner fresh grub tonight no more russian comiskies and fanny adams one second right they linked arms and entered the wardroom as the president tapped the table for grace the surgeon scanned the menu with interest. "'Jesus, the way diet!' he ejaculated, quoting from an old service story. "'Listen and read out. Soup, clear. That's boiled swabs,' interposed the junior watchkeeper. "'Mr. President, sir, I object. This officer's unladylike conversation.' "'Round of port. Fine him,' interrupted several laughing voices. "'Go on, Doc. What next? Fish, mullets.' main drain loungers from the junior watchkeeper isn't he a little lord fauntleroy two rounds of port entree russian komeskis a roar of protest and mutton cutlets goat he means what an orgy go on fain would we hear the worst fair chirurgian blathered the paymaster joint joint mutton or princely munificence murmured the first lieutenant he's not a messman he's a uh what's the word philanthropist what's the awful alternative there isn't any it's scratched out the a p and the junior watchkeeper clung to each other the originality of the creature and the duff rice pudding ah me a lack a day alas the paymaster tore his hair i must prophesy must prophesy shut up everyone shut up he closed his eyes and pawed the air feebly i'm a medium i'm going to prophesy i feel it coming the savory is the savory is there was a moment's tense silence sardines on toast he opened his eyes am i right sir thank you the surgeon leaned forward and picking up the massive silver shooting trophy that occupied the center of the table handed it to a waiter take it to the paymaster please first prize for divination and second sight and you snatcher you'll go down for another round of port if you keep on laughing with your mouth full so the meal progressed the mullets were disentangled from their paper jackets amid a rustling silence of interrogation the worcester sauce aided and abetted the disappearance of the russian kromeskis as it had so often done before the mutton was voted the limit and the rice pudding held evidence that the cook's hair wanted cutting the junior watchkeeper proud officer of that functionary's division vowed he'd have it cut in a manner which calls for no description in these pages there weren't any sardines on toast the philanthropist appeared in person with dusky upturned palms to deplore the omission oh signor hola fanish i make mistake no have got sardine signor dear old ah ying sighed the engineer lieutenant i never really loved him till this minute why did we leave him at hong kong and embark this snake in the grass no sardines but for all that every one seemed to have made an admirable meal and the chaplains for what we have received thank god brought it to a close the table was cleared the wine decanters passed round and once again the president tapped with his ivory mallet there was a little silence mr vice the king the first lieutenant raised his glass gentlemen the king 
the king murmured the mess with faces grown suddenly decorous and grave at that moment the corporal of the watch entered he glanced down the table and approaching the junior watchkeeper's chair saluted and said something in an undertone the junior watchkeeper nodded finished his port and rose folding his napkin his neighbor the engineer lieutenant leaned back in his chair speaking over his shoulder your first watch james the other nodded then with mock solemnity may i remind you that our lives are in your hands till twelve o'clock don't forget that will you the junior watchkeeper laughed i'll bear it in mind at the doorway he turned with a smile it won't be the first time your valuable life has been there or the last we'll hope we'll hope not shorty the buzz of talk and chaff had again begun to ebb and flow round the long table the first lieutenant lit a cigarette and began collecting napkin rings placing them eventually in a row after the manner of horses at the starting post seven to one on the field bar one chief your rings disqualified it would go through the ship's side now wait for the next roll stand by clear the flower pot disqualified be blowed why i turned it myself when i was a student out of a bit of brass i stole can't help that it weighs a ton scratched at the post the commander tapped the table with his little hammer may i remind you all that it's saturday night at sea and gave the decanters a little push towards his left-hand neighbor the first lieutenant brushed the starters into a heap at his side the faintest shadow passed across his brow so it is echoed several voices now shorty fill up snatcher you'd better have a bucket there's a burma girl a settin and i know she thinks port number one the first lieutenant signed an imperceptible negation and pushed the decanter round murmuring something about hereditary gout it was ten years since he had drunk that toast since a certain tragic dawn stealing into the bedroom of a south sea lodging found him on his knees at a bedside they all knew the story as men in naval messes afloat generally do know each other's tragedies and joys and yet his right-hand neighbor invariably murmured the same formula as he passed the wine on saturday nights at sea in its way it was considered a rather subtle intimation that no one wanted to pry into his sorrow even to the extent of presuming that he would never drink that health again in the same way they all knew that it was the one occasion on which the little engineer lieutenant permitted himself the extravagance of wine he was saving up to get married and perhaps for the reason that he had never mentioned the fact every one not only knew it but loved and chaffed him for it the decanters travelled round and the first lieutenant leaned across to the engineer lieutenant who was contemplatively watching the smoke of his cigarette there was a whimsical smile in the grave level eyes i suppose we shall have to think about rigging a garland before long eh footnote a garland of evergreens is triced up to the triatic stay between the masts on the occasion of an officer's marriage End footnote. the other laughed half shyly yes before long i hope number one down came the ivory hammer gentlemen sweethearts and wives and may they never meet added the engineer commander in reality the most domesticated and blameless of husbands it was the ambition of his life to be esteemed a sad dog and that men should shake their heads over him crying fie the first lieutenant gathered together his silver rings now then clear the table she's rolling like a good un. seven to one on the field bar speech broke in the paymaster speech shorty few words by a young officer about to embark on the troubled sea of matrimony hints on the home the prospective bridegroom shook his head laughing and coloured in a way rather pleasant to see he rose pushing in his chair in the inside pocket of his mess jacket was an unopened letter saved up to read over a pipe in peace my advice to you all is don't from the engineer commander mind your own business and the engineer lieutenant fled from the mess amid derisive shouts of coward the voice of the first lieutenant rose above the hubbub seven to one on the field and what about a jump or two chuck up the menu card pay now boys roll bowl or pitch every time a blood orange or a good cigar 
the officer of the first watch leaned out over the bridge rails peering into the darkness that enveloped the forecastle and listening intently the breeze had freshened and the cruiser slammed her way into a rising sea laboring with the peculiar motion known as a corkscrew roll the night was very dark presently he turned and walked to the chart house door inside the navigation officer was leaning over the chart wrinkling his brows as he penciled a faint line pilot said the other just step out here a second the navigator looked up pushing his cap from his forehead what's up i think the starboard anchor is talking i wish you'd come and listen a moment the navigator stepped out onto the bridge closing the chart house door after him and paused a moment to accustom his eyes to the darkness dark night isn't it wind's getting up too he walked to the end of the bridge and leaned out the ship plunged into a hollow with a little shudder and then flung her bows upwards into a cascade of spray a dull metallic sound detached itself from the sibilant rushing of water and the beat of waves against the ship's side repeating faintly with each roll of the ship from the neighborhood of the anchor bed the navigator nodded yes one of the securing chains wants tautening i should say saltash luck for some one footnote saltash luck is a thorough wetting End footnote. he moved back into the chart house and picked up the parallel rulers again the lieutenant of the watch went to the head of the ladder and called the boatswain's mate who was standing in the lee of the conning tower yarning with the corporal of the watch pipe the duty sub of the watch to fall in with oilskins on when they're present take them on to the forecastle and set up the securing chain of the starboard bower anchor something's worked loose see that any one who goes outside the rail has a bowline on aye aye sir the boatswain's mate descended the ladder giving a few preliminary cheeps with his pipe before delivering himself of his tidings of saltash luck to the duty sub of the port watch the officer of the watch gave an order to the telegraph man on the bridge and far below in the engine room they heard the clang of the telegraph gongs he turned into the chart house and opened the ship's log glancing at the clock as he did so then he wrote with a stumpy bit of pencil nine eighteen decreased speed to six knots duty sub secured starboard bower anchor he returned to the bridge and leaned over the rail straining his eyes into the darkness and driving spray towards the indistinct group of men working on the streaming forecastle in the light of a swaying lantern he could make out a figure getting out on to the anchor bed another was turning up with a rope's end he heard the faint click of a hammer on metal the ship lurched and plunged abruptly into the trough of a sea an oath clear-cut and distinct tossed aft on the wind and a quick shout he turned aft and rushed to the top of the ladder bawling down between curved palms with the strength of his lungs the engineer lieutenant who left the wardrobe after dinner did not immediately go on deck he went first to his cabin where he filled and lit a pipe and changed his mess jacket for a comfortable loose-fitting monkey jacket then he settled down in his armchair wedged his feet against the bunk to steady himself against the roll of the ship and read his letter often as he read he smiled and once he blinked a little misty-eyed the last sheet he re-read several times Quote, oh isn't it good to think of it was almost worth the pain of separation to have this happiness now to know that every minute is bringing you nearer i wake up in the morning with that happy sort of feeling that something nice is going to happen soon and then i realize you are coming home i jump out of bed and tear another leaf off the calendar there are only nine left now and then comes one marked with a big cross do you know the kind of happiness that hurts or is it only a girl who can feel it i pray every night that the days may pass quickly and that you may come safely End quote. it was a very ordinary little love letter with its shy admixture of love and faith and piety the sort so few men ever earn and so many in heaven's mercy are suffered to receive the recipient folded it carefully replaced it in its envelope and put it in his pocket then he lifted his head suddenly listening down below the engine-room telegraph gong had clanged and the steady beat of the engine slowed 
With an eye on his wristwatch, he counted the muffled strokes of the piston. Decreased to six knots. What was the matter? Fog? He rose and leaned over his bunk, peering through the scuttle. Quite clear. He decided to light a pipe and go on deck for a breather before turning in, and glanced at the little clock ticking on the bulkhead. Twenty past nine. Ten minutes' walk on the quarter-deck and then to bed. It was his middle watch. As he left his cabin, someone in the wardroom began softly playing the piano, and the paymaster's clear baritone joined in, singing a song about somebody's grey eyes watching for somebody else. The mess was soaking in sentiment tonight. Must be the effect of Saturday night at sea, he reflected. He reached the quarter-deck, and stood looking round, swaying easily with the motion of the ship. The sea was getting up, and the wind blew a stream of tiny sparks from his pipe. Farther aft, the sentry on the life-boys was mechanically walking his beat, now toiling laboriously up a steep incline, now trying to check a too precipitous descent. The engineer lieutenant watched him for a moment, listening to the note of the piano tinkling up through the open skylight from the wardroom. "'I know of two white arms waiting for me!' The singer had started another verse, the engineer lieutenant smiled faintly and walked to the ship's side to stare out into the darkness. Why on earth had they slowed down? A sudden impatience filled him. Every minute was precious now. Why, man overboard, away lifeboat, cruise! Not for nothing had the officer of the watch received a masts and yards upbringing. The wind forward caught the stentorian shout and hurled it along the booms and battery, aft to the quarter-deck, where the little engineer lieutenant was standing, one hand closed over the glowing bowl of his pipe, the other thrust into his trouser pocket. The engine-room telegraph began clanging furiously, the sound passing up the casings and ventilators into the night. Then the boatswain's mate sent his ear-piercing pipe along the decks, calling away the lifeboat's crew. The sentry on the lifeboys wrenched at the releasing knob of one of his charges and ran across to the other. The leaden seconds passed, and the engineer lieutenant still stood beside the rail, mechanically knocking the ashes from his pipe. Then something went past on the crest of a wave, something white that might have been a man's face, or broken water showing up in the glare of a scuttle, a sound out of the darkness that might have been the cry of a low-flying gull. Now it may be argued that the engineer lieutenant ought to have stayed where he was, going overboard on such a night was too risky for a man whose one idea was to get home as quickly as possible who a moment before had chaffed at the delay of reduced speed furthermore he had in his pocket a letter bidding him come home safely and for three years he had denied himself his little luxuries for love of her who wrote it all the same would she have him stand and wonder if that was a gull he had heard love of woman love of life mighty factors almost supreme yet a mortal has stayed in a wrecked stokehold amid the scalding steam to find and shut a valve leper settlements have their doctors and pastor and a very gallant gentleman walks unhesitatingly into an anarctic blizzard to show there is love stronger and higher even than these the engineer lieutenant was concerned with none of these fine thoughts for one second he did pause, looking about as if for somewhere to put his pipe. Then he tossed it onto the deck, scrambled over the rail, and took a deep breath and dived. The marine sentry ran to the side of the ship. Christ! he gasped and forsook his post to cry the tale aloud along the seething battery. The ship shuddered as the engines were reversed, and the water under the stern began to seethe and churn. The commander had left his cabin and was racing up to the bridge as the captain reached the quarter-deck. A knot of officers gathered on the after-bridge. "'Pins out, sir!' shouted the coxswain of the sea-boat, and added under his breath, "'Oars already, lads! Stand by to pull like bloody hell! There's two of em in the ditch!' The boat was hanging a few feet above the tumbling water. "'Slip!' shouted a voice from the invisible forebridge. An instant's pause, and the boat dropped with a crash onto a rising wave. There was a clatter and thud of oars in rowlocks, the clanking of the chain slings, and the boat, with her motley clad, life belted crew, slid off down the slant of a wave. For a moment, the glare of an electric light lit the faces of the men, 
tugging and straining grimly at their oars then she vanished to reappear a moment later on the crest of a sea and disappeared again into the darkness the commander on the forebridge snapped up a megaphone shouting downwind pull to starboard cutter make for the lifebuoy light the watchers on the after bridge were peering into the night with binoculars and glasses the a p extended an arm and forefinger there's the lifebuoy there now there do you see it you can just see the flare when it lifts on a wave ah that's better the dazzling white beam from a searchlight on the forebridge leaped suddenly into the night now we can see the cutter the beam wavered a moment and finally steadied yes there they are i say there's a devil of a sea running ripping sea boats our service cutters are said another staring through his glasses they'll live in almost anything but this isn't a dangerous sea the skipper'll turn in a minute and make a lee for them think old shorty reached the buoy probably swimming about looking for the other fellow if i know anything of him who did he go in after one of the duty sub they were securing the anchor or something forward and the bow line slipped by gad he's got him there's the buoy yes two of them good old shorty my god good old shorty the speaker executed a sort of war dance and trod on the paymaster's toes when you've quite finished snatcher by the way what about hot water bottles blankets stimulants first aid come along assure the patient in a loud voice that he is safe aspect cheerful but subdued i learned the whole rigmarole once from the fore upper bridge the captain was handling his ship like a picket boat midships steady stop both he raised his mouth from the voice pipe to the helmsman and nodded to the officer of the watch she'll do now the wind'll take her down the commander leaned over the rail and called the boatswain's mate clear lower deck man the falls the ranks of men along the ship's side turned inboard and passed the ropes aft in readiness to hoist the boat there were three hundred men on the falls standing by to whisk the cutter to the davit heads like a cockle shell they've got em got em both murmured the deep voices they spat impatiently what say lads stamp and go with her silence in the battery marry the commander was leaning over the bridge rails the surgeon and two sick berth stewards were waiting by the davits alongside the cutter was rising and falling on the waves all right sir the voice of the coxswain came up as if from the deep they had hooked the plunging boat on somehow and his thumbnail was a pulp three hundred pairs of eyes turned towards the forebridge hoist away no need for the boatswain's mate to echo the order no need for the petty officer with a will then lads they rushed aft in a wild stampede hauling with every ounce of beef and strength in their bodies the cutter dripping and swaying her crew fending her off the rolling ship with their stretchers shot up to the davits high enough the rush stopped like one man another pull on the afterfall enough she was hoisted walk back lie to a tense silence fell upon the crowded battery the only sound that of men breathing hard a limp figure was seen descending the jacob's ladder out of the boat assisted by two of the crew heady hands were outstretched to help and the next moment willie sparling ordinary seaman official number one three seven two eight was once more on the deck of the man-of-war a place he never expected to see again ow he winced my my shoulder is erted he looked round at the familiar faces lit by the electric lights and jerked his head back at the boat hanging from her davits e save my life look after him he's a he's a bleedin ero and willie sparling with a broken collarbone collapsed dramatically enough the engineer lieutenant swung himself down on to the upper deck and stooped to wring the water from his trousers the surgeon seized him by the arm come along shorty in between the blanket with you the hero of the moment disengaged his arm and shook himself like a terrier blankets be blowed it's my middle watch the surgeon laughed plenty of time for that it's only just after half past nine what about a hot toddy lord i thought i'd been in the water for hours yes by jove a hot toddy he paused and looked round his face suddenly anxious by the way any one seen a pipe sculling about down below the telegraph gongs clanged and the ship's bows swung round on to her course heading once more for england home and beauty 
End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 A Picturesque Ceremony S. Parish Church was yesterday afternoon the scene of a picturesque ceremony. Local paper. The torpedo lieutenant, hereinafter known as Torps, was awakened by the June sunlight streaming in through the open scuttle of his cabin overhead the quarter-deck men were busy scrubbing decks the grating murmur of the holly stones and swish of water from the hoses all part of each day's familiar routine sent his eyes round to the clock ticking on the chest of drawers for a while he lay musing watching with thoughtful gaze the disk of blue sky framed by the circle of the scuttle then as if in obedience to a sudden resolution he threw back the bedclothes and hoisted himself out of his bunk slipping his feet into a pair of ragged sandals he left his cabin and walked along the flat till he came to another a few yards away this he entered drawing the curtain noiselessly the occupant of the bunk was still asleep breathing evenly and quietly one bare forearm with the faint outline of a snake tattooed upon it lying along the coverlet for a few moments the newcomer stood watching the sleeper the corners of his eyes creased in a little smile men sometimes smile at their friends that way and at their dogs the face on the pillow looked very boyish somehow he hadn't changed much since britannia days really and they had been through a good deal between then and now wholesome lean old face it was no wonder a woman the sleeper stirred sighed a little and opened his eyes for a moment they rested clear and direct as an awakened child's on torp's face then he laughed a greeting hello torps he yawned and stretched and rising on one elbow thrust his head out of the scuttle thank heaven for a fine day number one back from leave yet yes he's back you're quite safe the other lay back in the bunk has phillips brought my tea yet he looked round helplessly what an awful pot mess my cabin is in those are presents that came last night they've all got to be packed what's the time why it's only half past seven torps you are the limit i swear i've always read in books that fellows stayed in bed till lunch on these occasions mugging up the marriage service i'm not going to get up in the middle of the night be blowed if i do torps lit a cigarette that's only in books we'll have breakfast and take your gear up to the hotel and then we'll play nine holes of golf just to take our minds off frivolous subjects golf my dear old ass i couldn't drive a yard well you're going to have to try anyway everything's arranged that can be you aren't allowed to drink cocktails you can't see her till two o'clock you'd fret yourself into a fever here in bed what else do you think you're going to do the prospective bridegroom stirred his tea in silence well i suppose there's something in that pass me a cigarette there's a box just there oh thanks old bird don't quite know why i should be treated as if i were an irresponsible and feeble-minded invalid just because i'm going to be married the best man laughed how do you feel about it yourself hmm do you remember the morning at kao chu was that the name of the place it began to dawn and we saw those yellow devils coming up a thousand or so of the blighters we had a half company and no maxim do you remember it was devilish cold and we wanted our breakfasts and we were about sixteen torps smiled recollection bad as that very nearly i remember what they call in the quack advertisements that sickish feeling never mind turn out and scrape your face you'll feel much better after your bath outside in the flat the voice of some one carolling drew near for it is my wedding morning the victim groaned oh lord now they're going to start being comic all right it's only the india rubber man footnote lieutenant for physical training duties End footnote. the curtain was drawn back and a smiling face surmounted by a shock of ruddy hair thrust into the cabin morning guns many happy returns of the day and all that sort of thing merry and bright 
the gunnery lieutenant forced a wan smile quite uh, thanks that's right and our torps in attendance with smelling salts condemned man suffered billington to pinion him without resistance the bridegroom sat up searching for a missile look here for goodness sake that condemned man business been done before all the people who tell funny stories about fellows being married tut tut tuts in two places a pretty business forsooth sense of humour going beginning of the end fractious tongue furred for all we know where's the young doc i suggest a thorough medical examination before it's too late another face appeared grinning in the doorway why here he is doc don't you think a stringent medical examination the gunnery lieutenant crawled reluctantly out of his bunk you two needn't come scrapping in here i'm going to shave and i don't want to cut my face off the visitors helped themselves to cigarettes we don't want to scrap we want to see you shave guns watch him lathering himself with aspen hand they explored the cardboard boxes and parcels that littered all available space did you ever see such prodigal generosity as the man's friends display toast rack no home complete without one card case they probed among the tissue wrappings case of pipes handsome ormolu timepiece suitably inscribed my ghost guns almost thou persuadest me yes those things came last night people are awfully kind the torpedo lieutenant intervened come on give him a chance i'll never get him dressed with you two messing about the gunnery lieutenant grinned above the lather at his reflection in the mirror do you hear that that's the way he's been going on ever since i woke up one would think i had g p i the visitors prepared to depart you have my profound sympathy torps said the surgeon i was best man to a fellow once faith i kept him under morphia till it was all over he was practically no trouble well i'm going to get my bath said the torpedo lieutenant when the well-wishers had taken their departure shove on any old clothes we'll send your full dress up to the hotel and your boxes to the house you needn't worry your old head about anything torps left the cabin there was a tap at the door and a private of marines entered surveying the gunnery lieutenant with affectionate regard i just come in to see if we was turnin out sir razor all right better have a ot bath this mornin sir his master's unaccountable predilection for immersing his body in cold water every morning was a custom that not even twelve years of familiarity had robbed of its awfulness i strip right down and had a bath meself sir mornin i was spliced he admitted as one who condones generously an inexplicable weakness but it were a ot one you best have it ot sir his master laughed no thanks phillips it's all right as it is will you be up at the house this afternoon and lend a hand after the ceremony the private of marines nodded sorrowfully i understand sir i been married meself i knows all the routine as you might say he departed with a sigh that left a faint reminiscence of rum in the morning air and the gunnery lieutenant proceeded with his toilette humming a little tune under his breath half an hour later he entered the wardroom clad in comfortable grey flannels and an old shooting coat the mess breakfasting received him with a queer mixture of chaff and solicitude the first lieutenant grinned over a boiled egg guns sorry i couldn't get back earlier to relieve you but uh, urgent private affairs you know all right number one as long as you got back before two o'clock this afternoon that's all i cared about he helped himself to bacon and poured out a cup of coffee marvellous the india rubber man opposite feigned breathless interest in his actions and murmured something into his cup about condemned men partaking of hearty breakfasts come on that's enough of the condemned man you'd better find out something about a groomsman's duties said the best man coming to the rescue of his principal am i a groomsman oh, so i am i'd forgotten what do i do show people to their seats this way please madam second shop through on the right have you any rich aunt's guns pon my word i might get off this afternoon you never know every nice girl loves a sailor which of the lovely bridesmaids falls to my lot do i kiss the bride 
"'You try it on,' retorted the prospective husband grimly. "'Can't I kiss anybody?' inquired the India rubber man plaintively. "'Not if they see you coming, I shouldn't think,' cut in the paymaster from behind his paper. "'Then the head-waiter and I will retire behind a screen and get quietly drunk. I don't suppose anybody will want to kiss him, either. They never do, anyhow. We shall drift together, blighted misogynists.' The engineer commander glowered at the speaker. "'Suppose you reserve a little of this unparalleled wit?' "'I will, chief. Beg pardon. But there's something about a wedding morning. Don't you know? Screams of fun and roars of laughter sort of atmosphere.' He looked round the silent table. "'Now I've annoyed everybody. Ah, me! What it is to have to live with mouldy messmates!' And the India rubber man drifted away to the smoking-room. "'He ought to keep your little show from getting dull this afternoon,' said the first lieutenant. The gunnery lieutenant laughed. "'Yes, it's pleasant to find someone who does regard it as a joke. The only trouble is that his bridesmaid is my young sister, a flapper from school, and I know he'll make her giggle in the middle of the service. She doesn't want much encouragement at any time.' The speaker finished a leisurely breakfast and filled his pipe. "'Now then, Torps, I'm ready for you and your nine holes.' Two. The gunnery lieutenant sat down and began laboriously dragging on his Wellington boots. His best man stood in front of the glass, adjusting the medals on the breast of his full-dress coat. This concluded to his satisfaction, he picked up a prayer book from the dressing-table. Now then, guns, a dummy run, and read, N, will you have this woman? Why N? objected the prospective bridegroom. Dunno, it says N here. "'I've never heard a parson say in,' ventured the other, "'but it's years since I saw a wedding. "'Chuck me my braces. "'Well, go on,' the best man continued. "'I know that part. "'That's the I will business. Uh, "'By the way, where's the ring? "'Don't, for heaven's sake, let it out of your sight. "'Are my trousers hitched up too high? "'No, they're all right. "'Then you say, I, N, take the N. "'More N's. "'We can't both be N. "'Must be a misprint.' he seized the book have i got to learn all that by heart why don't they have a short course at greenwich or whaley or somewhere about these things i n take the n he began reading the words feverishly no that's all right you repeat it after the parson and you say i john willie or whatever your various names might be take thee millicent do you see here let me fix that epaulette give me a cigarette for heaven's sake he hurriedly scanned the pages. As I was to leave it so late, what awful things they talk about. Why didn't I insist on a registry office? Or can't you get married over a pair of tongs somewhere? What religion's that? Don't know. Gretna Green or something. It's too late now. Do stand still. Right. Here's your sword. Gloves. He stepped back and surveyed his handiwork, smiling his whimsical, half-grave smile. For a few seconds the two men stood looking at each other, and the thoughts that passed through their minds were long, long thoughts. "'You'll do,' said the torpedo lieutenant at length, but there was an absent look in his eyes, as though his thought had gone a long way beyond the spare, upright figure in blue and gold. In truth they had, back fifteen years or more to a moonlit night in the club garden at Malta. Two midshipmen had finished dinner roast chicken, rum omelette, scotch woodcock, and all the rest of it, and were experimenting desperately with two cigars. It was ladies' night, and down on the terrace a few officers' wives were dining with their husbands. The flagship's band was playing softly. "'A fellow must make up his mind, Bill,' one of the midshipmen had said. "'It's either one thing or the other, either the service or women. You can't serve both, and it seems to me that the service ought to come first and there and then they had vowed eternal celibacy for the benefit of the navy upon which under the good providence of god the honour safety and welfare of the nation do most chiefly depend fifteen years ago you'll do repeated the torpedo lieutenant in a matter-of-fact tone and rang the bell private phillips of the royal marine light infantry entered with a gold-necked bottle and two tumblers the cork popped and the two officers raised their glasses happy days said torps 
salut replied the other and for a moment his eyes rested on his best man with something half wistful in their regard do you remember aldershot the middles you seconded me and we split a bottle afterwards torps nodded smiling but this is just before the battle mother they moved towards the door and for a moment he rested his hand on the heavy epaulette beside his and if you make as good a show of this as you did that afternoon you won't come to no arm old son three they were greeted at the church door by the beaming india rubber man come along in spot or plain i mean bride or bridegroom bride's friends on the left and bridegroom's on the right or is it the other way around i'm getting so rattled i've just put the old caretaker in a front pew under the impression that it was your rich aunt guns what a day what a day got the ring torps here come the bridesmaids bless em go on you two get up into your proper billets the condemned man walked with unfaltering step oh sorry i forgot the groomsmen slid into their pew with much rattling of sword scabbards and nodding of heads and whispering on their gilded shoulders appeared to lie the responsibility of the whole affair the bridegroom took up his appointed place and stood his hands linked behind his back looking down the aisle to where the choir was gathering the church seemed a sea of faces glinting uniforms and women's finery who on earth were they all he had no idea he knew so many people quite sure millicent didn't how awful it must be to have to preach a sermon the faint scent of lilies drifted up to where he was standing at his side torps shifted his feet and the ferrule of his scabbard clinked on the aisle dear old torps how he must be hating it all there was a faint stir at the entrance the bridesmaids black velvet hats and white feathers were bobbing agitatedly he caught a glimpse of a white veiled figure people were turning round staring and whispering dash it all it wasn't a circus what did they think they were here for there she is murmured torps not much longer now the clergyman was giving out the number of a hymn from the back of the church somewhere and the deep sweet notes of the organ poured out over their heads then the voices of the choir boys swelled up drawing nearer again the scent of lilies stand by from torps tensely the choir boys filed past singing one had on a red tie that peeped above his cassock they glanced at him indifferently as they went by their heads on a level with his belt buckle then the white veiled figure on the colonel's arm millicent his in a few short minutes forever and i he drew a deep breath dearly beloved we are gathered together here in the sight of god torps touched him lightly on the elbow i john mainprice edgar i john mainprice edgar take thee millicent take thee millicent to have and to hold that was simple enough to have and to hold and thereto i plight thee my troth how warm and steady the small hand was lying in his then gently withdrawn torps was trying to attract attention what was his trouble the ring of course the ring those whom god has joined together let no man put asunder life's haven at last or had all life been a cruise within the harbour and this the beat to open sea the brave adventure the peace of god which passes all understanding remain with you now and for evermore there was a whisper of silken petticoats and the clink of swords seems to fill the church then dominating all other sounds for a moment the old colonel blowing his nose vehemently down the aisle again the organ thundering familiar strains familiar yet suddenly imbued with a personal and intimate message millicent's arm resting on his trembling ever so lightly in the warm bouquet-scented gloom of the vestry they gathered and torps wrung the bridegroom's hand in a hard unaccustomed grip torps with his winning half-sad smile and the hair over his temple showing the first trace of grey the bride finished signing the register and rose smiling with the veil thrown back from her fair face 
in later years he found himself recalling a little sadly as the happiest of bachelors may do at times the queer shining gladness in her eyes he bent and touched the warm cheek with his lips then for a minute every one seemed to fall a-kissing father and daughter mother and son newly made brothers and sisters-in-law sought each other in turn the bridegroom's lady mother kissed the india-rubber man because no one else seemed to want to and they were such old friends the clergyman kissed two of the bridesmaids because he was their uncle and the colonel who had stopped blowing his nose and was cheering up kissed the other two because he wasn't in the middle of all this pleasant exercise torps who had vanished for a minute reappeared to announce that the arch of swords was ready and the carriages were alongside so the procession formed up once more bride and bridegroom the colonel and the bridegroom's lady mother torps leading the bridegroom's new sister-in-law and a very pretty sister-in-law she was the flapper and the india rubber man a girl called etta someone on the junior watchkeeper's arm and another called doris somebody else under the escort of the a p they all passed beneath the arch of naked blades held up by the bridegroom's messmates and friends to receive a running fire of chaff and laughing congratulation to find outside in the golden afternoon sunshine that the horses had been taken from the carriage traces and a team of lusty blue jackets all very perspiring and serious of mien waiting to do duty instead four private phillips r m l i in all subsequent narrations of the events of the day and they were many and varied was wont to preface each reminiscence with me and the torpedo lieutenant and indeed he did both indefatigable workers bear justice whether it was opening carriage doors or bottles of champagne fetching fresh supplies of glass or labelling and strapping portmanteau private phillips laboured with the same indomitable stertorous energy he accepted orders with an omniscient and vehement nod of the head usurped the duties of enraptured maid-servants with you leave me do it miss i've been married meself i knows the routine as you might say and torps superintending the distribution of beer to panting blue jackets whose panting in some cases was almost alarming in its realism fetching cups of tea for stout dowagers and ices for giggling schoolgirls begging a sprig from the bridesmaids bouquets tipping policemen opening telegrams yet always with an attention ready for the bridegroom's aunt who remembered guns as such a little boy helpful even to the ubiquitous reporter of the local paper a picturesque ceremony if i may say so a most picturesque ceremony the reporter would feel for his notebook might i ask who that tall officer is with the medals my paper uh, torps with his gentle manners and quiet smile would supply the information to the best of his ability conscious that at a wedding there are harder lots even than the best man's the india rubber man drifted disconsolately about in the crush finally coming to a momentary anchorage in a corner beside his bridesmaid miss betty no one loves me and i'm going into the garden he dropped his voice to a confidential undertone to eat worms the girl giggled weakly please don't make me laugh any more won't you stay here and have an ice instead i'm sure it would be much better for you would it do you think i've been watching the sailors drinking beer have you ever seen a sailor drink beer miss betty it's a grim sight she shook her head and there was both laughter and reproach in the young eyes considering him over the bouquet you forsook me and a nice midshipman had pity on my loneliness and brought me an ice the india rubber man eyed her sorrowfully i turn my back for a moment to watch sailors drink beer i am a man of few recreations and return to find you sighing over the memory of another and making shocking bad puns really miss betty ah now i understand a small and pink-faced midshipman approached with two brimming glasses of champagne the india rubber man faded discreetly away leaving his charge and her new-found knight pledging each other with sparkling eyes 
the bride touched her husband's sleeve in a lull in the handshaking and congratulations isn't it rather nice to see people enjoying themselves don't you feel as if you wanted everybody to be as happy as we look at betty and that boy champagne if you please how ill the child will be and she's got to go back to school to-morrow her husband laughed softly pretty little witch torps has taken it away from her and given her some lemonade instead where's mother oh i see hobnobbing with the colonel over a cup of tea what a crush dear uh, can't, can't we escape soon very soon now poor boy are you very hot in those things oh, not very the worst part's coming the rice and slippers and good-byes are you very tired darling good-bye 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 daddy yes yes i will good-bye betty darling good-bye good-bye mother mine torps you've been a brick so long good-bye not down my neck betty yes i've got the tickets good-bye good-bye the lights of dover were twinkling far astern two people a man and a woman walked to the stern of the steamer and stood close together leaning over the rail what a lot of good-byes we've said to-day murmured the woman watching the pin-points of light that vanished and reappeared she fell silent as if following a train of thought and after all we're only going to paris we're going further than that the man took possession of her slim ungloved hands and the star-powdered heavens alone were witness to the act all the way to el dorado darling she gave him back the pressure of his fingers and presently sighed a little happily as a child sighs in its sleep and we haven't any return tickets five the members of the wedding party returned to the ship and straggled into the mess each one as he entered unbuckled his sword belt loosened his collar and called for strong waters a gloom lay upon the gathering possibly the shadow of an angel's wing i feel as if i've been to a funeral growled the paymaster awful shows these weddings are poor old guns said the a p lugubriously she's a jolly nice girl anyway maintained the young doctor yes sighed the junior watchkeeper but still he was a good chap the india rubber man was the last to enter he added his sword to the heap already on the table glanced at the solemn countenance of his messmates and lit a cigarette sunt rerum lacrimae i am reminded of a harrowing story he began leaning against the tiled stove recounted to me by a, a lady we met in london at a place of popular entertainment and our acquaintance was judged by the standards of conventionality perhaps slender the india rubber man paused and looked gravely from face to face however he continued encouraged by my frank open countenance and sympathetic manner she was constrained to tell the story of how she once loved and lost the narrator broke off and appeared to have forgotten how the story went on in dreamy contemplation of his cigarette the mess waited in silence at length the junior watchkeeper could bear it no longer what did she tell you the india rubber man thoughtfully exhaled a cloud of smoke she said pa shot him sniff oh i loved him sniff lord ow oh, he did bleed End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of naval occasions by bartimaeus this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five why the gunner went ashore the evening mail had come and selby sat alone in his cabin mechanically reading and re-reading a letter finally he tore it up into very small pieces and held them clenched in his hand staring very hard at nothing in particular he was engaged to be married or to be more precise he had been engaged the letter that had come by the evening mail said that this was not so any longer the girl who wrote it was a very straightforward person who hated concealment of facts because they were unpleasant it had become necessary to tell selby that she couldn't love him any longer and faith she had told him further by her creed it was only right that she should tell him about someone else as well 
it was all very painful and the necessity for thus putting things to selby in their proper light had cost her sleepless nights red eyes and much expensive note-paper before the letter was finally posted but she did hope he would realize it was for the best and some day he would be so thankful it had all been a big mistake because she wasn't a bit what he thought and so forth a very distressing letter to have to write and from selby's point of view even more distressing to have to read few men enjoy being brought up against their limitations thus abruptly especially where women and love are concerned in selby's case was added the knowledge that another had been given what he couldn't hold he had made a woman love him but he couldn't make her go on loving him he was insufficient unto the day critics with less biased judgment might have taken a different point of view might have said she was a jilt or held she acted a little cruelly gone further even and opined he was well out of it but selby was one of those who walk the earth under a ban of idealism and had never been seriously in love before she was the queen who could do no wrong it was he who had been weighed and found wanting if only he had acted differently on such and such an occasion if in short instead of being himself he had been somebody quite different all along succeeding days and nights provided enough matches and sulphur of this sort to enable him to fashion a sufficiently effective purgatory in which his mind revolved round its hurt like a cockchafer on a pin when a man depends for the efficient performance of his duties upon getting his just amount of sleep selby was a watch-keeping lieutenant in a battleship of the line affairs of this sort are apt to end in disaster but his ship went into dockyard hands to refit and selby who was really a sensible enough sort of a fellow though an idealist realized that for his own welfare and that of the service it were better to forget and smile than remember and be sad accordingly he applied for and obtained a week's leave bought a map of the surrounding district packed a few necessaries into a light knapsack and set off to walk away his troubles for a day he followed the coast it was high summer along a path that skirted the cliffs the breeze blew softly off the level lapis lazuli of the channel seagulls wheeled overhead for company and following the curve of each ragged headland in succession the creamy edge of the breakers lured him on towards the west he walked thirty miles that day and slept dreamlessly in a fishing village hung about with nets and populated by philosophers with patched breeches he struck inland the second day to plunge into a confusion of lanes that led him blindfold for a while between ten-foot hedges these opened later into red combs steeped to their sunny depths with the scent of fern and may and all along the road bees held high carnival above the hedgerows then green tunnels of foliage murmurous with wood pigeon dappled him at each step with alternate sunlight and shadow and passed him on to villages whose inns had cool flagged parlours and cider in blue and white mugs an ambient trout stream held him company most of the long afternoon with at times a kingfisher darting along its tortuous course like a streak from the rainbow that each tiny waterfall had caught and held he supped early in a farm kitchen off new-made pasties apple tart and yellow crusted cream and walked on till the bats began wheeling overhead in the violet dusk his ship was sixty miles away when he crept into the shelter of a hayrick and laid his tired head on his knapsack the third day found him up on the ragged moors steering north the exercise and strong salt wind had driven the sad humours from him and the affairs of life were beginning to resume their right perspective so much so that when about noon a sore heel began abruptly to make itself felt in the irrational way sore heels have selby sat down and pulled out his map the day before yesterday he would have pushed on doggedly almost welcoming the counter irritant of physical discomfort Today, however, he accepted the inevitable, and searched the map for some neighbouring village where he could rest a day or so until the chaffed foot was healed. After a while he turned east, and, leaving the high moorland, discerned the smoke of chimneys among some trees in the valley. 
he descended a steep road that seemed to lead in the right direction and presently caught a glimpse of a square church tower among some elms later on the breeze bore the faint cawing of rooks up the hillside a stream divided the valley the few cottages clustered on the opposite side huddled close together as if reluctant to venture far beyond the shadow of the grey church the green of the hillside behind them was gashed in one place by an old quarry but the work had long been abandoned and nature had already begun to repair the red scar with impatient firs and winberry so much selby took in as he descended past the grey church and cawing rooks once at the bottom and across the quaint square arched bridge he found there was a small inn amongst the huddled cottages where they would receive him for a night or two he lunched did what he could to the blistered heel with a darning needle and worsted after the fashion of blistered sailormen and took a light siesta in the lavender smelling bedroom under the roof until it was time for tea tea over he lit a pipe borrowed his host's little nine-foot trout rod that hung in the passage and limped down to the meadows skirting the stream beyond the village the light occupation gave him something to think about and held by the piece of running water he lingered by the stream all evening then something of his old sadness came back with the dimpsey light a gentle melancholy that only resembled sorrow as the mist resembles the rain he wanted his supper too and so walked slowly back to the village with the rod on his shoulder the innkeeper met him at the door well done sir well done you'm a fisherman for sure missus she fry em for dinner for ye now yeah tis nice little rod cut it myself little hickory rod tis where did ye have that half pounder sir there's many a good fish to that little pool selby had finished supper and repaired to a bench outside in the gloaming with his pipe and a mug of beer the old stained chancel windows of the church beyond the river were lit up and choir practice appeared to be in progress the drone of the organ and voices uplifted in familiar harmonies drifted across to him out of the dusk the pool below the bridge still mirrored the last gleam of day in the sky a few old men were leaning over the low parapet smoking and down the street one or two villagers stood gossiping at their doorsteps a dog came out of the shadows and sniffed selby's hands then he flopped down in the warm dust and sighed to himself the strains of the organ on the other side of the valley swelled louder holy ghost the infinite comforter divine sang the unseen choir how warm and peaceful the evening was reflected selby puffing at his pipe one hand caressing the dog's ear extraordinarily peaceful in fact he wondered what sort of a man the vicar was in this tiny backwater of life and whether he found it dull while he wondered the vicar came down the road and stopped abreast of him good evening he said half hesitating and came nearer please don't get up i don't want to disturb you but i uh, they told me this afternoon that a stranger was staying here i thought i would make myself known to you i am the rector of this little parish he smiled and named himself selby responded to the introduction won't you sit down for a few minutes i was listening to your choir oh they are practicing yes i have just come down from the church and he hesitated i hoped i should find you in to have the opportunity of making your acquaintance oh, it's most kind of you selby wondered if all parsons in this fair country were as attentive to the stranger within their gates most kind he repeated i i was on a walking tour and he indicated a slipper of his host that adorned his left foot one of my heels began to chaff only a blister you know but i thought i'd take things easy for a day or two oh quite so quite so an enforced rest is sometimes very pleasant i remember once my throat oh, however that was not what i came to see you about i believe mr selby er am i right in supposing that you are in the navy yes a note of chilliness had crept into selby's voice after all his clerical acquaintance was only an inquisitive old busybody agog to pry into other people's affairs yes he repeated i'm a lieutenant and he named his ship the rector made a little deprecatory gesture please don't think i am trying to acquire the materials for gossip and i am not asking out of inquisitiveness 
the good people here told me this afternoon this is an out-of-the-way place and strangers distinguished ones if i may say so he made a little inclination of the head do not come here very frequently they mentioned it to me as i was passing on my way to hold a confirmation class selby hastened to put him at his ease after all why shouldn't he ask and then he remembered offering the innkeeper a fill of hard navy plug tobacco he carried a bit in his knapsack with a view to just such small courtesies that's the stuff sir the man had said loading his pipe we wondered me and the missus was you a navy gentleman but while his mind busied itself over these recollections his companion was talking on in his gentle way he was not a very old man but the doctor tells me he has lived a life of many hardships and not i fear always a temperate one however never a sinner never a saint and now he is fast to use one of his own seafaring expressions slipping his cable he retired from the navy as a gunner i think that would be a warrant officer's rank would it not selby nodded yes has he been retired long this person you speak of yes he retired a good many years ago and has a small pension quite sufficient for his needs he settled here because he liked the quiet the speaker made a little gesture embracing the hollow in the hills sombre now in the gathering darkness he lives a very lonely life in a cottage some little distance along the road an eccentric old man with curious ideas of beautifying a home however i am digressing as far as i know he has no relatives alive and no friends ever visit him he has been bedridden for some time and the wife of one of my parishioners a most kindly woman looks in several times a day and sees he has all he wants now i come to the part of my story that affects you lately in fact since he took to his bed and the doctor was compelled to warn him of his approaching end he has been very anxious to meet some one in the navy he so often begs me if i hear of any one connected with the service being in the vicinity to bring him to the cottage and this afternoon hearing quite by accident that a naval officer was in our midst again the rector made his courteous little inclination of the head it seemed an opportunity of gratifying the old fellow's wish if you could spare a few moments some time to-morrow well, i should be only too glad to be of any service said selby perhaps you would call for me some time to-morrow morning and we could go round together the rector rose you are most kind i was sure when i saw you i knew i should not appeal in vain he extended his hand and now i will say good-night forgive me for taking up so much of your time with an old man's concerns one can do so little in this life to bring happiness to others that when the opportunity arises oh yes rather said selby a little awkwardly and shook hands conscious of more than a slight compunction for his hastiness in judgment of this mild divine good-night sir and stood looking after him till he disappeared along the road into the luminous summer night selby had finished breakfast and was leaning over the pigsty wall watching his host ministering to the fat sow and her squealing litter when his acquaintance of the previous night appeared seen in the broad daylight he was an elderly man short and spare with placid blue eyes and a singularly winning smile a bachelor so the innkeeper had instructed selby a man of learning and of no small wealth who moreover dressed and threw as pretty a fly as any in the county he saluted selby with a little gesture of his ash plant inquired after the blistered heel and then after an ailing member of the fat sow's litter and now if you are ready and still of the same mind shall we be strolling along he inquired selby fetched his stick and together they set out along a road made aromatic in the morning sunlight by the scents of dust and flowering hedgerow half a mile beyond the village the rector stopped before a gateway a dog-cart and cob stood at the roadside and a small boy in charge touched his cap the doctor is here i see said the clergyman and opened the gate in the hedge selby caught a glimpse of a flagged path leading through an orchard to a whitewashed cottage but his attention from the outset had been arrested by a most extraordinary assortment of crockery 
glass and earthenware vases busts statuettes and odds and ends of ironwork that occupied every available inch of space round the gateway bordering the path and were even cemented on to the front of the house itself above the gateway a defaced lion faced an equally mutilated unicorn across the royal arms of england arranged beneath cemented into the pillars of the arch were busts of napoleon irving stanley and george washington an earthenware jar bearing the inscription hot pot a little group representing leda and the swan in white marble and a grinning soapstone joss such as is sold to tourists and sailors at ports on the china coast interspersed with these were cups without handles segments of soup plates china dolls heads lead soldiers and a miscellaneous collection of teapot spouts all firmly plastered into the ironwork of the pillars on each side of the path banked up to a height of about three feet was a further indescribable conglomeration of bric-a-brac cemented together into a sort of hedge the general effect was as if the knockabout comedians of a music-hall stage who break plates and domestic crockery out of sheer joy of living had combined with demented graveyard masons bulls in china shops and all the craftsmen of murano to produce a nightmare a light summer breeze strayed down the valley and scores of slips of coloured glass hanging in groups from the apple trees responded with a musical tinkling the sound brought recollections of a japanese temple garden and selby paused to look about him what an extraordinary place the vicar leading the way up the tiled walk seemed suddenly to become aware of the strangeness of their surroundings long familiarity with the house had perhaps robbed the fantastic decorations of their incongruity he stopped and smiled oh, to be sure yes uh, i had forgotten to a stranger all this must seem very peculiar i think i hinted that the old man had very curious ideas of beautifying the home this was about his only hobby and yet oddly enough he rarely spoke of it to me at that moment the cottage door opened and a tall florid man came out the vicar turned ah dr williams that was his trap at the gate let me introduce you the introduction accomplished he inquired after the patient the medical man shook his head won't last much longer i'm afraid a day or so at the most no organic disease you know but just he made a little gesture like a clock that's run down not an old man either as men go but these navy men age so quickly well i must get along i shall look in again this evening but there is nothing one can do really he's quite comfortable good morning and the doctor passed down the path to his trap the vicar opened the cottage door and stood aside to allow selby to enter the room was partly a kitchen partly a bedroom occupying the bed with a patchwork quilt drawn up under his chin was a shrunken little old man with a square beard nearly white and projecting craggy eyebrows he turned his head to the door as they entered in spite of the commanding brows they were dull tired old eyes without interest or hope or curiosity in them i brought you a visitor mr tylake said the vicar someone you'll be glad to see an officer of the navy the old man considered selby with the same vacant passionless gaze have you ever ate navy beef he asked abruptly it was a thin colourless voice almost the falsetto of the very old selby smiled oh yes sometimes navy beef that's what brought me here and the rheumatics i'm dying he made the statement with the simple pride of one who has at last achieved a modest distinction the vicar asked a few questions touching the old man's comfort and opened the little oriel window to admit the morning air lieutenant selby was most interested in your unique collection of curios outside mr tylake perhaps you would like to tell him something about them he looked at his watch addressing selby i have a meeting i'm afraid i don't know if you'd care to stay a few minutes longer and chat certainly said selby and drew a chair near the bed if mr tylake doesn't mind i'd like to stay a little while he sat down and the vicar took his departure closing the door behind him in a corner by the dresser a tall grandfather clock ticked out the deliberate seconds 
a blue bottle sailed in through the open window and skirmished round the low ceiling the old man lay staring at his hands as they lay on the patchwork quilt twisted nubbly hands they were with something pathetic about their toil-worn helplessness every now and again the wind brought into the little room the tinkle of the glass ornaments pendant in the apple trees outside the faint sound seemed to rouse the occupant of the bed i've been a mort of religions he said in a low voice as if speaking to himself heaps of em and some said one thing and some said the other his old blank eyes followed the gyrations of the fly upon the ceiling and i dunno buddhism and mamazets salvation armies and bush baptists and some says one thing and some says the other i dunno he shook his head wearily but many's a pot of galvanized paint i used up outside there and go leaf in the dog watches o saturdays this then was the explanation of the fantastic decorations outside altars to the unknown god the old man turned his head towards his visitor but don't you tell the parson he wouldn't hold with it i tell you because you're in the navy and perhaps you'd understand i was in the navy mr tylake's my name thirty year a gunner and navy beef for a while the old man rambled on seemingly unconscious of his visitor's presence of ships long passed through the breakers yards of forgotten commissions all up and down the world of beef and rheumatism and buddha while selby sat listening half moved by pity half amused at himself for staying on about noon a woman came in and fed the old man with a spoon out of a cup selby rose to go i'll come again he said touching the passive hands covered with faint blue tattooing i'll come and see you again this evening the old man roused himself from his reveries come again he repeated that's right come again soon when she's gone she and her fussin about and for the first time an expression came into his eyes as he watched the woman with the cup an expression of malevolence i don't hold with women fussin round and i've got something to tell you something pressin you must come soon i'm slippin my cable naval beef and the rheumatics and it's to your advantage the shadows of the alders by the river were lengthening when selby again walked up the bricked path leading to the cottage the old man was still lying in contemplation of his hands the grandfather clock had stopped and there was a great stillness in the little room his gaze was so vacant and the silence remained unbroken so long that selby doubted if the old man recognized him i've come back you see i've come to see you again still the figure in the bed said nothing staring dully at his visitor i've come to see you again selby repeated it's to your advantage said the old man his voice was weaker and it was evident that he was as he said slipping his cable fast give me that there ditty box continued the thin toneless voice selby looked round the room and espied in a corner of the chest of drawers the scrubbed wooden ditty box in which sailors keep their more intimate and personal possessions he fetched it and placed it on the patchwork quilt the old man fumbled ineffectually with the lid tip em out he said at length and selby inverted the box to allow a heap of papers and odds and ends to slide on to the old man's hands it was a pathetic collection the flotsam and jetsam of a sailor's life faded photographs certificates from captains scarcely memories with the present generation afraid parchment letters tied up with an old knife lanyard a lock of hair from which the curl had not quite departed ghost of a day when perhaps the old man did hold with women at length he found what he wanted a soiled sheet of paper that had been folded and refolded many times here he said and extended it to selby it was a printed form discoloured with age printed in old-fashioned type and appeared to relate to details of prison routine and the number of prisoners victualled selby turned it over on the back drawn in ink that was now faded and rusty was a clumsy arrow showing the point of the compass beneath that a number of oblong figures arranged haphazard and enclosed by a line one of the figures was marked with a cross that's a cemetery said the old man cemetery at a place called port de Reine. 
he lay silent for a while as if trying to arrange his scattered ideas presently the weak voice started again there's a prison in trinidad and my father was a warder there long time ago time the old calypso was out on the station he talked slowly with long pauses they was sent to catch a murderer who was hiding among the islands a half-breed pirate he must have been murder and i don't know what not they caught him and they brought him to trinidad where my father was warder in the prison when i was little the old man broke off into disconnected rambling whispers and the shadows began gathering in the corners of the room a thrush in the orchard outside sang a few long sweet notes of its angelus and was silent selby waited with his chin resting on his hand the old man suddenly turned his head she ain't comin she and her fussin i've got something important no no said selby soothingly there's no one here but me and you wanted to tell me about your father warder in a prison at trinidad said the old man my father was an a uh, kind-hearted man there was a prisoner there a pirate a murderer he was what the calypso caught and father was kind to him before he was hanged i can't say what he did but being kind-hearted naturally it might have been anything not taken into account of him being a pirate and murderer jewels he had and rings and such things hidden away somewhere and before he was hanged he told my father where they was buried cause father was kind to him before he was hanged port de rhine cemetery in the grave that's marked on that chart he's buried the whole lot seventy thousand pounds he said there was a long silence father caught the prison fever and died just afterwards my mother she gave me the paper joined the navy and i never went to des rhine but the once then i went to the wrong cemetery to dig ship was under sailing orders i hadn't time afterwards i heard there were two cemeteries priest at martinique told me i was never there but the once seventy thousand pounds and me slipping my cable selby sat by the bed in the darkening room holding the soiled sheet of paper in his hand piecing together bit by bit the fragments of this remarkable narrative until he had a fairly connected story in his head summed up it appeared to amount to this a pirate or murderer had been captured by a man of war taken to trinidad prison to be tried and there sentenced to death time the old calypso was out on the station that would be in the forties or thereabouts the old man's father had been a warder in trinidad prison at the time and had performed some service or kindness to the prisoner in exchange for which the condemned felon had given him a clue to the whereabouts of his plunder it was apparently buried in a grave at port de rhine cemetery but the warder had died before he could verify this valuable piece of information his son the ex-gunner had actually been to a cemetery at port de rhine but had gone to the wrong one and did not find out his mistake till after the ship had sailed the plunder was valued at seventy thousand pounds selby turned the paper over and folded it up what do you wish me to do with this mr tylake have you any relations or next of kin it seems to me the old man shook his head faintly i've got no relatives alive nor friends they're all dead and i'm dying that's for you that there bit of paper keep it it's to your advantage some day maybe you'll go to port de rhine and it's the old cemetery furthest from the sea i went to the wrong one time i was there but said selby half amused half incredulous i i'm a total stranger to you I if this was all true you keep it said the old man his voice was very spent and scarcely raised above a whisper i meant it for the first navy man that came along you came and you were kind to me it's yours and to your advantage there was silence again in the little room and selby sat on in the dusk wondering how much of the story was true or whether it was all the hallucination of a failing mind but the old man had given him the paper and he would keep it as a memento and the fact of its being a prison form seemed to bear out some of the details anyhow the story was very interesting he rose and lit the lamp the old man had slipped off into an easy doze with his pathetic collection of treasures still lying in a heap on the quilt 
selby replaced them in the ditty box and put the box back where he had found it the piece of paper that had been a prison form he put in his pocket-book as he was leaving the woman who had been there earlier in the day made her appearance selby wished her good evening told her the old man was dozing and passed down the path i'll come again to-morrow he added at the gate but that night the old man died and the next morning having ascertained from the vicar that there was nothing he could do to help selby shouldered his knapsack and struck out once more along the road that led up on to the moor two it was tea-time and the mess had gathered round the wardroom table a signalman came down from the upper deck and pinned a signal on the baize covered notice board hello someone said signal from the flagship what's the news the assistant paymaster who was sitting with his back to the notice board relinquished the jam pot and tilting up his chair scrutinized the paper over his shoulder flag general let fires die out usual leave may be granted to officers the major of marines who had finished his tea rose from the table and tucked the novel he had been reading under his arm thanks very much he said now we're all happy he stared out through the rain-smeared scuttle at an angry grey sea and lowering sky i can see a faint blur on the horizon would that be the delectable beach we're invited to repair to that's it said the first lieutenant stirring the leaves in his teapot with a spoon he had just spent three-quarters of an hour on the forecastle mooring ship in a cold driving rain it's not more than three miles away and it's only blowing about half a gale there's a cutter to go ashore in time some of you young bloods was climbing into your civvy suits footnote lower deck ease equals civilian End note. so much for the joys of a big fleet in the north sea i'd like to bring some of these fellows who are always writing to the papers about it for a little yachting trip grumbled the fleet surgeon who had just returned from two successively placid commissions in the west indies never anchor in sight of land always blowing always raining never get ashore and when you do you wish you were on board again it's the limit well thank heaven for a fire and an armchair anyway said the paymaster and drifted towards the smoking-room filling his pipe as he went who'll make a four at bridge asked the major come on number one and so the mess dispersed some to armchairs round the fire others to the bridge table others again to write letters in their cabins about half an hour before dinner as was his wont the captain came down from his cabin and joined the group round the smoking-room fire the occupants of the armchairs made room and smiled greetings hello said the captain none of you ashore thought you all came into the navy to see life the commander laughed we're beginning to forget there is such a thing as the beach the captain lit a cigarette not a bad principle either saves your plain clothes from wearing out he settled down in an armchair somebody had vacated like an old gunner of a small ship i was in once in the west indies he only went ashore three times during the commission once at trinidad and once at bermuda and each time when he returned he had to be hoisted on board in a bowline there was a general laugh what about the third time sir asked the engineer commander third time ah that was rather mysterious we never discovered why he did go ashore that day i don't know now the mess scented a yarn thrice blessed was their captain in that he could tell a yarn we were cruisin round that fringe of islands part of the windward group showing the flag and the skipper decided to look in at a place called um i oh, can't remember what it's called port de something oh port de rain that's it what did you say selby uh, nothing sir go on the last place ever made this port de rain and it's not finished yet just a mountain and the remains of an old french settlement well we anchored off this godforsaken hole and as soon as the skipper had had a look at it he decided to up killick and out of it as far as i can remember he had to go and lunch with the consul but he was to come off in a couple of hours time so we banked fires and off went the captain in the galley no sooner had he gone than the gunner this funny old boy i've been telling you about came to my cabin i was by way of being first lieutenant of that ship we'd no commander and asked for leave to go ashore i was rather startled couldn't imagine what on earth he wanted to do 
i told him we were under sailing orders and only staying a couple of hours and that it was an awful hole had he any friends staying there i asked him no he said he had no friends there but he particularly wanted to land there for an hour or so on urgent private affairs as he called it well he seemed in rather a stew about something so i gave him leave and lowered a boat off he went in his old bowler hat he always went ashore in a bowler hat and a blue suit armed with something wrapped up in paper this turned out afterwards to be a sort of pick or jemmy he had got the blacksmith to make for him a couple of days before that must have been when he heard the ship was going to port that ein it was the only clue we ever had two hours later at the expiration of his leave he returned looking very dusty and dejected and reported himself i chaffed him a bit about going ashore but nothing could i get out of him and he never volunteered an explanation to any one as far as i know a lieutenant who had finished playing bridge and had joined the group of listeners round the fire leaned forward suddenly do you remember his name sir no said the captain can't say i do never can remember names not a mr tylake by any chance sir the captain threw away the end of his cigarette and turned toward the speaker good lord yes that was it tylake but look here selby the lieutenant rose and walked towards the door if you'll wait a second sir i'll show you why he went ashore he left the mess and returned with a soiled sheet of paper in his hand it was creased by much folding and discoloured with age the captain turned it over and examined it but this doesn't explain much does it and how do you come to know old tylake all this happened twelve fifteen nearly twenty years ago and he was pensioned soon after and anyhow what's this got to do with it that selby turned the paper over that's the cemetery at port der Rhein, sir and then he told them of a walking tour in the west country omitting the reason for it and other superfluous details some two years before and of the old man who had since solved it is to be hoped to his satisfaction his religious perplexities the assistant paymaster removed his glasses and blinked excitedly as was his habit when much moved but why couldn't he find it when he went ashore and why didn't because he went to the wrong cemetery there were two do you see and he dug up the wrong one and didn't find out there was another one till after they'd sailed he never went there again no said the captain that's right we didn't the first lieutenant laughed but just imagine him in that climate tearing off the tombstones in his bowler hat and serge suit with one eye on his watch all the time and only finding coffins and then hearing when it was too late that he'd backed the wrong horse added the major of marines but began the a p again how much did you say seventy thousand pounds my aunt selby have you been there yet selby smiled and shook his head i oh no i've been channel groping ever since in fact i'd forgotten all about it until the captain mentioned port that Rhein. he was a very old man and his wits were failing the engineer commander examined the plan but there may be something in the yarn selby it seems almost worth while a treasure hunt broke in the a p let's all put in for a couple of months half pay and go out there hire a schooner like they do in books schooner ejaculated the major i can see myself setting sail for the antilles in a schooner Ugh! it makes me feel queer to think of it you'd look fine in a red smuggler's cap and thigh boots major said the first lieutenant that's what treasure hunters always wear with a black patch over one eye and the skull and crossbones embroidered on your brisket supplemented an imaginative watchkeeper yo ho and a bottle of rum can't you see yourself major only you ought to have a wooden leg has anybody in the mess ever been there inquired the commander why the p m o s just come home from the west indies where is he at that moment the fleet surgeon entered to be assailed by a volley of questions p m o you're just the man where's port de Rhein? we're all going treasure hunting in a schooner with the major with the jolly roger at the fore p m o have you ever been to port de Rhein? how many cemeteries are there there what's the law about digging up graves in the west indies and treasure trove the fleet surgeon looked a little bewildered what are you talking about 
Porte Rhine? Yes, I've been there. I don't know about the cemeteries, but I've got some photographs of the place, if you're all so anxious to see it. They're in my cabin. He left the mess, and the storm of conjecture and speculation broke out afresh. I shall chuck the service and buy a farm, said the first lieutenant, with my share. Shh! Don't make such a row. One of the servants will hear, and we don't want it to get all over the ship. These things are much better kept quiet. If there's anything in it, the fewer— The A.P.'s voice rose above the turmoil. And I shall buy a cycle car and a split-cane steel-centered grease lod and go to Switzerland next winter. I— The fleet surgeon reappeared with a bulky album under his arm. He laid it on the card-table and turned the pages. Now, um, there's Port de Rhine. What's left of it after the earthquake? Earthquake? The mess gathered round and leaned breathlessly over the table. Yes, two years ago they had that awful earthquake, and the mountain shifted almost bodily. There's a million tons of rock on top of— Well, you can see. They scanned the scene of desolation in silence. It swallowed the whole town, said someone in awestruck tones. The magnitude of a calamity had somehow never come home to them before quite so forcibly. Yes, replied the fleet surgeon calmly. Town such as it was, and church and cemeteries, mountain toppled down on top of them. There was a long, tense silence. But, began the A.P., still clinging to his dreams of a split cane grills rod with a steel center. Dry up snapped the first lieutenant irritably oh death where is thy sting murmured the major of marines seventy thousand pounds buried under a mountain the captain rang the bell and ordered a sherry and bitters well he said thank heaven i know at last why the gunner went ashore end of chapter twenty five end of naval occasions and some traits of the sailor man by bartimaeus